Chapter One of the Lady's Mile. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. The Lady's Mile by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter One. He is but a landscape painter. It was high tide, spring tide, if you will, at half past six o'clock on a warm June evening not the commonplace ebb and flow of a vulgar river, but the mighty tide of fashion's wonderful sea, surging westward under the dusty elms and lindens of the Ladies' Mile. If you had driven round this very park between four and five on this very afternoon, you would have been gratified by the sight of some half-dozen nursemaids with their straggling charges, an occasional girl in perambulator, a picturesque life guardsman here and there, making a little spot of crimson amongst the wavering shadows of the trees, a few hulking idlers in corduroy and bluchers, and a tipsy female sleeping on the grass. Now the excited policemen have enough to do to keep the four ranks of carriages in line, and to rescue foot passengers from the pawing hooves of three hundred guinea steeds. The walk under the trees is as crowded as the enclosure at Ascot, and the iron chairs are as fully occupied as the seats in a fashionable chapel. The pouncing proprietor, with the leathern pouch at his side, has hard work to collect his rents, so rapidly do his customers come and go, and is distracted by vague fears of levanting tenants and bad debts. On all the length of the rails between Hyde Park Corner and the Serpentine, there is scarcely room for one lounger more, for the rule of fashion is so subtle a bondage that it has compelled millions of people who never in all their lives have spoken to one another to wear the same order of garments and to talk the same slang and ride in the same kind of carriages and eat the same class of dinners and congregate in the same places at the same hour year after year and century after century from the earliest dawn of civilization until today the uninitiated lawyer's clerk from Holloway, lounging in the same attitude and wearing the same pearl-gray gloves, and the same pattern of whisker as the initiated young patrician from the crack West End clubs, may wonder whether the occupants of the splendid equipages rolling slowly by him are there by right divine of noble birth and lofty position, or by virtue of that golden open sesame, that wonderful passe partout which success bestows so often on the struggling plebeian. The uninitiated from Holloway sees that there is not so much interchange of becks and nods, so friendly greetings, as might be expected if those elegant baroches and useful landaus, those dashing male phaetones and dainty little broughams, belonged only to the privileged classes whose highest privilege is the honor of being known to one another. Perceiving this, the uninitiated perceives also with astonishing aspect certain inhabitants of the Eastern Hemisphere, known to himself in their form of money-grub, but transformed here into butterflies of fashion and driving male phaetons, advertising agents, money-lending lawyers, professional betting men, dashing brewers, popular distillers, pass before him side by side with dukes and duchesses, and only to be disguised therefrom by an impalpable something which has no name. The uninitiated, growing melancholy, begins to think that it is hard thing not to have high-stepping horses and a male phaeton, and turns sadly from so much splendor to wend his way northwards, while high-born elbows close in upon the half-yard of railing which he leaves vacant. There are few places more calculated to inspire discontent than this lady's mile, Pale envy stalks to and fro under the sheltering trees. Greed of gain lurks invisible behind the iron chairs. Disappointed ambition waits at the corner, ready to whisper in the poor man's ear. Time was when you thought it such an easy thing to win a place amongst those favorites of fortune. Time was when you thought to see your wife sitting behind high-stepping horses and your boy trotting his pony in the row. Go home, poor drudge, with your blue bag on your shoulder, and look at the slatteringly drab leaning over the wash-tub and the shabby whelp gambling for marbles in the gutter. Compare the picture of the present with the vision you once made for yourself of the future, and then be an agreeable husband and an indulgent father. 
and enjoy your domestic happiness in your penny newspaper, if you can. We are a wealthy nation, the political economist tells the poor man, and our superfluous wealth must find employment somehow or other. Hence the crush of high-stepping horses, the crowd of three hundred guinea barouches, the flutter of costly garments rustling in the summer air, the glitter and splendor which pervades every object, until it seems almost as if the superfluous gold were melted into the atmosphere, and all the female population were so many Miss Kilman sedges. The lounger on the rails may for the moment find it almost difficult to believe that hungry women and gaunt, haggard-looking men could have any place in the world of which this dazzling region is part. But he need only look backward under the shadow of the trees to see poverty and crime prowling side by side in their rags. Yet at the worst, the dazzle and the glitter are good for trade, and it is better that the tide of wealth should be rolling to and fro along the lady's mile than locked in a miser's coffers or given in alms to professional beggars at a church door. Some part of the superfluous gold must pass through the horny hands of labor before it can be transmuted into sea springs or patent axles, honiton lace or spitalfield silk, and perhaps the safest of all philosophy is that which accepts the doctrine that whatever is, is right. But amongst the loungers on the rails this summer evening, there was one person stationed with his companions some little distance from the rest of the idlers, who was very much inclined to quarrel with this easy-going axum, or with any other sentiment that involved contentment. The eyes with which Philip Foley contemplated the world were young, and rather handsome eyes, but they saw everything in a jaundiced light just now. He was a painter, self-contained and ambitious, as a disciple of art should be, but he had not yet learnt the sublime patience of the faithful disciple, and he was angry with fortune because she hid her face, forgetful that if she is a churlish mother, she can also be an overindulgent one, and sometimes destroys her fairest favorites by smiling upon them too soon. Philip Foley was in love, and the girl he loved was the most capricious little enchantress who ever studied the prettiest method of breaking her adorer's hearts. The summer light which should have shone upon the back of his shabby painting jacket as he stood before his easel dazzled his eyes as he looked along the lady's mile, seeking her carriage among the crowd. "'I say, Foley, old fellow, when are you coming out of this, eh?' demanded Sigsmund Smythe, the novelist, who had abandoned the penny public to court the favor of circulating library subscribers and had sublimated the vulgar Smith into the aristocratic Smythe. Mr. Smythe, the author, and Mr. Foley, the painter, were sworn friends, and the placid Sigsmund was recreating himself after a day's hard labor on the testimony of his latest hero, written in the hulks. Out of which? The reflective line. You haven't spoke for the last quarter of an hour. That's a pretty girl with a strawberry ice colored parasol. I say, though, old fellow, you don't suppose I've written two dozen three-volume novels without knowing something of the human mind when contemplated in relation to the tender passion? I know all about it, you know, and it's not the least use you're abandoning yourself to melancholy meditation on that subject. She's all your fancy painted her, etc., etc., I allow, but she's the coldest, hardest, and most mercenary little scoundrel in creation, and she never can be yours." Put a clean sponge over the tablet of your brain, dear boy, and turn your attention to somebody else. What new imbecility has afflicted your feeble intellect? asked the painter indignantly. I don't know what you're talking of. Oh, yes, you do, dear boy, and it's the same thing that you were thinking of, and its name amongst the vulgar is Florence Crawford, but it is better known in polite society as Flo. The young painter gave a sardonic laugh. <laughs> I should be a fool to trouble my head about her, he said contemptuously. So you would be a fool, old fellow, and so you are a fool, for you do trouble yourself about her. You've been on the watch for her carriage for the last half hour, and she has not gone by, for instead of tormenting creation at large by driving here, I dare say she is torturing mankind in particular by stopping at home. Don't be an idiot, Phil, but come to Greenwich and have some dinner. No, cried Philip. I will stop here till she passes me by with her insolent little affectation of not seeing me and all the pretty tricks that constitute her fascination. You think me a fool, Sigismund, 
but you can never think so poorly of me as I think of myself when I find myself here day after day, while the very light I want is shining into my wretched painting room at Highbury. Do you remember what Catullus says? Odi et amo, quare et facium fortasse requiris, nescio sed fieri sentio et exclusior. Do you know that it is quite possible to love and hate the same person at the same moment? I love Florence Crawford because she is Florence Crawford. I hate her for the fatal bondage in which she holds me. I hate her for her evil influence upon my career. I hate her as the slave hates his master. Do other men suffer as I do, I wonder? Or has feeling gone out of fashion, and am I behind the time? The most devoted lover nowadays only calls his betrothed a nice little party, and hopes the governor will do the right thing. The men whom I meet take pains to advertise their contempt for anything like real feeling, and the girls of eighteen tell you with a smile that a love match is the most preposterous thing in creation. The women of the present day are as heartless as they are beautiful, as artificial as they are charming, the Dead Sea fruit of a civilization that the natural growth of the age of sixty-mile-an-hour locomotives, rejoined the placid Sigismund. Do you forget that man is an imitative animal, and that the rate at which we travel has become the rate at which we live? Steam is the ruling principle of our age, and the pervading influence of our lives. Depend upon it that ever since mankind began to exist, every succeeding age has lived faster than its predecessor. Time was that when the brains were out, the man would die, says Macbeth, but now, etc., etc. He isn't a bit surprised at Ben Quo's appearance, you see. A ghost, more or less, is nothing extraordinary in a fast-going age, and we've been accelerating the pace ever since Macbeth's day. It used to take a man a week to go from London to Lyme Regis, and the best part of his lifetime to earn the few thousands which in his simple notions constituted a fortune. Nowadays, a man goes from London to New York in less than a fortnight, and he expects to make his half million or so while the purple bloom is on his locks and the light of youth in his eyes. Steam is everywhere and in everything. We educate our children by steam, and our men and women want to grow rich at the rate of sixty miles an hour. Every man has the same tastes, the same aspirations. There is no such person nowadays as the Sir Balaam who thought it a grand thing to have two puddings for his Sunday dinner. Sir Visto is not the exception but the rule, and the poor man ruins himself by blindly following the rich. Sir Balaam has a man cook and dines at Alajos. Sir Balaam's cashier has his diners from the confectioner and dines at Alajos too. Sir Visto the Manchester cotton spinner is the patron of the arts and buys largely at Christie's. His clerks follow in his wake and cover the walls of their little suburban dining rooms with impossible cuyops and sham bakhusins bought in Wardour Street. Before we die, we shall see Sir Balaam and Sir Visto in the Gazette, with all their followers at their heels. Look at the dresses and carriages passing by us. I know most of the people, more or less, and I can see the wives and daughters of hard-working professional men vying with the peerage and the autocracy of the money market. Don't rail against the women, my dear Philip. The women are what the men make them. You must have Louis before you can have El. Aspasia is impossible without Pericles. You could never have had a Cleopatra unless you had your first Caesar, or your Marion de Lorme without Cinq Mars. The lives of the women of the present day are like this drive which they call the Ladies' Mile. They go as far as they can and then go back again. See how mechanically the horses wheel when they reach the prescribed turning point? If they went any farther, I suppose they would be lost in some impenetrable forest depth in Kensington Gardens. In the drive, the rule has no exception, because, you see, the barrier that divides the park from the gardens is a palpable iron railing, which the stoutest hunter might refuse, but on the highway of life the boundary line is not so clearly defined. There are women who lose themselves in some unknown region beyond the Lady's Mile, and whom we never hear of more. Ah, oh, friend Philip, let us pity those benighted wanderers, whose dismal stories are to be found amongst the chronicles of the divorce court, whose tarnished names are only whispered by scandal-loving dowagers between the acts of an opera or in the pauses of a rubber. 
On this side, the barrier they pass seems so slight a one, a hedge of thorns, that are half hidden by the gaudy tropical flowers that hang about them. A few scratches, and the boundary is passed. But when the desperate wanderer pauses for a moment on the other side to look backward, behold, the thorny hedgerow is transformed into a wall of brass that rises to the very skies and shuts out earth and heaven. It was not often that Mr. Smythe indulged in any such rhapsody as this in ordinary society, but Philip Foley and the novelist were sworn friends and brothers, united by that pleasant bondage of sympathy which is better brotherhood than the commoner bond of kindred. Sigismund had brothers and sisters in Midlandshire, but there was not one of them who could be as much to him as Philip the painter. It is doubtful whether Mr. Foley had heard much of his friend's oration. He had been leaning on the rails in a moody attitude watching the carriages go by, and now, when he spoke, it seemed as if he were replying to some question that had been brooding in his own mind, rather than to the observations of his friend. "'Do you think I don't know Florence Crawford?' he said. "'And know that she is no wife for me, if she would have me, and she would as soon as think of marrying me as the carver and gilder who makes her father's frames.' Indeed, I dare say she'd rather marry the frame-maker, for he earns more money than I could do, and could give her finer dresses. She has told me a hundred times that she will marry for money, that when she leaves her father's house a bride with innocent bridal flowers upon her brow, she will bid farewell to her home on the same principle as that on which her housemaid leaves her, to better herself. Think of her in my carpetless painting-room at Highbury looking up from her work to watch me at my easel and beguiling me with hopeful speeches when I am depressed. One reads of that sort of wife in a novel. But can you find me such a one nowadays, Sigismund? The women of the present day live only to look beautiful and to be admired. They are pitiless goddesses at whose shrines men sacrifice the best gifts of their souls. When I look at the splendor of these carriages, the glory of the butterfly creatures who ride in them, I think how many plodding wretches are toiling in temple chambers, or lecturing in the theaters of hospitals, or pacing to and fro on the dusty floor of the stock exchange, racked by the thought of hazardous time bargains, in order that these frivolous divinities may have gorgeous raiment and high-stepping horses, and plant the arrows of envious rage in one another's tender bosoms. I think they learn the love of splendor in their cradles. They are proud of their lace frocks and gaudy sashes before they can speak, their dolls or duchesses, or what is worse, as Hippolyte Rigaud has said, poupe au camélia. And then they grow up, and some fine day a poor man falls in love with one of them, and finds that it would have been infinitely wiser to have dashed out his brains against the stone wall than to have been beguiled by the mad hope that a penniless lover's devotion could have any value in their sight. Wait till you have made a name, Phil, and can afford as grand a place as the fountains, and then see if Miss Crawford won't be civil to you. Come, we may as well slope, old fellow. It's nearly seven o'clock. The Enchantress will not appear tonight. Let us go somewhere and dine and forget her. Dine by yourself, Sieverite, answered the painter. A man whose most laborious picture sells for a ten-pound note has no right to white bait in Moselle. I can buy half a pound of damp beef at the cook shop as I go home. It will not be the first time that the silk lining of my coat has been greased by a parcel from the cook shop. I dare say I smell of beef sometimes when I call upon Florence Crawford. But, Phil, when you know I'm so glad to stand Sam, remonstrated Mr. Smythe, but he remonstrated in vain. Philip Foley rejoiced in his poverty, and his deprivations as a gladiator might rejoice in the training that he knew must ensure victory. To suffer and be strong was the young painter's motto, and he took a boyish pride in his bare rooms and his scanty dinners, the feat of pedestrianism that saved him a half-crown and cab hire, the heroism which enabled him to carry his head loftily under a hat whose bloom had vanished. He was very young. His faults were the faults of youth, his graces the graces that perish with youth. He had all the insolent confidence in his own judgment and the contempt for other people, which seems the peculiar attribute of five-and-twenty. He would point you out the feeble drawing in a fresco by Michelangelo, or the false lights in a Rembrandt, with an utter unconsciousness that he was making a fool of himself. 
hot-headed, generous-hearted, impulsive, undisciplined, candid, and true, Philip Foley was the incarnation of ambitious youth before the fiery steel has been thrice refined in the furnace of disappointment. He had only just begun the great battle, and as yet he saw in failure the evidence of the popular error, and not of his own weakness. The vision of his own future shone before him, only a little distant, and with no hindering clouds between. He was ready to paraphrase Caesar's dispatch, and cry aloud to all the world, I am coming, I shall see, I shall conquer. The painter did not turn his head to bid his friend Sigismund adieu. He was looking along the line of carriages for that one equipage, to behold, which was so thrilling a pleasure that it was worth his while to waste half a day for the chance of obtaining it. The fairy chariot came by at last with the fairy in it, and all the mortal coaches melted into air. The fairy was a pretty coquettish-looking girl, who seemed scarcely eighteen years of age, and whose dark gray eyes and black eyelashes were rendered doubly enchanting by the piquancy of their contrast with her rippling golden hair. The fair one with the golden locks has become quite a common young person in these days of cunning hair-washes and Circassian waters, but Florence Crawford's waving tresses had been tinted only by the hand of nature, and she was by no means proud of their sunny hue. She would have preferred to be a heavy-browed person of the masculine order, with blue-black hair and an aquiline nose, instead of that dear little insolent retoussé, which seemed perpetually asking questions of all humanity. Yes, Miss Crawford's nose was decidedly retoussé, but it as little resembled the vulgar snub or the lumpy pug or the uncompromising turnip as a pearl resembles a lump of chalk. It was the dearest and most delicate little nose that ever inhaled the odors of a costly bouquet in a box on the grand tier, or buried itself between the flossy ears of a Maltese terrier. It was an aristocratic nose, and could be as imperiously disdainful as this stateliest Roman. But whatever it was, its delicate outline was engraved on Philip Foley's heart too deeply for his worldly welfare or his bosom's peace. She was as far away from him as the young June moon that glimmered pale in the daylight above the Lady's Mile, and yet she was only a painter's daughter. But then there was all the distance that divides the topmost pinnacle of fame's mighty mountain from the lowest depths of obscurity between William Crawford, R. A. of the Fountains, Kensington, and Philip Foley of Adelgacia Crescent, Highbury. That he was clever, everybody who knew anything about the art he loved was ready to acknowledge, that he had something in him that was of a grander and sterner stuff than cleverness, Philip Foley himself knew very well. If he had been only clever, success would have been a much easier thing for him, and he knew this too. Owen Meredith has very nobly said that genius does what it must and talent does what it can, and Philip Foley obeyed the ungovernable impulse within him and flung gloom and darkness and meteoric skies and raging seas and all manner of titanic grandeur upon his canvases, when he should have been painting inevitable rustic maidens in scarlet cloaks trotting meekly across the wooden bridges that span placid mill streams, or fishermen's white-sailed craft bobbing up and down upon bright blue and opal seas. If it had not been for the patronage of two or three North Country magnates, whose boyhood had been spent on the bleak shores of the German Ocean, and who bought Philip's rugged cliffs and darksome seas for love of their own vanished youth, the young painter would have found life's battle a sore and difficult fight. But with a little income of his own, the grace of these rich patrons, and the help of some considerable employment from Mr. Crawford, for whom he sometimes painted backgrounds, Philip Foley was rich enough to have leisure to declaim about his poverty, and your real poverty has no time for declamation. He was rich enough to live without care, to entertain his friends, with unlimited bitter beer from the nearest tavern, and to keep an unfailing supply of mild tobacco in the French china jar that adorned his mantelpiece. He could afford to dress like a gentleman and to waste a good deal of his life in haunting the places where Florence Crawford was likely to be met, and, good or bad year, he never failed to carry a rich silk dress, or a handsome shawl, or a wonderfully inlaid casket, or a work-box, or portfolio, or tea-caddy, to a maiden lady, in a sleepy little village deep down in a pastoral valley some ten or twelve miles from Berksfield Bucks, a valley that lay out of the tracks of coach-road or railway, and had made no more progress within the last forty years 
than if the inhabitants had been so many Rip Van Winkles. The maiden lady was Philip Foley's aunt, and the only near relation he possessed. That she loved him to distraction was the most natural thing in the world, for she was a gentle and loving creature, and for the last five and twenty years of her life had concentrated her affection upon the orphan boy who had come from India, a frail nursling, to be committed to her charge by his sickly father, who went back to Bengal to die within the year of his return, on a dismal march through a cholera-haunted district. Whence the child derived his love of art, no one knew. His father had been an ensign in the company's service, his mother a frivolous young person with thirteen hundred pounds in Indian stock, a tendency to consumption and not two ideas of her own, but the divine afflatus that gave life to the nostrils of painters and poets is no hereditary possession to be handed from father to son, like so many acres of common earth or so much money in consuls. From the hour in which Philip Foley's baby fingers first tightened round a pencil, he was an artist. He drew houses and apple trees and straggling reptiles which he meant for horses before he could speak, and then when he was old enough to buy his first color box, he went out into the woods and fields like constable, and alone amongst the beautiful mysteries of nature his soul and mind expanded, unfettered and untaught. The time came, as it almost always does come, sooner or later in the lives of gifted creatures, when the appreciative stranger comes across the boy's pathway. An elderly gentleman came suddenly upon young Philip one day, as he sat on a fallen tree in a clearing, painting the glade that stretched before him, darkly mysterious in its somber shadows. The elderly gentleman asked the boy more questions than he had ever been asked consecutively in his life before, and as it generally happens to a lad who is tolerably well connected, it happened in this case. The elderly gentleman had known a member of Philip's family and was inclined to be interested in him on that account, but on a great deal more so on account of those purple shadows, said the stranger pleasantly. One may meet young sprigs of old families any day in the year, but a lad of fourteen who has such nice ideas about light and shade is by no means a common person. And your aunt is using all her interest to get you to Addiscombe, is she? So that you may follow in your father's footsteps and die of cholera at sunrise to be buried in the sands before sunset? Let your aunt use her interest to get you into Mr. Oscuro's academy, and she'll be employing it for some purpose. Your mother had some money, hadn't she? Fifty pounds a year, answered the boy, blushing. He had all the grand notions which are common to extreme youth, and was almost ashamed to proclaim the pitiful amount. And very nice, too, returned the stranger briskly. I have known men whom fifty pounds a year, yes, sir, five and twenty would have saved from ruin. Clever men, who have starved for want of ten shillings a week. A man with a pound a week secured to him for his lifetime need never commit a dishonorable act or accept an insult. Take me to see your aunt, Mr. Foley, and if I find her a sensible woman, we'll have you sitting behind your drawing bird at Oscuro's Academy before the year is out. The elderly gentleman was as good as his word. He turned out to be an amateur landscape painter, who united untiring industry to the smallest amount of ability, and who, with a very limited income, had contrived to collect a wonderful little gallery of what he called bits, broker shop, and obscure sale room acquisitions, which adorned the walls of a tiny cottage at Dulwich, in which he was wont to exhibit every Sunday to admiring friends or skeptical connoisseurs. Before the year was out, Miss Foley had consented to a bitter sacrifice, the sacrifice which she knew must come sooner or later, and had packed her boy's trunks and stood on the platform at Burkesfield to watch the departure of the train that carried him away from her. Mr. Theophilus G., the amateur and connoisseur, had talked her into the belief that her nephew was an embryo turner, and she had bidden the boy go forth upon the first stage on the great highway that leads to glory, or to disappointment and death. He left the simple elegance of his aunt's cottage and the tutorship of the Berksfield curate to plunge into the universal bohemia of art, and for four years he worked conscientiously under the fostering care of Mr. Oscuro. Then came foreign travel and then pedestrian wanderings on the wildest shores of England and Wales, highland rambles, excursions in western Ireland, a long apprenticeship to that grand mistress nature who is a better teacher than all the masters who ever created academicians. And at last the young painter established himself in a lodging at Highbury and began to paint for his daily bread. 
Then it was that his friend Mr. G introduced him to William Crawford, the great painter who employed the embryo Turner to paint backgrounds for delicious little sketches that could have been covered half a dozen inches deep by the sovereigns that were given for them. The young man accepted the employment, but disdained himself for accepting it, until there came an angel into the painting room one day to take the painter's soul captive and reconcile him to any lot that brought him near to her. The angel was Florence, only child and spoiled darling of William Crawford, who came to ask her father for a check for her milliner. She was an angel with a tiny retrousse nose and dark gray eyes that were generally mistaken for black, an impulsive angel with a temper that was more capricious than an April day. For some time after that meeting in the painting room, Philip believed that he admired Miss Crawford only as the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. But he woke one day to the knowledge that he loved her to distraction, and that the happiness of his life was as utterly at her mercy as the little golden toys hanging from her chatelaine, which she had so pretty a trick of trifling with when she talked to him. Of all men upon earth, perhaps William Crawford was the least tainted by any odor of snobbishness. No intoxicating sense of triumph bewildered him on the giddy height to which he had risen. He stood serene upon the mountain top, for he looked upward to the starry Valhalla of dead painters, whose glory seemed as high above him as the stars in which he could fancy them dwelling, and not downward to the struggling wayfarers he had left behind him. If people knew as much about painting as I do, they wouldn't believe in my pictures, said Mr. Crawford. He had rivals, rivals whom he envied and adored, against whose giant hands his own seemed to him so feeble and puny, but their names were Rembrandt and Velasquez, Rubens and Reynolds, Titian and Correggio, Guido and Van Dyck. To him art seemed a grand republic, a brotherhood in which success had no power to divide a man from his brethren. He was rich, and he spent his money royally, for he was as fond of splendor as Rubens himself, and he had not Peter Paul's affection for gold. Perhaps no man who was equally successful ever had so few enemies as William Crawford. Young men adored him. Struggling men came to him for advice. Disappointed men poured their wrongs into his ears and took comfort from his sympathy. He was the ideal painter, and he ought to have sat in the pillared hall of some old Roman palace, with a band of faithful followers watching the free sweep of his inspired hand, and an emperor in attendance to pick up his mall stick. In this man's house, Philip Foley came and went as freely as if he had been a kinsman of the host, and coming from church on a Sunday evening, the pious inhabitants of Aldegiza Crescent were apt to be startled by the apparition of the young painter dressed in evening costume, and bending his footsteps westward in the dusty summer twilight. Sunday evening at the fountains was a grand institution. On that evening, the painter was at home to his friends, and as the name of his friends was Legion, very pleasant company was to be met at Kensington between nine and twelve on every Sabbath in the season. Rank and fashion, literature and art, war and psychic, law and diplomacy, poverty and wealth, jostled one another in those bright, airy drawing rooms. The painter's fame was cosmopolitan, and foreigners from every court and capital brought him their tribute of admiration and amidst this elegant crowd Florence floated hither and thither, radiant in the most dazzling toilettes that Madame de Scoul could devise, and inflicting anguish upon the souls of her adorers by the capricious distribution of her smiles. And Philip, who could find no phrase too bitter for his denunciation of her follies, came every Sunday evening to tell her he hated and despised her, and would henceforth make it his business to forget her existence remained to adore her, and went back to Highbury more utterly her slave than before. She saw him as he lounged against the rails that bright June evening, and greeted him with a condescending little gesture of her head, adorned with Madame Ode's last madness in the shape of a bonnet. And then the baroque rolled by and she was gone. The carriages were growing thin. It was scarcely likely that she could return, for it was close upon her father's dinner hour. Poor Philip wondered what party she was going to, with whom she would dance. He fancied her smiling destruction upon the gilded youth of Tyburnia and Belgravia. He thought of those charmed circles in which she was as remote from him as if she had gone to parties in the Pleiades. And then, as he crossed the park on his pilgrimage northwards, he set his strong white teeth together fiercely and muttered, I will succeed. It was not to have his name inscribed upon the mighty roll, where blazed the names of Raphael and Correggio, that the young man aspired with such a passionate yearning. 
but to have an entree in the West End mansions where Florence Crawford was to be met. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of the Ladies' Mile》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. The Ladies' Mile by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter Two. Lord Aspendell's Daughter. When the brilliant stream of carriages had poured out of Aspley Gate. When the serpentine blushed redly in the low western sunlight, when the fashionable world had gone homeward in baroches and landaus, britskas and phaetons, to dash through the dusky park two hours hence in tiny miniature broughams, with lamps that flashed like meteors through the night, when a solemn twilight calm had come down upon the dusky greensward, and the tinkling of a sheep bell made a rustic sound in the stillness, when a town-bred grey might have sat beside the placid water meditating an elegy in a West End park, a lumbering old chariot was very often to be seen creeping up and down the lady's mile. It was a shabby old carriage with a ponderous drab hammercloth, which the moths had eaten away in bare patches here and there. A faded old carriage which might have been bright and splendid long ago when lovely Margaret, Countess of Blessington, was to be seen in the ladies' mile, and genial Lord Palmerston was called Cupid. But now, in the still gloaming, this dismal equipage might have been mistaken for some phantom chariot haunting the scene of departed glories. The pale face looking out at the window would have assisted the delusion, so lifeless was its changeless calm, a beautiful, melancholy, patrician face. You might have fancied you beheld the unreal image of a forgotten bell, a ghost of beauty gliding in her shadowy chariot beneath the spreading branches which had looked down upon her triumphs years and years ago you might have thought this if you were prone to sentimental musings in the tender twilight but if you were a sober practical person you would most likely have found out who the lady was and all about her she was lady cecile chudley orphan daughter of lord aspendell and she was the unpaid companion the unrecompensed dependent upon the elderly dowager to whom the phantom chariot belonged, and who sat far back in the vehicle while her beautiful niece looked sadly out upon the rosy bosom of the serpentine. In all the world, Lady Cecile had no other friend or protector than the dowager, who was the widow of an Anglo-Indian general, and only surviving sister of the dead Countess of Aspendell. The Anglo-Indian warrior had distinguished himself at more places ending with poor and bad than can be numerated without weariness had lived a life of reckless and barbaric extravagance in despite of all feminine remonstrance and had died leaving his widow very little except his pension and a house full of indian shawls embroidered muslins sandalwood boxes beetle baskets and trypanopoly jewelry after the general's death mrs mcclaver house the warrior was of Scottish extraction and claimed kindred with the hero of Kilcranky. After her husband's death, the widow had sold the lease of the great house in Portland Place, in whose pillared dining room the general had been wont to entertain all the notabilities of the three presidencies, and beneath whose sheltering roof he had staggered half tipsy to bed every night for the last ten years of his life. She sold the lease and the furniture and the very curious old ports and constantias and madeiras but she kept all the bangles and sandalwood the beetles wings and the gorgeous scarves and shawls and table covers and a very nice little selection from the rare old wines and a small stock of the plate and glass and china and table linen which the magnificent general had chosen of such splendid quality and with these she retired to furnished apartments on the quietest side of dorset square she kept the chariot in which she had driven and visited for the last twenty years of her life and the fat grey horses that had drawn it but she sent the equipage to a livery stable in the neighbourhood of her new abode and she bargained with the proprietor for a sober coachman at five and twenty shillings a week a coachman who wore the stable yard livery and was sometimes almost disreputable about the legs and feet and then one day she went down to Brighton, where the Earl of Aspendell and his only daughter had been living for the last ten years, in a tiny cottage on the Dyke Road, 
with a little grass plate before the windows and dimity curtains fluttering from the open casements, so poor, so friendless, so dignified in their unpretending seclusion. There was very little trouble connected with pecuniary misfortune which Cecile Chudley had not known. The extravagance of a father's youth repented of too late, the wild follies of a brother's mad career never repented of at all, but caught suddenly short by a fatal false step on a frozen mountainside, amidst the desolate grandeur of the Alps, a cheerless home, a mother's slow decay half physical, half mental, and the weary task of beguiling the monotonous days of a ruined and remorseful spendthrift. Sorrows such as these had darkened the young life, and hushed the silvery laugh, and transformed the girl of seventeen and to a woman drooping under the burden of a woman's heaviest cares. It was only when the Earl of Aspendell and his folly were buried together in a corner of the little hillside churchyard, where Captain Tattersail the loyal and Phoebe Hessel the daring sleep so quietly, it was only when Cecile was quite desolate and sat with the Times newspaper in her lap, staring hopelessly at the advertisements and wondering whether she was clever enough to be a governess. It was then only that Marion McClaverhouse thought fit to trouble herself about the fate of her dead sister's only surviving child. Her brother-in-law's death happened fortunately, as she said to herself, in the Brighton season, and as she had no invitation for the current month, Mrs. McClaverhouse decided on paying a brief visit to Brighton. The widow was of a prudent turn of mind and contrived to save money out of her limited income. For a rainy day, she said. She had been saving odd pounds and shillings and sixpences for this anticipated wet weather ever since her marriage, and as yet Jupiter Pluvius had been pitiful and had restrained his fury. She went to the little dyke road cottage to see Cecile Chudley, to inspect her, it may be said, so sharply did she scrutinize, so closely did she interrogate the girl. But Lady Cecile's mind was too candid to shrink from questioning, and she thought her aunt most nobly generous when that lady proposed to adopt her henceforth as companion, reader, amanuensis, and prop and comfort to her declining years. Lady Cecile certainly did not happen to know that the widow had been for some time on the lookout for a suitable person as companion and drudge, and had only failed to suit herself because, in her own words, the impertinent creatures wanted such preposterous salaries, and asked if I allowed port at luncheon as their physicians had ordered it. Their physicians, indeed! A dispensary surgeon or the parish apothecary, I should think, cried the widow impatiently, for she was an energetic and plain-speaking person, who was always proclaiming her want of common patience with the failings and follies of her fellow creatures. Lady Cecile went home with the dowager and ministered very patiently to her wants and pleasures, and read the newspapers to her and beat down the tradespeople and disputed about stray entries of mutton chops and half pounds of tea that had or had not been supplied, and counted the glass and was responsible for the spoons, and trembled when the widow's own parlor maid shipped a morsel out of one of the general's tumblers. For was it not her duty to see that neither glass nor china was broken, and that the silver entree dishes, salvers, butter boats, and tea trays were rubbed with a hand only and not scratched and smudged with a greasy, gritty leather? Cecile's own pretty pink palms helped to clean the dowager's plate sometimes when there was a festival in Dorset Square. Mrs. McClaverhouse was very fond of society, and entertained innumerable elderly warriors and judges of the Sutter with their wives and daughters in her stuffy little dining room. The splendid silver and glass were set forth, the rare old wines were brought out very often in the London season, and Lady Cecile bowed under the burden of a new kind of care, and went to sleep oppressed by the terror of a tablespoon missing from the plate basket, or a butter boat that had not been put away. Sometimes she felt a sick yearning for the old, monotonous days with her father, for when they were saddest, there had been a tender quiet in their sadness. In the new life there might be no sorrow, but then there was such continual worry. The burdens laid upon her were very small ones, but then there were so many of them, and every day it seemed as if the last straw would be added to the heap, and she must sink down in the dust and die. The dowager was not unkind to her niece, for she was too much a woman of the world not to know when she had a good servant, and to rejoice in the fact that she possessed that treasure at the cheapest possible rate. She was not unkind, but she was pitiless. She called Cecile, My dear, 
and bought her pretty dresses, pretty dresses that were to be had cheap after stock-taking at the West End haberdashes, dainty gauzes with the bloom off them, and muslins with soiled edges. She gave her good food and persuaded her to take half glasses of tawny port, which the girl in her secret soul thought more nasty than physic. But if Lady Cecile had been dying, Mrs. McClaverhouse would have come to her deathbed to demand the inventory of the china, and to ask if it were six or eight shell and thread patterned salt spoons that had been entrusted to the parlor maid for the last dinner party. For three years, Lady Cecile had lived on the dullest side of Dorset Square, and counted the glasses and spoons, and battled with the Marlebone tradesmen, and ridden in the phantom chariot. In all those three years, there had been only one break in the drudgery of her life, only one glimpse of sunshine, but then it was such a dazzling burst of light, such a revelation of paradise. Ah, uh, let my pen fall lightly on the paper as I write the story of that tender dream. It was the habit of Mrs. McClaverhouse to spend as much of her time in visiting as was thoroughly agreeable to her acquaintance. She liked visiting because it was pleasant and cheap, but she was too wise a woman to wear out her welcome, and no one had ever uttered the obnoxious word, sponge, in conjunction with her name. She was lively and agreeable, rather vulgar perhaps, but then genteel people are permitted to be vulgar, clever, well-dressed, of high family and acknowledged position, and she gave cozy little dinners in the season. So there were many houses in which she and her niece were favorite guests in the cheery winter days, when an old country house is such a paradise. Poor Cecile found herself sometimes looking anxiously after other people's spoons and forks in these pleasant holiday times, or taking a mental photograph of a cold sirloin or a raised pie as it was removed from the breakfast table, for one of her home duties was to register the appearances of joints and poultry before they descended into the territory of the landlady, who might or might not be honest. Mrs. McClaverhouse made a point of never quite believing in people's honesty. "'Don't tell me that I have known them for years and never known them to rob me!' exclaimed the widow. "'They may have robbed me without me knowing it, or they may not have robbed me because I never gave them the opportunity, and they may begin to rob me tomorrow if they get the chance. Look at the Bishop of Northlandshire's butler, who had lived with him thirteen years and ran away with five hundred pounds worth of plate in the fourteenth. Look at Sir Harry Hincliffe's valet, who was such a faithful creature that his master left him an annuity of two hundred a year, which he would have enjoyed very much, no doubt, if he hadn't stripped the house while his benefactor's corpse was lying in it, and had not been transported for life in consequence. Don't talk to me about honesty, Cecile. If Mrs. Creason is an honest woman, why do her eyes sparkle so when I order a large joint? And why are two quarts of bisque barely enough for six? In the autumn, Mrs. McClaverhouse generally retired to some marine retreat unfrequented by cockneys or fashionables, where lodgings were to be held on reasonable terms, and where she could recruit herself and her niece for the winter campaign. "'I really don't see why you shouldn't marry well, Cecile, though heaven knows what will become of the general's diamond-cut glass when you leave me, and I sometimes wonder how it is you haven't made a good match before now,' said the widow. I think it's that cold manner of yours that keeps the men off, and then you don't talk slang as some of the women do nowadays. You're not dashing, you know, my love, but you are very handsome and elegant and accomplished, and if any one of those flippant minxes can sing Rosini's music or write an inventory of China as well as you, I'll eat her, pearl powder and all, added Mrs. Mack with a wry face. It was very true that as yet no pretender of any importance had appeared for Lady Cecile Chudley's hand. It might be that lovers were kept off by the cold reserve of her manners, the shrinking dislike to take any prominent part in society which is apt to affect those whom poverty has always kept more or less at a disadvantage. Or it might be in consequence of that panic in the matrimonial market of which we have heard so much in these latter days. The dowager had been quite sincere when she spoke of her niece's beauty. There were few handsomer faces to be seen in the lady's mile than that which looked wistfully out of the phantom chariot. It was a pale face, pale, with no metalled sickly whiteness or bilious yellow, but that beautiful pallor which is so rare a charm, a pensive patrician face with a slender aquiline nose and dark hazel eyes. People liked to see Lady Cecile in their rooms, even when she wore her plainest white muslin and kept herself most persistently in a shadowy corner, so unmistakable was her rank and breeding. Young men who complained that she had so little to say for herself and lamented the absence of a mysterious quality called go, 
and her manners confessed that her profile was more beautiful than the finest cameo in the Louvre, and her style unexceptionable. "'If polygamy were admissible, I'd marry Lady Cecile tomorrow,' remarked a gentleman of the genus swell. "'She is a woman of women to sit at the head of a fellow's table and do him credit in society. But if I were going home half seas over after a four-in-hand club dinner at Richmond, I'd as soon have Lady Macbeth sitting up for me as Lord Aspendale's daughter. Not that she'd be coarse or low like the Scotch woman, you know, not a bit of it. She'd receive me with a stately curtsy and freeze me to death with her classic profile.' Ye gad, when you come to think of it, you know, old fellow, there must be a hitch somewhere in the matrimonial law. Society doesn't confine a man to one horse. Society doesn't compel him to ride his park hack across country or harness racing stud to his drag. And yet society limits an unhappy beast to one wife. And if he marries a nice little indulgent creature who won't look black at him when he comes home late or smokes in the dining room, the odds are that she'll freeze his marrow by dropping her H's and talking of her par, who was something in the soap-boiling way, at an archbishop's state dinner. In the second autumn of Lady Cecile's dependence, the dowager carried her niece and her parlor maid to a pretty little village on the Hampshire coast, a sleepy little village where the fruit was blown off the trees and farmers' orchards by the fresh breath of ocean breezes a village nestling under the shadow of brown, sunburnt hills, a long, straggling street of rustic cottage, with here and there a quaint old gabled dwelling place of a better class, shut in by moss-grown walls and nestling in such gardens as are to be seen on that southwestern coast. Very few cockney visitors ever invaded the drowsy hamlet of Fortinbras, where the watering place habitué would have looked in vain for the cliffs or the jetty, the brazen band and the buff slippers, the Ethiopian serenaders, and the wheel of fortune, so dear to his cockney soul. At Fortinbras, there were only two bathing machines, and the sole attraction which the place possessed for sightseers was a grand old Norman castle, whose mighty keep towered high above the farmyards and orchards, and within whose walls red-shirted cricketers met on sunny summer afternoons and whither village Sunday school children came now and then to feast on buns and tea. The coast of Fortinbras was low and flat and weedy, and sometimes a faint odor of stale seaweed floated up from the shining sands on the evening air. Your cockney would have fled aghast from the place as an elfy, but for Lady Cecile, the rustic village and the weedy coast had an odor of Longfellow and Tennyson that was delicious to her soul, and she felt as if she would have been unutterably happy if she could have bidden an eternal farewell to Dorset Square and Mrs. McClaverhouse's plate chest and china closet to take up her abode under the shelter of the Norman castle and the grassy hills for the rest of her life. She wandered alone on the wet sands while her aunt took an afternoon dinner nap on the first evening of their arrival. She lingered by the cool gray sea and watched the changing glories of the low western sky in a kind of rapture. And there are people who like Dorset Square better than this, she thought. Oh, dear, dear, lonely place, how I love you. Was it only a sensuous delight in the beautiful sky, the cool, breezy atmosphere, the rustic calm? Or was it because the happiest days of her life were to be spent on this weedy shore? If a coming sorrow casts its ominous shadow on the foredoomed creature who is to suffer it, should no prophetic sunshine herald the coming of joy? Lady Cecile was happier that August evening than she ever remembered having been in her life, and there was a faint bloom on her cheeks like the pinky heart of a wild rose when she went home to the pretty cottage, half grange, half villa, which Mrs. McLaverson had hired for the season. For a mere song, my dear, and a duck, for which that extortionate Jiffles would have had the audacity to charge me four shillings I get here for half a crown, wrote the dowager to a friend and confidant. Cecile found her aunt in very high spirits. "'You've heard me talk a good deal of my husband's nephew, Hector Gordon, the only son of Andrew Gordon, the great contractor. Yes, I know that a person who contracts seems something horrible vulgar, and that's what Margaret McClaverhouse's grand friend said when she married her. But Andrew Gordon was as polished a gentleman as ever sat in Parliament, and he did sit there, my dear, and he does this day. And Scotchman, whose pride has a good deal that's noble in it, don't think it a more degrading thing to make money honestly by straightforward commerce than to get rich by time bargains and rigging the market. 
I know there are people to this day who are inclined to look down upon Hector, and when he joined the eleventh there was one man, a freckled, flaxen-haired creature with weak eyes, whose father was a money-lending attorney, who tried to get up a laugh against our boy by asking some questions about Andrew's business transactions. I don't know what Hector said or did, Cecile, but I know the young man never tried to sneer at him again, and sold out shortly afterwards because his sight was too weak for India. You've heard me talk about the boy till you were almost tired of his name, I dare say, my dear. Cecile smiled. She was thinking how many of Mrs. McClaverhouse's pet subjects she had grown weary of within the two years of her slavery, and that this womanly talk of the favorite nephew was the least obnoxious of them. "'It's only natural that you should be fond of him,' she said. "'You'd have some reason to say so, Cecile, if you'd known him when he was four years old,' answered her aunt. "'At four, I think he was the loveliest child that ever was created. Such blue eyes, not your wishy-washy milk-and-water color that some parents call blue, but as deep and dark as that purple convolvus and the vase yonder.' And then the widow went on to relate to Cecile the very familiar legend of how poor Margaret went off into a consumption soon after the infant's birth, and how she, being alone in England at the time, took up her abode in Andrew Gordon's house to superintend the reign of the child, which saved my expenses elsewhere and was doing a favor to the poor helpless widower, said Mrs. McClaverhouse parenthetically. And then, you know, my dear, the general, being particularly fond of children, like most people who have none of their own, took a tremendous fancy to his poor sister's child, so nothing would do but that the boy must be continually in Portland Place whenever his uncle was in England. And I'm sure I wonder that darling child's constitution was not completely ruined by the mangoes and chutney and raging hot curries the general allowed him to eat. And when Hector was at Oxford and my husband had settled down after the last Afghan war, it was just the same. I think the young man spent as much of his time in Portland Place as at the university, and it was the general who put a military career into his head, much to his father's annoyance. For Andrew would have liked him to go into the house and preach about poor laws and national surveys and main drainage and such like. However, whatever Hector wished was sure to be done sooner or later, for I do believe there never was a young man so completely spoiled by everybody belonging to him, and the end of it was that his father bought him a commission in the Eleventh Plungers, as you know. Yes, the story was a very old one for Cecile. She had listened with unfailing patience to her aunt's prosy discourses about Hector Gordon, and as the dowager was generally in a good temper when she talked of him, her niece had no unpleasant association with his name. But familiar as his graces and merits had become to her, through the praises of his aunt, Cecile felt no special interest in the young captain. She knew that he had been a good son and a brave soldier, but then there are so many good sons and brave soldiers in the world. She knew that he had distinguished himself in India by doing something desperate in connection with the fort, but then young men in India are always doing desperate things in connection with forts. If ever any image of Hector Gordon presented itself to Lady Cecile's imagination, it took the shape of a clumsy Scotchman with high cheekbones and sandy hair. Mrs. McClaverhouse called his hair Auburn, but then that word Auburn has such a wide signification. Cecile listened to the old, old story of Hector's childhood tonight as patiently as she had been wont to listen any time within the last two years. But even calm, queenly Lady Cecile Chudley was a little startled when the dowager exclaimed, "'And now, my dear, I'm going to surprise you. Hector Gordon will be here to breakfast with us tomorrow morning. Auntie, he will arrive with the London papers that quarter before twelve o'clock. We must have fried soles, mutton, cutlets, and Worcester sauce, and potted game, and all those coarse high-season things that men like.' And you can put a little fruit on the table to make it look pretty, which of course will do for dessert afterwards, and you will have to give out the tea and coffee service and half a dozen large forks. I only hope and pray the servants here are honest. If it wasn't for that tiresome lie and prancing upon every atom of silver, one might persuade servants and people that it was all electric. But, Auntie, said Cecile heedless of the housekeeping details, I thought Captain Gordon was in India. And so did I, my dear, but it seems he has come home on sick leave, not ill, he tells me, but only knocked up by climate and hard work, and he went to Dorset Square yesterday morning unannounced, on purpose to surprise me, the consequence of which was that he found me out of the way, as people generally do when they plan these romantic surprises, and he has brought me an Indian shawl, because I am so fond of Indian shawls, he says. That's always the way with people. If they see you are suffering from a plethora of any kind of property, they take it into their heads that you have a passion for that especial class of property 
property, and rush to buy you more of it. I have no common patience with such folly. Perhaps Mrs. McClaverson said this because it was her habit to be sharp and unsparing, and she found herself too much inclined to melt into weak motherly tenderness when she spoke of her nephew. Now the hero of all the old nursery and schoolboy stories was so near at hand, Cecile Chudley began to think of him a little more seriously than ever she had done before. He was weak and ill, no doubt, his aunt said, in spite of his assurances to the contrary, and in that case he must be kept in the sleepy Hampshire village and nursed till he was strong again. "'And you must help to nurse him, Cecile,' said the widow. "'And if by any chance he should happen to fall in love with you, "'be sure you remember that he's a better match "'than one out of fifty of the young men you meet in London, "'and heaven knows they are scarce enough nowadays. "'If you weren't my sister's own child, "'I wouldn't throw you in his way, "'for Hector might marry any woman in England, "'but at the worst it would sound well "'for his wife's name to have a handle to it.' "'Lady Cecile's face was dyed with a hot, indignant blush. "'I am not the sort of person to be fascinated "'by Captain Gordon's money,' "'Aunt McClaverson,' she said. "'Perhaps not,' answered the old lady coolly. "'But you may fall in love with him.' Cecile was too angry to answer that the dowagers should talk coolly of Hector Gordon, the contractor's son, as a great catch for the descendant of Aspendells and Chudleys, who had helped to vanquish his countrymen at Flodden, stung the earl's daughter to the very heart. She had so little but her grand old lineage left to her that it was scarcely strange she should be proud of it, there came a time not many weeks after this august evening when she looked back thought what a delicious thing it must have been to have her name coupled with his and to be ignorant that there was any wrong in the association but to-night she was wounded and indignant and though she went out into the kitchen premises by and by to give orders about the cutlets and the soles and the potted meats for the plunger captain's breakfast her heart was not in the duty and she sent none of those little messages to the butcher woman which a woman would have done who loved the coming cutlet consumer she thought how unpleasant it would be to have a clumsy scottish invalid lying on the sofa in the cosy little drawing-room where she had hoped to read tennyson and owen meredith all by herself in the warm drowsy afternoons and the time came and so soon when no sofa that gillow could devise would have seemed soft enough for so dear a visitor when every glimmer of sunshine or breath of summer air in that cosy drawing-room was watched and calculated as closely as if a valuable life had depended upon the adjustment of the venetians or the opening and shutting of the french windows lady cecile went out upon the seashore after an early cup of tea on the morning that was to witness hector gordon's arrival she had arranged a pile of dewy plums nestling in their dark green leaves in a basket of hot-house grapes with her own hands for she had the magical touch whereby some women can impart beauty to common things she had surveyed the breakfast-table and had given orders as to the moment at which the tea and coffee were to be made and the fish put into the frying-pan and she left a message for her aunt to the effect that she was gone for a long walk and would not be home to breakfast it would be so much better she fancied to leave the widow and her nephew tete-a-tete -tete on this first morning of the soldier's arrival she had done her duty conscientiously and having done it she went out to breathe the sweet morning air and shake off the unpleasant idea of the coming scotchman i have been tolerably comfortable with my aunt so far she thought in spite of the spoons and forks but now i shall only interfere with her enjoyment of this dreadful scotchman's society oh papa papa how i miss you and the dreary little house on the dyke road where we live so peacefully together with all the winds of heaven howling round us and rattling in our windows in the dead of night she went under the ponderous archway beneath which a portcullis still hung and into the grassy enclosure which had once been the muster-ground of the castle at this early hour there was neither sunday school children nor exploring visitors among the old grey ruins the fresh sea breezes fluttered the little plume in lady cecile's hat and blew all thoughts of vexation out of her mind she mounted the winding stair of the keep a dangerous treacherous stair which had been worn by the tread of mailed feet in the days that were gone and the buff boots of excursionists from the isle of wight in this present age she went to the very top of the great norman tower high up above all grievances about hector gordon and his breakfast and emerged upon the battlements a fragile fluttering little figure amid that massive medieval stonework whose grey ruin was grander than the most elaborate glories of modern architecture she heard the whistle of the engine as she entered the castle and she imagined that at this moment hector gordon must be installed at the breakfast-table 
devouring chops she thought with a contemptuous little grimace it is so natural for a girl of nineteen to think meanly of a man who is below her in social status to think philip foley painting in his hybern lodging and dressed in a threadbare shooting jacket lady cecile chudley would have been unspeakably gracious but for a scion of the caledonian plutocracy she had nothing but good-natured contempt he is an invalid poor fellow she thought i am sure it is very wicked of me to think his visit a bore she settled matters with her conscience by determining to be very attentive to the physical comforts of her aunt's favorite i dare say he would like some salmon for dinner she thought i'll call at the fishmonger's as i go home and then she took a volume of victor hugo's poetry from her pocket and began to read the noble verse carried her aloft on its mighty pinions high up into some mystic region a million miles above the battlements of the norman tower she had an idea that she could not leave her aunt and captain gordon too long undisturbed on this particular morning and she abandoned herself altogether to the delight of her book it was so seldom that she was able to entirely forget that there were such things as silver forks and dishonest servants in the world even to-day she was not allowed to be long unconscious of the outer world for when she had been reading in about twenty minutes she heard a voice close beside her exclaim i am so glad you like victor hugo pray forgive me for being so impertinent as to look over your shoulder but i have been searching for you everywhere and i am to take you home to breakfast please if you are lady cecile chudley and i am almost sure you are she started to her feet and looked at the speaker he was the handsomest man she had ever seen tall and grand and fair the very type of a classic hero she fancied as he stood before her on the battlements with the winds lifting the short auburn curls from his bare forehead he was no more like the traditional scotchman than the duc de almale is like one of gilroy's frenchmen there was no more odour of the parvenu about him than about a bayard or a napier in all her life she had never seen any one like him it was not because he was handsome that she was struck by his appearance for she had generally hated handsome men as the most obnoxious of their species it was because he was himself for once in her life lord aspendale's daughter whose calm reserve was so near akin to hauteur was fairly startled are you really captain gordon she asked amazed i am indeed and that question tells me that i was right and you are lady cecile and we are at least we ought to be cousins since dear aunt mcclaverhouse stands in the same relation to both of us End of chapter two Chapter Three of the Ladies' Mile. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elsie Selwyn. The Ladies' Mile by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter Three. Hector. The trio in the little breakfast parlor in Sea View Cottage, Fortinbras, was perhaps one of the pleasantest parties that ever met at so simply furnished a board. The spirit of the immortal Clicquot, whose vintages have made his widow's name so celebrated, may have smiled contemptuously at such a breakfast table, on which the strongest beverages were tea and coffee, the mighty chiefs of Philippe and the Maison de Ré, would have held up their hands and shrugged their shoulders with amazement if told that these benighted insulars could really enjoy these coarse viands and feel no national craving for suicide or national tendency to spleen before the barbarous meal was concluded and yet there are few cabinets particuliers and the boulevards whose gaudily papered walls have ever echoed to happier laughter than that of the young indian hero as he gave a serio-comic rendering of his adventures warding off all praise of great and gallant deeds by the playful tone which made peril seem a joke and desperate valour the most commonplace quality of man mrs mcclaverhouse would have been pleased to listen all day to the voice of that charmer of six feet two but her sharp matronly eye perceived presently that the stalwart plunger looked pale and worn and was by no means unqualified for the sick list so she sent lady cecile to the drawing-room to see to the arrangements of the venetians and then she led her boy to the sofa which was not nearly long enough for him and had to be eked out with chairs 
The captain remonstrated energetically against this sybarite treatment, but his aunt was inflexible, and as he was very familiar with the strength of her will, he laid himself down at last as meekly as a child. "'And you can read to us, Cecile,' said Mrs. McClaverhouse, producing her knitting needles and an uncompromising grey worsted sock, such as Robert Burns may have worn when his plough turned up the immortal daisy. The dowager knitted these worsted instruments of torture for a Dorcas society which she honoured with her patronage and a very small annual subscription. "'Come, Cecile,' she said presently, when her niece came softly into the room after a mysterious visit to the cook. "'Hector has been amusing us all the morning, and the least we can do is amuse him this afternoon. Suppose you read him to sleep.' If the Scottish warrior had been anything like the image she had made of him in her mind, Cecile Chudley would have been very much disposed to rebel against this command. But there are some people born to walk upon roses, and to inhale the perfumed breath of incense, and Hector Gordon was one of them. His nurses had idolized him, his father had worshipped him, his uncle and aunt had spoiled him, his brother officers of the plungers loved him, and dressed after him, and talked after him, and thought after him, and with that feminine admiration, that subtle and delicious flattery which is most intoxicating of all earthly incense, Hector had been almost surfeited. He was very delightful, the freshness and brightness of an unsullied youth pervaded every tone of his voice, every thought in his mind, every ringing note of his genial laugh, so hearty without loudness, so exuberant without vulgarity. Perhaps his greatest charm lay in the fact that he was young and did not consider his youth a thing to be ashamed of, and there are so few young men nowadays. Much has been said about the irresistible witchery of a polished Irishman, the delightful vivacity of a well-born Frenchman, but has anyone ever sung the graces of a high-bred Scotchman? What words can fairly describe the nameless fascination which has a dash of the Irishman's insidious flattery, a spice of the Frenchman's brilliant vivacity, but which has a tender softness possessed by neither, a patrician grace not to be equaled by any other nationality in the world? In all the history of modern Europe, the two people who, by manner alone, have exercised the most powerful influence upon their contemporaries have been Mary, Queen of Scots, and her great-grandson, Charles Stuart. Of all the poets, who has ever so enthralled the hearts of women as George Jordan, Lord Byron, whose maternal lineage was Scotch, of all lovely and fascinating women whose names will be remembered in the future, is there any fairer or lovelier than Eugenie Marie de Guzman, Countess of Tiba, Empress of the French, and scion of the Kirkpatricks of Closeburn? There are flowers that flourish in the sunshine and flowers that thrive only in the shade, and as it is in the vegetable, so it is in the animal kingdom. There are men whom a perpetual atmosphere of adulation would have transformed into supercilious fops or selfish profligates. Hector Gordon made no such vile return for the tenderness which had been so freely lavished upon him. High-minded and generous-hearted, brave as a Leonidas or a Clyde, he was no bad example for the young men who formed themselves upon him. It was said that there was less bill discounting and card playing amongst the officers of the eleventh plungers than in any other cavalry regiment in the service. For it is your dashing young captain rather than your middle-aged colonel who gives the tone to the youngsters of a mess. They may obey their commanding officer, but they will copy their brilliant companion. But it must not be supposed that under any circumstances Hector Gordon could have come under the denomination of a good young man, for it seems an understood thing that the typical good young man must be nothing but good. Hector was neither evangelical nor pussyite in his tendencies, but rather of that good, easy-going broad church which winks good-naturedly at a parson in pink and sees no criminality in a cheerful rubber. He went to church once or twice on a Sunday, as the case might be, and did his best to join earnestly in the service and to listen with sustained attention to the sermon. If his thoughts wandered now and then to the highland peaks, amidst whose lonely grandeurs he had once shot a mighty white eagle, or to the deer-stalking adventures or grouse-shooting in the last autumn, 
if his fancy played him false and brought some bright girlish face before him with the memory of one especially delicious waltz and one peculiarly intoxicating flirtation if such small sins as these sullied his soul now and then when the sermon was duller and longer than it should have been it must be remembered that he was very young and that the chastening influence of sorrow had not yet shadowed his life or lessened his delight in the common pleasures of his age lying on the sofa in the low-roofed old-fashioned drawing-room at fortinbras and shrouded by a leopard-skin railway rug which mrs mcclaver house had insisted on casting over him the young captain looked like an invalid titan but a titan with a nimbus of waving auburn hair above his head and the brightest blue eyes that ever took a fierce light amid the glare of battle or softened to feminine tenderness when they looked upon a woman's face lady cecile contemplated her aunt's favourite at her leisure as she sat by an open window with her face quite hidden in the shadow of drooping curtains and closed venetians and she had fancied him such a vulgar clumsy creature a freckled red-haired object like a tobacconist's highlander in modern costume a loutish caledonian hercules with a gaelic sing-song in his voice and with no belief in anything but the grandeur of princes street edinburgh and the immortality of robert burns cecile chudley looked at him slyly from beneath the shadow of her long lashes and smiled at the recollection of her old fancies as if one's idea of a place or person were ever anything like the reality she thought i ought to have known that captain gordon would prove the very opposite of the image i had made him she took up some books presently from the table near her and looked at the titles how can you ask me to read to captain gordon auntie she demanded archly when you know we have no books or papers that can interest him we have neither bell's life nor the united service gazette nor yet post and scarlet or silk and paddock or whatever those barbarous books are called that gentlemen are so fond of i think there are some odd numbers of mr sponge's sporting tour in a cupboard in dorset square and i dare say we could get them sent down by post but for to-day will you read me some of hugo's verses asked captain gordon i mustn't talk slang to a lady or i would entreat you not to chaff me while i'm on the sick list i have read as much sporting literature as any man i dare say in my day and post and paddock is a capital book i do assure you lady cecile but i think i know my tennyson too i have recited locksley hall from the first line to the last out yonder when we've been dreadfully hard up for talk and you should have seen how scared my kilnagar looked i think he fancied our great alfred's masterpiece was a volley of bad language they're so unaccustomed to hear anything but bad language from englishmen poor fellows if i am really to be treated as an invalid and dear foolish auntie here insists upon it i will exercise my prerogative and demand one of hugo's odes cecile opened the little volume that she had carried to the top of fortinbras keep and turned the leaves listlessly with slim white fingers that sparkled faintly with the gems and quaint old-fashioned rings she paused with the volume open at those wonderful verses in which the classic sybarite bewails the weariness of his felicity and pushing the venetian shutter a little way open she began to read with a half smile upon her face the summer sunlight flooded her face and figure and the summer air fluttered one loose tress of her dark brown hair as her head drooped over her book vous me avez fait dans ma fleur dieu donnez l'espérance à ma froide jeunesse je vous rendez tous ces biens pour un plus de bonheur when cecile came to these closing lines of the sybarite's complaint the scottish hercules flung off his leopard skin and walked across the little room to the open window by which lady cecile was seated it's no use auntie he said i'm not an invalid if i loll upon that sofa lady cecile will take me for a modern celsus and upon my word i have felt like that fellow once or twice in my life i've never been exactly savage with providence for giving me so many blessings but i have felt as if i should like to have had a little more of the fun of wishing for things look at my position i'm not used up and i don't affect to be used up like some fellows 
I don't make a howling about having lost the faculty of pleasure, or the belief in my fellow men, or anything of that kind. I'm no disciple of Alfred de Musset or Owen Meredith, but I really have run through the better part of the pleasures that last most men their lifetime. There's scarcely anything in the way of adventure that you can propose to me that I haven't done, from tooling a drag along the ladies' mile when the carriages were thickest, to ascending Mont Blanc, or scaling a red-hot brick wall on a fireman's ladder. There's scarcely any route you can suggest to me for a holiday tour that I'm not as familiar with as Murray. And yet I'm only seven and twenty, so long as we have plenty to do in India, I shall be right enough. But if our fellows should overcome to be planted in country quarters, without any prospect of work, what's to become of me? And then I've promised to sell out in a few years. He added in a much graver tone. Promise to sell out? screamed Mrs. McClaverhouse. That's your father's doing, I know. But you can't leave the army until you marry, I suppose. Oh, no, not until I marry. He took up the volume of poems which Cecile had laid down. Let me read to you, ladies, he said. Am I not here to minister to your pleasures and obey your behests? Tell me your favorites, Lady Cecile. They discussed the book in his hand, and Cecile discovered that Captain Gordon was very familiar with the poet. He read well, and good reading is such a rare accomplishment. His accent was irreproachable, and if there was a charm in his full, rich voice when he spoke English, the charm was still greater when he spoke French. He spoke French and German to perfection, for he had been well grounded in both languages, though not very materially advanced in either at Eton or Oxford and he had spent a considerable part of his youth wandering from city to city with a private tutor, a retired Austrian officer, who was both learned and accomplished, and who adored his pupil. When two people, both under the age of thirty, discover that they admire the same poet, they have gone halfway towards a pleasant intimacy. After that discussion of Victor Hugo and the reading aloud that followed, and the desultory talk about Germany and German literature, India and Indian politics, London and common friends and acquaintances who were to be met there, that succeeded the poetical lecture. Lady Cecile Chudley quite forgot all her old fancies about Captain Gordon and resigned herself to the idea of his visit. And after this they were the best friends in the world, and Mrs. McClaverhouse was quite contented to allow Cecile a share in her boy's society. She was a very sensible woman in her way and liked the society of young people when it was to be had cheaply. Hector and Cecile's animated discussions upon almost all subjects to be found between earth and heaven amused the widow as she basked in the sunshine, seated in her pet chair before a window with her favorite aspect. She astonished the young people very often by the shrewdness of the remarks with which she cut in upon them, smiting their pretty fanciful theories into atoms with a sledgehammer of common sense. Altogether, she was very well satisfied with the aspect of affairs. If the motherless lad whom she loved so tenderly and thought of as a lad in spite of his seven and twenty years, if Hector Gordon had been a landless younger son, with his fortune to carve out for himself, Mrs. McClaverhouse would no doubt have loved him dearly, for the sake of his blue eyes and his frank, handsome face, his generous nature and gladsome soul, but she would scarcely perhaps have loved him quite so much, or looked for his coming quite so gladly under such circumstances as she did now, when all the blessings or pleasures that wealth can purchase attended his footsteps wherever he went, and created an atmosphere of luxury around and about the dwelling in which he lived. A hungry nephew always hard up and in need of pecuniary assistance would have been a heavy trial to Mrs. McClaver House. Nothing could have been more delightful to the dowager than the captain's manner of opening the campaign on the morning after his arrival. They had breakfasted early this morning, for Hector insisted that he was well enough to get up with the birds if necessary, and that so far as any claim to feminine compassion or to sick leave went, he was the veriest impostor in existence. It was after the little party had dawdled considerably over the breakfast table and when Cecile had departed to hold solemn counsel with the cook, that Hector addressed his relative. "'Now, my dear auntie,' he said, "'it's essentially necessary that you and I should understand each other.' In the first place, I adore Fortinbras. I think it is the most delightful place in the universe. And if the possessor of that delicious old castle would only be good enough to conceive an aversion for it, and find himself hopelessly insolvent, or something of that kind, I'd buy it off him tomorrow. Councils have risen, 
and eighth since last Tuesday, and it's a good time for selling out, and restore it. Queen Elizabeth's drawing room would make an admirable billiard room, if only had those necessary trifles, a floor and a ceiling. I'd make my hunting stables out of the banqueting hall, imagine a loose box with a wall four feet thick, and I'd sleep in the topmost chamber of the great Norman Tower, with a flagstaff swaying close above my head, and a general sensation of inhabiting a balloon. But all this is beside the question, Auntie. What I want to say is, is that I have fallen desperately in love with Fortinbras, and as I am likely to stay here till you become unutterably weary of my society, I must insist upon your accepting this check which I wrote this morning, for you know of old what an expensive fellow I am, and I should feel perfectly miserable if I felt myself sponging on you without the least chance of returning your hospitality. The captain crumpled the folded check into his aunt's hand. The widow began some vague protest, but her nephew suffocated her scruples by a sonorous kiss, and whatever objections she urged against the receipt of his money were lost in the luxuriance of his beard. And now, the next question is, how are we to enjoy ourselves? exclaimed Hector, while his aunt speculated upon the figures inscribed on that crumpled scrap of paper which her fingers so itched to unfold. In the first place, we must have a carriage, and in an exploration which I made this morning before you were up, Mrs. McClaver House, I discovered that the only vehicle we can have is a shabby old fly which began life as a britska, and a shabby old pair of horses which in their early days, I suspect, have been employed in the agricultural interest. But as the shabby old carriage is clean and roomy, and as I am told the clumsy old horses are good at going, and as a person in the position of that proverbial Hobson must not be fastidious, I have engaged the vehicle for the season. So now, my dearest auntie, prepare yourself for a chronic state of picnic. I have written to Fortnum and Mason to send us a cargo of picnic provisions, innumerable mahogany-colored hams and tongues and Stratsbury pies and potted fowl of all species and all those wonderful preparations which taste of grease and pepper so much more than of anything else. And I have found the most delightful nurserymen in the world who will supply us with hot house grapes and apricots and the carriage will be here at twelve. So pray run away and put on your bonnet, Auntie, and let Lady Cecile know all about our plans. You like Cecile? Excessively. I think she is charming. Mrs. McClaverhouse shrugged her shoulders. You think everything charming, she said. She was familiar with his sanguine temperament and his faculty for seeing everything in its sunniest aspect. But I think Lady Cecile Chudley more charming than most things. I have seen very few women to compare with her, though she is by no means a showy beauty. I was struck by her profile as she sat in the sunlight yesterday. I never saw a more delicate outline except in the face of the Empress Eugenie, and she has something of Eugenie's pensive gravity in her expression. Not pride, but the sort of thing which common-minded people mistake for pride. I think you have reason to be proud of such a niece. She ought to marry well. I hope she will, answered the widow. If there was any special significance in her tone, Gordon was too careless to be conscious of it. He walked to the open window, humming an Italian air from the last successful opera, and then he strolled out on the lawn, which was screened from the high road by a tall, old-fashioned privet hedge, and a modern bank of showy evergreens across which the sea breezes blew fresh and cool. He was very happy with an innocent, boyish happiness as he paced to and fro upon the elastic turf, which seemed to spring under his light foot. In all his life he had never known any acute pain, any bitter grief. Of all possibilities in life, the last thing which he could have imagined was that he had come to meet his first great sorrow here, where he was happy in the planning of such simple pleasures as might have seemed insipid to a modern schoolboy. "'What an old-fashioned fellow I am,' he thought as he stopped with his hand in his pocket, searching for his cigar case. "'If any of my chums in the eleventh knew that I was looking forward to a day's ramble in a rumbling old fly with a couple of women,' I think they'd cut me dead ever afterwards, and yet they're not such a bad lot of fellows after all, only there's not one of them has pluck enough to own he can enjoy himself. Captain Gordon had smoked out his cigar by the time the fly drove up to the garden gate. He threw the ash away and shook the fumes of his cabana out of his hair and beard, and then went to meet the dowager and Lady Cecile. 
the dowager stately in black silk robes which she possessed in all stages of splendor and shabbiness and which she wore always because it was suitable for a person of my age my dear and by far the most economical thing one can wear as she informed her confidants the indian shawl the shawl which the captain had brought to fortinbras in one of his portmanteaus hung across mrs mcclaverhouse's arm in compliment to the donor and behind the window came cecile in a pale muslin dress and scarf and looking very lovely under the shelter of a broad leghorn hat they drove away in the bright summer sunshine through country lanes where the breath of the sea came to them laden with the perfume of flowers where rustic children ran out of cottage doors to curtsy to them as they drove by or even to set up a feeble cheer as if the fly had been a triumphal chariot the drive was a success as indeed almost all things were on which hector gordon set his desire mrs mcclaverhouse was radiant for her inspection of the check had proved eminently satisfactory hector was delightful throwing his whole heart and soul into the task of amusing his companions gay with the consciousness of pleasing and with the insouciance of a man who has never known trouble and if lady cecile was the most silent of the little party it was only because she felt most deeply the delicious repose of the rustic scenery the exquisite sweetness of the untainted atmosphere they had many such drives after this exploring the country for twenty miles round fort and brass they held impromptu picnics on breezy heights above the level of the sea picnics in which the rector of fortinbras and his two pretty daughters were sometimes invited to join and which ended with tea-drinking at sea-view villa and croquet on the lawn and then they had lonely drives to distant villages where there were old norman churches to be explored under convoy of quavery old sextons who always had to be fetched from their dinner or their tea dusky old churches which mrs mcclaver house declined to enter and in whose solemn gloom hector and cecile dawdled together discussing the dates of doors and windows tombs and font stalls and reading desk while the old sexton hovered respectfully in attendance and while the old dowager dozed delightfully in her carriage lulled by the booming of excited bees sometimes mrs mcclaver house was too lazy to go out at all and on those occasions the shabby fly and the shabby horses enjoyed a holiday while hector and cecile strolled on the sands before the villa or dawdled on the lawn they were very happy together all lady cecile's proud reserve melted under the influence of the scotchman's genial nature it was simply impossible not to like him it was very difficult to resist his fascination the indescribable witchery that lurked in his manner when he wished to please lord aspendale's daughter found herself forgetting how slight a link bound her to this pleasant companion and admitting him to a cousinly intimacy before she had time to think of what she was doing and then it was such an easy brotherly and sisterly friendship that to draw back from it would have seemed prudish and ungracious so cecile walked and talked with the young captain and read and played to him in the evenings and enjoyed to the full that delightful association which can only arise between two well-bred and highly educated people if either of them had been ignorant or shallow selfish or vain such close companionship must have become intolerable at the end of a week everybody knows how weary madame du defend and president henault grew of themselves in existence in less than twelve hours when they met in a friend's deserted apartment in order to escape from their visitors for the enjoyment of each other's society but then madame and the president were middle-aged lovers and the freshness of youth was wanting to transform the place of their rendezvous into a paradise it was when hector gordon had been staying nearly a month at fortinbras that the sharp-spoken and worldly dowager suddenly awakened lady cecile from that mental languor which had stolen upon her since his coming he seemed to have brought so much sunshine with him and she had abandoned herself so entirely to the delight of its warmth and radiance lulled by the belief that it was the change from dorset square to fortinbras that had filled her heart and mind with such unwonted gladness mrs mcclaver house had a very acute perception of all matters in which her own interests were in any way implicated and she had woven a little scheme in relation to her nephew and niece the dishonest steward who made friends of the mammon of unrighteousness has many disciples in our modern day and the dowager had certain views with regard to captain gordon's settlement in life views which involved her enjoyment of a permanent home with the nephew she loved it was for the furtherance of this little scheme that she sat at home so often while hector and cecile walked side by side upon the shore or loitered in the garden and this object was in her mind when she let them sing duets to her in the dusky drawing-room 
and sank so often into gentle slumbers while they sang, or paused to talk in voices that were hushed in harmony with the still twilight. "'I suppose you will scarcely turn up your nose now, Lady Cecile, if I venture to tell you that my nephew will be a first-rate match,' exclaimed the dowager one morning, when she found herself alone with her niece. Cecile blushed crimson. "'I... I don't understand you, Auntie,' she stammered. "'Oh, of course not, Cecile. I hate a sly girl, and I begin to think you are sly. Do you mean to tell me you don't understand the drift of Hector's attentions to you?' "'But, dear Auntie, he's not attentive, at least not more attentive than a man must be to any woman he meets. Pray do not take any absurd idea into your head. We are almost relations, you know, when we get on very well together, much better than I ever thought we should. But as for anything more than a cousinly kind of friendship— "'A cousinly kind of fiddlestick!' cried the energetic dowager. Do you think I can believe that all that strolling on the beach, and all that dawdling on the lawn, and all that mumbling by the piano, which I hear in my sleep, means nothing but cousinly friendship? On my honor, Auntie, Captain Gordon has never said a word to me which the most indifferent acquaintance might not have said. Then what, in heaven's name, does the man mumble about? demanded Mrs. McClaverhouse sharply. Oh, we have so much to talk of. Our favorite books and pictures and music. Places we have both seen. Old acquaintances. Places that he only has seen. And people whom he only has known. And then sometimes we get a little metaphysical or even mystical. You know how superstitious the Scotch are, and I believe Captain Gordon is almost inclined to believe in the spiritualists. That will do. Then Hector Gordon has not made you an offer? No, indeed, Cecile answered, blushing more deeply than before. Nor have I any reason to suppose he has the faintest idea of doing so. Pray do not mention the subject again, dear aunt. I have such a horror of anything at all like husband hunting. As you please, my young lady. It's all very well to ride the high horse, but I think some day, when you find yourself unpleasantly close to your thirtieth birthday and discover some ugly lines under those beautiful hazel eyes of yours— some day when I am dead and gone, and your delicate ivory-white complexion is grown as yellow as an old knife-handle, when you look forward to a dreary life of dependence upon others, or lonely struggles with a hard, pitiless world, I think then, Lady Cecile, you'll be inclined to regret that you were so contemptuously indifferent to Hector Gordon's merits. There, go and put on your bonnet, child. You may marry whom you please, or remain unmarried as long as you please, for all I care about it. And yet I had built quite a castle in the air about you, and I fancied how nice it would be for you and Hector to settle in Hyde Park Gardens, or thereabouts, and for me to live with you. I should like to end my days with my boy, and those second floors in Hyde Park Gardens are very delightful, especially if you are lucky enough to get a corner house. Mrs. McClaverhouse's voice seemed to strike like some sharp instrument into Cecile Chudley's heart as she concluded this tirade. The girl had listened in proud silence and retired silently when her aunt came to a pause. An excursion had been planned for the day, the fly was waiting before the gate, and Cecile heard Hector's step pacing to and fro on the gravel walk below her open window and smelt the perfume of his cigar as she put on her hat. But all the girlish joyousness, which she had been wont to attire herself for such rustic expeditions, had fled from her rest, leaving a heavy dull sense of pain in its stead. I dare say Aunt McClaver House is right, she thought sadly, and I shall feel a dreary, desolate creature when I come to be thirty, and stand all alone in the world. But it is so horrible to hear her talk of good matches, just as if every girl must always be on the alert to entrap a rich husband, when I know, too, that Captain Gordon does not care for me. She paused, and a vivid blush stole over her thoughtful face. Not the crimson glow of indignation, but the warm brightness which reflects the rosket hue of a happy thought. Did he not care for her? That phrase about caring for her is the modest euphemism in which a woman disguises the bold word love. Was he really so indifferent? Her protest to Mrs. McClaverhouse had contained no syllable of untruth or provocation. In all their intercourse, throughout all that cousinly intimacy which had been so sweet a friendship, Hector Gordon had not uttered a word which the vainest or most conscious coquette could construe into a confession of anything warmer than friendship. Ah, yet, 
and yet, and yet, as Owen Meredith says, there had been something, yes, surely something, no spoken word, no license of glance, no daring pressure of a yielding hand, something fifty times less palpable, and yet a hundred times sweeter than any of these, a lowering of the voice, a tender, tremulous tone now and then, a dreamy softness in the dark blue eyes, a silence more eloquent than words, a sudden break in a sentence that had a deeper meaning than a hundred sentences. Poor Auntie, thought Lady Cecile. It was silly of me to be so angry with her, for after all, I think he does care for me a little. Did she think of the contractor's wealth or remember how high above poverty and dependence she would be lifted by a marriage with Hector Gordon? Did any vision of the corner house and Hyde Park Gardens, the noble windows overlooking the woods and waters of Kensington, the elegant equipage and thoroughbred horses arise before her side by side with the image of the young soldier? No, through that most terrible of ordeals, the furnace of genteel poverty, Lady Cecile had passed unseathed. When the remembrance of Hector Gordon's position flashed upon her presently, all her pride rose in arms against her weakness. I would rather die than he should know that I care for him, she thought. He might think me one of those calculating mercenary girls one reads of. Thus it was that when Lady Cecile took her seat in the carriage that day, there was an air of restraint, a cold reserve in her manner, that Hector Gordon had never seen before. He also was changed. He had thrown away his cigar while Cecile was lingering in her own room, and had gone into the little breakfast parlor, where his aunt sat with an unread newspaper in her hand, brooding over her niece's folly. She looked up as Hector entered and began to talk to him. The conversation was a very brief one, and the captain had little share in it, but when he went back to the garden his face was grave and downcast, and when he handed Cecile into the carriage, she was struck by the gloomy preoccupation of his manner. Of all the excursions they had enjoyed together, that excursion was the least agreeable. The September wind was bleak and chilly, penetrating the warmest folds of Mrs. McClaverhouse's Indian shawl and tweaking the end of her aristocratic nose. The brown moorlands and bare stubble fields had a barren look against the cold gray sky, and the captain generally as much au petit son with regard to the two ladies as if he had been the adoring son of the one and the accepted lover of the other sat in a gloomy reverie and seemed to arouse himself by an effort whenever he uttered some commonplace remark upon the weather or the scenery. There was very little conversation during dinner, and Captain Gordon made so poor a pretense of eating that the dowager became positively alarmed and declared that her boy was ill. "'It is no use talking, Hector!' she exclaimed, though her nephew had only made a half-articulate murmur to the effect that there was nothing the matter with him. You eat no fish, and you only helped yourself to a wing of that chicken, and you sent your plate away with that almost untouched. A very extravagant mode of sending your plate away, I should say, if you were a poor man. You've not been yourself all day, Hector, so I shall insist on your being nursed this evening. You won't take any fright, I know, for fruit is bilious. Never mind the dessert today, Moat the widow said, addressing her parlor-maid. "'And be sure the fruit is kept in a cool, dry place till tomorrow,' she added sotto voce, as she cast a sharply scrutinizing glance upon the dishes of grapes and apricots. The widow insisted that her nephew was ill and tired, and as the captain seemed oppressed by a kind of languor which made him quite unequal to offer any opposition to such an energetic person as his aunt, he gave way and suffered himself to be installed in a reclining attitude on the most comfortable sofa with an Indian shawl spread over him like the counterpane of a state bed. "'And now Cecile shall play us both to sleep,' said Mrs. McClaverhouse, sinking into her own chair. The piano was as far away from the sofa as it could be in so small a room, but Cecile heard a faint sigh as she seated herself in the dusk and laid her hands softly on the keys. How many evenings they two had sat side by side in the same dusk, talking in hushed voices. How often she had felt his warm breath amidst her hair as he bent over her while she sang. But today he seemed changed all at once, as he might have changed on the discovery that the woman in whose companionship he had been so unrestrainedly happy was only a scheming coquette after all, and had been spreading an airy net in which to entrap his heart and his fortune. The thought that some chance word of the dowagers might have inspired him with such a thought of her was absolute torture to Cecile Chudley. She felt half inclined to refuse to play or sing for the captain's gratification, 
and yet to do so might be to make a kind of scene which would seem only part of her scheme. So after sitting silently for some minutes, she touched the keys softly, and began a little reverie of Kalkbrenner's, the simplest of melodies, with a flowing movement like the monotonous plashings of waves rising and falling under the keel of a boat, and then she wandered into a very sweet arrangement of that exquisite air of Beethoven's, those evening melodies, a melody which Moore had made more exquisite by words, whose mournful beauty had never been surpassed by any lyric in our language. "'Sing the song, Lady Cecile,' said Hector in a low, pleading voice. "'Let me hear you sing once more.' There was something in his entreating tone, something that seemed like humility, and which reassured Cecile as to his opinion of her. It was not in such a tone that a man would address a woman he had newly learned to despise. If Hector Gordon had been the suppliant of a queen, his accent could have been no more reverential than it was. "'I am in a very melancholy mood tonight, Lady Cecile,' he said, while she paused with her hand strained listlessly over the keys. "'And I have a fancy for pensive music. Please, let me have the song.' "'Do you really wish it?' "'Really and truly.' What common words they were, and yet how thrilling an accent they took tonight upon his lips. Cecile sang the tender melancholy words in a voice that conveyed all their tenderness. She sang that ballad which in the quiet twilight had so sad a cadence, mournful as the dirge of perished hopes and buried loves. If her low, tremulous voice did not break into tears before the end of the song, it was only because in her nervous terror of anything like a scene, she exerted all the force of her will to sustain her tones to the close. She paused when the song was finished, expecting some acknowledgment from Captain Gordon, but the silence of the darkening room was only broken by the slumberous breathing of Mrs. McClaver House. It was a little ungracious of him to utter no word of thanks, Cecile thought, and then she began to wonder about the cause of his melancholy of this evening, and the subject of that moody reverie which had occupied him all day. While she was wondering about this, the servant came into the room bearing a tea tray and a monster moderator lamp that towered like an obelisk in the center of the little table on which the dowager was wont to make tea. That lady was startled from her slumbers by the faint jingling of the teacups and looked about her as sharply as if she had never been asleep at all. "'How quiet you have both been!' she exclaimed rather impatiently. "'I don't enjoy my nap half so much without the drowsy hum of your voices.' What droning thing was that you were singing just now, Cecile? There was no answer. Cecile still bent abstractly over the piano, touching the notes softly now and then, but making no sound. Hector Gordon lay with his face hidden by his folded arms. The fussy dowager darted across the room and swooped down upon her nephew. Hector, she cried. Why, in goodness' name, has been the matter with you all day? Why, bless my soul, what's this? The pillow's wet. You've been crying. Captain Gordon got up from the sofa and laughed pleasantly at his aunt's scared face. It seems very absurd for a man to be nervous or hysterical, he said. But I have not been myself today, and Lady Cecile's song quite upset me. What? That droning thing? exclaimed Mrs. McClaverhouse. It sounded to me like Young's night thoughts set to music. I think I'll wish you good night, Auntie, said the soldier. Cecile wondered whether it was the glare of the moderator lamp that made him look so pale as he bent over his aunt. "'I think you'd better,' answered the dowager, "'and if you're not yourself tonight, I only hope you will be yourself tomorrow. I haven't common patience with such nonsense.' "'Good night, Lady Cecile.' He paused by the piano to say this, but he did not offer Cecile his hand as he had been wont to do at parting, and he left the room without another word." End of chapter 3。Chapter 4 of The Lady's Mile。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Riley McGuire. The Lady's Mile by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter 4 Love and duty. The captain did not appear at the breakfast table next morning, and it was some time after breakfast when he came into the drawing room where Cecil sat alone writing letters. He entered through one of the open windows. 
I have been exploring our favorite hills, Lady Cecil, he said. I hope you did not wait breakfast for me. No, Auntie never waits for anyone. Shall I order fresh tea or coffee to be made for you? No, thanks. I have no appetite for breakfast this morning. Cecil went on writing. I hope you are better today, she said presently, the rapid pen still gliding over the paper, the graceful head still bending over the desk. There is nothing so charming as the air of indifference with which a woman inquires about the health of the man she loves, but the indifference is generally a little overdone. I was not ill yesterday, answered Hector. There are some things more painful to endure than illness. Lady Cecil, will you do me a favor? I want your advice about a friend of mine who finds himself in one of the most cruel positions that ever a man was placed in. Are those letters very important? Not at all important. In that case, I may ask you to put on your hat and come with me for a stroll. You have no idea how lovely the sea looks this morning, and you can give me your advice about my friend. I don't think I've had enough experience of life to be a good advisor. But you are a lady, and you have a lady's subtle instincts where honor is at stake, and this is a case in which experience of life is not wanted. Cecil put aside her writing materials and took her hat from the sofa where it had been lying. They went out together silently and walked silently towards the water's edge. The wavelets curled crisply in the fresh autumn breeze, and the sunlit sea rippled as gaily as if the blue waters had bounded beneath the dancing tread of invisible sea nymphs. I shall think of this cool, fresh English seashore very often when I am in Bengal, Hector said. You will go back to Bengal soon? Yes. I think very soon. My leave does not expire for some months, but as I came home on a doctor's certificate, and as the sea air I got between Calcutta and Suez set me up before I reached home, I have no excuse for remaining away from my regiment much longer. I shall be glad to see all the dear old fellows again. And, and, a man is always happiest when he is doing his duty. You speak as if you knew what it was to be unhappy said Cecil. And yet you must remember telling us, one day when you first came here, that you had never known any serious sorrow in your life. Did I say so? Ah, but then that was so long ago. So long ago? About five weeks, I believe. Five aeons, a lifetime at the very least. I have been reading Tennyson on the hills this morning. What a wonderful poet he is, and how much more wonderful as a philosopher. I scarcely regret my forgotten Greek as I read him. To my mind, he is the greatest teacher and preacher of our age, stern and harsh, bitter and cruel sometimes, but always striking home to the very root of truth with an unerring aim. I grow better and braver and stronger as I read him. He is not an eloquent wailer of his own woes like Byron. Ah, don't think that I underrate Byron because he's out of fashion, for amidst all the birds that ever sang in the bushes of Parnassus, there's no note so sweet as his to my ear. And yet, Alfred Tennyson has set the stamp of his own suffering on every page of his poetry. Don't talk to me about inner consciousness or mental imitation. A man must have suffered before he could write Locksley Hall. A man must have been tempted and must have triumphed before he could write Love and Duty. Do you know the poem, Lady Cecil? It is only two or three pages of blank verse, but I've read it half a dozen times this morning, and it seems to me as true as if it had been written with the heart's blood of a brave man. Shall I read it to you? If you please. Upon that solitary coast they had no fear of interruption. On one side of them lay stubble fields and low flat meadows, where the cattle stood to watch them as they passed. On the other, the cool gray sea. The autumn sunshine had faded a little, and there were clouds gathering on the horizon, clouds that Hector and Cecil were too preoccupied to observe. The faint hum of the village died away behind them as they strolled slowly onward. In a desert they could scarcely have been less restrained, by any fear of interruption. Hector Gordon read the poem in a low, earnest voice. 
in tones whose deep feeling was entirely free from exaggeration. He read very slowly when he came to the last paragraph of the fragment. Should my shadow cross thy thoughts, too sadly for their peace, remand it thou for calmer hours to memory's darkest hold, if not to be forgotten, not at once, not all forgotten. He closed the book abruptly with these words, and for some minutes walked on in silence. This time it was Cecil who was ungracious, since she did not thank her companion for reading the poem. And now, Lady Cecil, I will tell you my friend's story, said Captain Gordon presently. It is a common story enough, perhaps, for I suppose there are few lives in which there does not arise the necessity for some great sacrifice. He paused once more, and then began again with an evident effort. As my life for the last few years has been spent in India among my brother officers, I need scarcely tell you that the man of whom I speak is an officer. He is, like myself, the son of a rich man, and his military career has been unusually successful. When he joined his regiment, he was one of the most thoughtless and impulsive fellows in the universe. He had been spoiled by indulgent friends, and had never in his life had occasion to think for himself. You may bring up a lad in a garden of roses to be a very well-mannered, agreeable fellow, I dare say, but I doubt if the rose garden education will ever make a great or a wise man. That sort of animal must be reared upon the moorlands, amidst the free winds of heaven. As my friend was thoughtless and impulsive, it was scarcely strange that when he found himself so idle as to want amusement, he should join in the first tiger hunt that took place in his neighborhood, nor was it strange that he should contrive to get seriously wounded by the animal. The wonder was that he escaped alive. He owed the life which his own reckless folly had hazarded to the cool daring of a friend and comrade, and when he woke from the swoon into which he had fallen immediately after feeling the tiger's claws planted in his thigh, he found himself in the coolest and shadiest room of his friend's house in Calcutta. He still felt the tiger's claws, but it was pleasant to know that the sensation was only imaginary, and that the animal had been shot through the head by the brave young civilian, for his friend was a civilian and a resident in Calcutta. He had just enough sense to murmur some inarticulate expression of gratitude, just enough strength to grasp his preserver's honest hand, and then he grew delirious from the pain of his wounds, and then he had fever, and altogether a very hard time of it. I think you can guess what is coming now, Lady Cecil. In all the history of the world, there never surely was the record of man's sorrow or sickness that was not linked with the story of woman's devotion. When my friend was well enough to know what tender nursing was, he knew that the hands which had administered his medicine and smoothed his pillow from the first hour of his delirium belonged to the civilian's sister, a girl whom he had known only as the best waltzer in Calcutta, but whom he had reason to know now as an angel of pity and tenderness. Her attendance upon him was as quiet and unobtrusive as it was watchful and untiring, and on the day on which his medical attendants pronounced him out of danger, she left his room, after a few half-tearful words of congratulation, never to enter it again. But she'd watched by him long enough to give him ample time for watching her, and he fancied that he had reason to believe he was beloved for the first time in his life. When he was well enough to leave his room, he found that she had left Calcutta for a visit to some friends at Simla. She wanted change of air, her brother said, and it might be some months before she would return. My friend's impulsive nature would not suffer him to wait so long. How base a scoundrel he must have been if his heart had not overflowed with gratitude to the friend who had saved his life, the tender-hearted girl who had watched him in his danger. You will not wonder when I tell you that his first impulse was to ask his friend to become his brother, his gentle nurse to take the sacred name of wife. What return could he offer for so much devotion except the devotion of his own life? And his heart was so free, Lady Cecil, that he offered it as freely as if it had been a handful of gold which he had no need of. The civilian acted nobly, declining to accept any pledge in his sister's name. I say nobly because the soldier was a richer man by twenty times than his friend, 
and had been the first prize in the Anglo-Indian matrimonial market. The soldier waited only till he was strong enough to bear the jolting of a palanquin before he went to Simla. He found his nurse looking pale and anxious, little improved by change of air or scene. He came upon her unexpectedly, and the one look which he saw on her face as she recognized him assured him that he had not made the senseless blunder of a coxcomb when he had fancied himself beloved. He stayed in the hill country for a fortnight, and he went back to his regiment, the promised husband of as pure and true-hearted a woman as ever lived. I bear tribute to her goodness, Lady Cecil, standing by your side, here upon this English shore, so many hundred miles away. God bless her. He lifted his hat as he pronounced the blessing, and looking at him with sad, earnest eyes, Cecil saw that his were dim with tears. Oh, Cecil, Cecil, he said, I haven't finished my story yet. Can you guess what happened when the soldier came home and chance threw him into intimate association with another woman? Unhappily, it is such an old story. Ah, then, and then only, his heart throbbed into sudden life. Ah, then, only he found how wide a difference there is between a grateful impulse of the mind and an absorbing passion of the heart. Careless and inconsiderate in all things, he abandoned himself to the charm of an association whose peril he never calculated, and he awoke one day like a man who had been dreaming pleasant dreams upon the edge of a precipice to discover his danger. I cannot tell you how bitter that awakening was. There is an old Greek fancy, too foolish for me to tell you, which explains a perfect love as the reunion of two beings who at first were one, but who, separated by an angry deity, have wandered blindly through the universe in search of one another. But sometimes it happens, Lady Cecil, that the half-soul finds its other half too late. I've told you my friend's story. How dearly he loves the lady it was his sorrow to know and love too late. I can find no words to tell you. He is a soldier, and he calls himself a man of honor. But he is so weak and helpless in his misery that he has need of counsel from a mind less troubled than his own. He is willing to do his duty if he can be told wherein his duty lies. Should he write to his betrothed and confess the truth, trusting in her generosity to set him free? I am sure she would do so. There was a brief pause before Cecil said, I am sure of it too, though I do not know her. But do you think she would ever be happy again? I cannot answer for that. Ah, Lady Cecil, I know what you think my friend's duty is. There can be no question about it. He must keep his promise, she answered firmly. Even if in so doing he forfeits the happiness of his future life, if in so doing he ties himself forever and ever to the dull wheel of duty, even if he dares to think that his love is not altogether unreturned by her he loves so truly and so hopelessly, Oh, Cecil, be merciful. Remember it is the fate of a lifetime you are deciding. I cannot advise your friend to be false to his word, replied Cecil. I am sorry for his sorrow, but it is a noble thing to do one's duty. I think he will be happier in the end if he keeps his promise. She looked up at him with a bright, brave glance as she spoke. Their eyes met and her face changed, in spite of the heroic effort she made to preserve its exalted tranquility. They stood alone on the narrow sands, with a mournful wind moaning past them, a drizzling rain drifting in their faces, as unconscious of any change in the weather as they were unconscious of all things in the universe, except each other. I'm going back to London by the mail tonight, Lady Cecil. We shall be together for the rest of the day, I hope, my last day but we are not likely to be alone again, and I should like to say goodbye to you here. He lifted his hat, and the wind and rain drifted his hair away from his face. Cecil, I'm going back to India to do my duty, with God's help. Say, God bless you, Hector, and goodbye. God bless you, Hector, and... She looked up at the perfect face, the dark blue eyes, so dim with tears, and could not finish the sentence. 
she turned from her companion with a passionate gesture, ashamed of her own weakness, and walked homewards rapidly, with Hector walking silently by her side. They did not speak until they came to the idle boats, lying keel upwards on the beach, which marked the beginning of the village, and then Captain Gordon broke the silence by a remark, which proved that he had only that moment discovered the change in the weather. If you'll stop under shelter of that yacht, Lady Cecil, he said, I'll run on and get a shawl and umbrella. Thank you. No, on no account. I don't mind the rain, and we are so near home, answered Cecil, whose flimsy muslin garments were dripping wet. End of chapter 4「He left Fortinbras by the evening train, in despite of his aunt's lamentations, and in despite of something which pierced his heart more cruelly than the lamentations of all the fussy dowagers in Christendom. The still white look of sorrowful resignation in Cecil Chudley's face. She loved him. He knew the truth and depth of her affection as well as he knew the truth and depth of his own love would be a poor divinity indeed if as some counterbalance to his physical blindness he were not gifted with the power of second sight hector needed no word from cecil to tell him how much he resigned in doing his duty the hour that had revealed to him the secret of his own heart had laid bare the mystery of hers that subtle sympathy which had seemed so sweet a friendship had been only love in disguise the wolf in sheep's clothing the serpent in the semblance of a dove ah what utter despair possessed those two sad hearts on that chill september afternoon what a cold dreary future lay before those two helpless wanderers doomed to bid each other farewell the day might come as it comes so often in the story of a lifetime when to look back upon all this trouble and anguish would be to look back upon something as flimsy as a dream but then what is more terrible than the agony of a dream ay even though in the sleeper's breast there lurk a vague consciousness that he is only the fool of a vision brooding over his hopeless sorrow as the express world londonwards through the darkness hector gordon thought of the stories of unhappy attachments and wasted devotion which he had heard told by his seniors over the mess-table when the wine went round silently in the summer dusk and men whose faces were in shadow talked more freely than was their wont in the broad glare of day shall i ever come to tell the story of my sorrow to my brother officers in the gloaming will the memory of to-night ever be a subject for friendly talk after a ponderous dinner while the sentry's tramp echoes in the stillness and the odour of cigar smoke floats in from the balcony where the youngsters are lounging will they ever call me a dreary old bore and try to change the subject when they find the conversation drifting round to my dismal love story ah how sad to be old and a nuisance and to have profaned the sanctity of my idol's temple how sad to be old hector thought of the dull life of duty the joyless sunless desert waste that lay between him and the time when he might begin to care for comet port and dilate with an elderly dandy's fatuity on the tender story of his youth he thought of his future until he began to fancy how blessed a thing it would be if his life could end that night in the chill darkness the engine had but to swerve a hair's breadth as it flew along the top of a steep embankment and lo the end of all his sorrows a crash a sudden agony perhaps unimaginable in its infinity of pain but brief as summer lightning and the enigma of his existence would be solved the troublesome thread of his life dissevered my poor mary 
would be sorry for me he thought remembering the gentle betrothed waiting for him in india but she would fancy that i had died adoring her and in a twelvemonth the memory of me would be a painless sorrow shall i make her happy by doing my duty i have seen ruined men whose ruin began on the day in which they sacrificed feeling on the shrine of honour my cecil my cecil how could you be so cruel as to drive me away from you the image of the pale sorrowful face that had looked at him with such heroic calmness in the moment of parting arose before him now like a reproach he knew that she had been right he knew that her voice had been the voice of truth and honour the voice of his own conscience god help me to be worthy of the love that never can be mine and of the gentle darling i am bound to shelter he thought and then a spirit of resignation seemed to exorcise the demon despair and he took from his pocket-book a letter written on foreign paper a letter in a pretty womanly hand not too easy to decipher a letter from his betrothed wife which he had read hurriedly the day before too cruelly preoccupied to know what he was reading the tender trusting words were the most bitter reproaches that could assail him his heart melted as he read the long loving epistle by the uncertain light of the railway lamp he could hear the voice as he deciphered those simple girlish sentences he could see her face not beautiful but very sweet and loving he was quite alone in the carriage and when he had replaced the letter in his pocket-book he detached a little trinket which hung to his watch-chain and pressed the crystal face of it to his lips under the crystal there was a lock of pale flaxen hair which his own hands had selected for the shears the day he parted from his love at simla poor mary he murmured softly poor mary it will be something at least to make you happy the dowager took her nephew's departure very deeply to heart or it may be rather that she had set her heart on a suite of spacious apartments in tyburnia and was by no means disposed to return to dorset square she questioned cecil very sharply about hector's proceedings and succeeded in driving that young lady into a conversational corner whence it was impossible to emerge without a revelation of the truth you tell me you think he's engaged said the dowager impatiently after forcing cecil to admit so much and why do you think he's engaged did he tell you so he gave me to understand as much and engaged to whom pray a young lady in india a young lady in india is that all you know about her yes indeed auntie a nice designing thing i dare say and a nobody into the bargain or of course he'd have told you who she was cried mrs mcclaverhouse indignantly a stuck-up creature who will contrive to keep her husband at a distance from his relations no doubt in order that she may surround him with a pack of harpies of her own kith and kin and to think that my boy should never have so much as asked my advice before he threw himself away if you knew how i have built upon you and hector making a match of it cecil you'd sympathize with my disappointment a little instead of sitting looking at me in that provokingly placid way of yours i could have ended my days happily under hector's roof i hoped he would have been glad to give his poor old aunt a home and i don't think you'd have refused me a shelter in my old age eh cecil oh auntie auntie mrs mcclaver house had no need to complain of want of sympathy this time for cecil suddenly fell upon her knees and buried her face in her aunt's ample silken skirts sobbing passionately the thought of what might have been was so very bitter and every word the dowager uttered sent the arrow deeper into the wounded heart oh auntie she cried never speak to me about him again oh pray pray do not speak of him again i love him so dearly so dearly so dearly it was the first and last passionate cry of cecil chudley's heart and it quite melted the dowager but there was a touch of sternness mingled with her emotion i hope that designing minx will live to repent her artfulness she said spitefully for it is the peculiar attribute of a woman to empty the vows of her wrath on the passive and unconscious maiden for whose sake her plans have been frustrated rather than on the active masculine offender who has frustrated them the dowager and her niece went back to dorset square very soon after hector's departure and then came visits to country houses 
a fortnight in leicestershire where poor cecil had to endure the hunting talk of horsey men and fast young ladies the perpetual discussions about dogs and horses and southerly winds and cloudy skies a month in an old yorkshire grange where there was a cheerful christmas gathering and where lady cecil had to act in charades and take part in duets the dear old duets in which his melodious baritone had been so delicious she looked round sometimes when she was singing and almost expected to see his ghost standing behind her so cruel a profanation did it seem to sing the old familiar words in all the morning gossip and billiard playing and fancy work the reading aloud often from the very books which he had read at fortinbras in all the music and dancing the impromptu charades and carefully studied tableau vivant which enlivened the winter evenings cecil had to take her part with a smiling face she wondered sometimes whether there were any other bright smiles which were only masks assumed for the evening with the evening dress she wondered whether there was any other woman in all the crowd who saw athwart the lights and exotics of the dinner-table the vision of one dear face whose reality was thousands of miles away he may be lying dead while i sit simpering here she thought yet that would be too dreadful oh surely surely i should know it if he were dead bravely though she bore her burden it was a very heavy one no mother pining in the absence of her only son could have felt more poignant anxiety about the absent one than cecil felt for the man who had loved her and left her to marry another woman how often ah how often amidst the hum of joyous voices and the brilliant tones of a piano vibrating under masterly hands how often the lamplight faded and the faces of the crowd melted away and the gorgeous drawing-room changed itself into that weedy shore at the foot of a grim fort and brass castle while the autumn rain drifted once more into cecil chudley's face and his eyes looked down upon her dim with tears of all their gay and happy hours their pleasant ramble cecil recalled no picture so vivid as that of her lover in his sorrow standing bareheaded in the drifting rain looking tenderly down upon her with fond despairing eyes and he was gone from her for ever never 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 so long as she lived was she to look upon his face again but she endured her life and by and by when cold gleams of february sunshine lighted the grey sky the dowager carried her niece back to dorset square and all the old sordid wearisome care about forks spoons and broken wine glasses and incorrect butcher's bills began again but even broken wine glasses may be a distraction and a young lady who has tradesmen's books and the contents of china closets to employ her mind suffers less than the damsel who has nothing to do but to sit by her casement watching the slow changes of the heavens and thinking of the absent one industrious charlotte cutting bread and butter for the little ones is not so apt to fall in love with verte as he is to be inspired by a fatal passion for her since paltry and sordid a task as charlotte's may be it yet requires some thought or the lady will cut her fingers a little wholesome household work would have saved poor elaine from many of those long hours of brooding in which the lily made of astolat contemplated the dark knight's image work the primeval curse may have been a blessing in disguise after all lady cecil bore her life she went hither and thither to places in which she felt little interest amongst people whose companionship seemed so poor a substitute for that brief sweet friendship of the departed autumn ah what could ever bring back to her heart the thrilling joy of that broken dream yet her life was not altogether joyless it was only the magical mystical gladness the delight too deep for words which had gone out of her existence for ever in the hour of that irrevocable parting on the wet seashore she had friends and companions a social status in right of her father's name and race even amongst the vulgar who knew that she was only a penniless dependent upon the sharp-spoken dowager perhaps the friend with whom cecil chudley's proud reserve was most often wont to melt into tender sympathy was florence crawford the frivolous divinity at whose shrine the young landscape painter had laid his heart and his ambition they had met in society as flo said with a little air which implied that the only society in the civilized world was the circle wherein miss crawford revolved and they had taken a fancy to each other according to florence though it must be confessed the fancy had been chiefly on her own side as cecil was not prone to sudden friendships but 
there was some one else took a fancy to you before i did exclaimed flo there's not the least occasion to blush lady cecil for the some one else was only a middle-aged man with such a shelf on his dear old back that i sometimes quite long to set a row of carl theodore teacups on his coat collar for ornamentation it was papa who took a fancy to you he's the most absurd old thing in the world and he says yours is the very face he has been waiting for for his new picture he is going to paint the prison scene in faust and he declares that you have the exact expression he wants for his gretchen you have no idea what trouble he will take to get a sitting from any one whose face has fascinated him professional models are all very well but you can't get a professional model to read goethe or to imagine that she sees an infant struggling in the water for a shilling an hour what papa wants is expression and he was struck by your face the other night when you were singing at lady jacinth's there was an exalted look about your eyes and forehead he said which would be worth a fortune to him so i am to exert all my fascinations in order to induce you to give him a sitting or two and i'm sure you will won't you lady cecil for he really is a dear good creature cecil assented very readily flattered and honoured by the painter's request she was a far more reverent disciple of art than florence crawford who spoke flippantly of the greatest master of his age as a dear old thing and was wont to frisk hither and thither in her father's painting-room criticising his pictures as freely as if they had been so many parisian bonnets it would have been very strange if cecil had not been glad to exchange the sordid atmosphere of dorset square for the dreamy splendour of the fountains the hour or two which mr crawford had entreated in the first place grew into many hours and cecil had spent half a dozen pleasant mornings in the great master's painting-room before the vague shadow which was so unintelligible to common eyes grew out of the canvas and became a woman instinct with life and soul flo brought her box of water-colours on these occasions and perched herself at a little table in a corner of the spacious chamber for she made a faint show of devotion to art now and then as an excuse for intruding into the painter's sanctum what place of retreat could be sacred from an only daughter and such an only daughter as florence crawford so the young lady came very often to the noble tapestried painting-room into which half the contents of mr woodgate's shop seemed to have been imported so rich was the gorgeous chamber and black oak cabinets and stamped leather cushioned chairs coloured marbles a mediaeval armour majolica vases and venetian glass the painter loved beautiful things and spent his money as recklessly as aladdin or alexandre dumas for how was it possible that a man could be careful of vulgar pounds and shillings under whose magic working hand human grandeur and human beauty developed into being who knew but two rivals rubens and nature and who could afford to stand comparison with the first william crawford was a painter in the highest and grandest sense of the word and he wasted his money and sold his pictures for a song when the whim seized him and scattered little water-colour bits in the scrap-books of beautiful high-born feminine mendicants which collected together would have realised a small fortune at christie's it was only when judicious friends with business habits stepped in and insisted upon negotiating affairs for the great painter that mr crawford received large prices for his pictures and found a satisfactory row of pencil figures under the last pen and ink entry in his banking-book the story of the painter's youth and manhood was not without a touch of sadness it was the old old story of a brilliant career and a broken life william crawford had not sprung into fame's ample lap with one daring bound his progress had been slow and laborious and there had been a few silver threads mingled with his auburn hair before the laurel crown descended on his forehead or the nimbus of glory made a light about his earnest face he had seen other men pass him by his companions of the academy the students who had sat by his side he had seen them go by him to take their places amongst the victors great men in their way most of them but how weak and puny was the greatest compared to him he had so much to endure and he bore it all so meekly so patient was he in the sublime resignation of conscious genius which knows that it must triumph 
that he grew by and by to be set down as a dull plodding fellow who would never do anything worth looking at year after year year after year his pictures came back upon him from the academy from the british institution rejected 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 yet he was william crawford all the time and knew himself and the sovereign power of his hand meek and mighty spirit to wait so long to labour so patiently hoarding thy strength and adding to thy power day by day as a miser swells his pile of vulgar gold the day came at last but not all at once pictures were accepted and skied critics talked about coldness and blackness and chalkiness friends were compassionate and shoulders were shrugged with polite despair the poor man had really no idea of colour for a few years things went on like this and then appeared a gorgeous rubens like canvas whereon pericles reclined at the feet of aspasia and in a day in an hour the mighty master of all the secrets of colour revealed himself and the world knew that william crawford was a great painter after that day the men who had called crawford a dull plodding fellow offered him monstrous bribes for the revelation of his secret he smiled at their ignorance he had no secret except his genius his mystic cabala lay in the two virtues that had made the law of his life unremitting industry undeviating temperance in the chill early light of morning in the warm glow of noon in the deepening shadows of evening in the artificial light of the night school at the academy william crawford had toiled for twenty years finding no drudgery too hard no monotonous repetition of study too wearisome and now at eight and thirty he found himself a great man and he knew that his hand was to be trusted and that his feet were surely planted on the mountain he had climbed so patiently alas there are so many blessings in this life that come too late many a vessel laden with the gold of ophir only nears the shore when her owner lies dead upon the sands when william crawford tasted the first fruits of success the wife to have purchased whose happiness he would have sold his heart's blood had been dead ten years she had felt the cruel hand of poverty and had withered under that bitter grip but she had never complained she had borne all meekly for his sake for his sake now when people offered him large prices for his pictures he felt half inclined to refuse their commissions in utter bitterness of heart you should have bought my pyramus and thisbe twelve years ago he would have cried a fifty-pound cheque would have done that for me then which all the kings and princes of this earth could not do now it would have brought a smile to the face of my wife the young wife whose death had left such a terrible void in the painter's heart had been of higher rank than himself and had run away from a luxurious home to inhabit draughty second-floor lodgings in a street running out of the strand william crawford had trusted in the strength of his hand to win a better home for his darling but the blackest years of his life were those that immediately succeeded his marriage and the poor loving girl had to suffer deprivations that were unfelt by the spartan painter but which fell heavily on the home-bred damsel who had sacrificed so much for him she would have held the loss of position a very light one but she found that she had lost all her home friends as well for her father shut his door upon her after her marriage and she had no mother to plead for her at home or to visit her by stealth in her husband's shabby dwelling the father was a hard obstinate man who plucked his daughter's image out of his heart as coolly as he erased her name from his will he begged that mrs crawford might never be mentioned in his presence and he threatened to horsewhip the painter in the rooms of the royal academy if ever he met him there whether he relented suddenly when the young wife died or whether his conscience had given him some uneasiness from the beginning no one ever knew but he wrote a civil letter to the widower declaring his willingness to adopt and educate the little girl his daughter had left behind her there was some hesitation a little parley as to how often the father should be permitted to see his child a very manly letter from the painter setting forth the condition on which he was willing to part with the little girl that condition being neither more nor less than an understanding that she was his child and his only 
committed as a sacred trust to her mother's family and to be claimed by him at any hour he pleased and then he let his little florence go a year later he would as soon have plucked the heart out of his breast as he would have parted from her but at this time he was utterly broken down in body and mind so crushed so desolate that it seemed as if nothing could add to his desolation he was even glad to get rid of the child the sound of her young voice saddened him there were tones in it that were like her mother's i sat in my room and painted he said afterwards when he was able to talk of this dreadful time but i didn't know what i was painting or whether it was winter or summer people would come in and sit down and talk to me they came to cheer me up a little they said i talked to them and answered them and when they went away i didn't know who they were or what they had been talking about as for my work the right colours came to my brush somehow but when the faces looked out at me from my canvas i used to wonder who had painted them and what they meant i don't know how long that time lasted i only know that the best and dearest friend i ever had took me across the channel with him and on to italy and one morning after landing at some place from a steamer in the darkness i opened my window and saw the bay of naples before me i burst into tears for the first time since my wife's death and after that i learnt to bear my sorrow patiently when william crawford found himself a successful man he built himself a house at kensington from a design of his own after stating which latter fact it is quite unnecessary to say that the italian facade was perfection that the alhambra like colonnade at the back was delicious that there was a great deal of space wasted in unnecessary passages and that there was neither a housemaid's closet nor a dustbin in the original plan of the mansion but then what a charming spot was that on which mr crawford planted his temple for he was far too wise a man to erect his dwelling on one of those patches of arid waste which are called desirable building ground he had discovered an inconvenient old house in a delicious garden between the old court suburb and tyburnia and had carted away the rambling low-roof dwelling and set up his dazzling white temple in its stead the crowning glory of the place was a pair of marble fountains which the painter had brought from rome fountains whose silver waters had made harmonious accompaniment to the voices of revellers in tivoli fifteen hundred years ago it was to this pleasant home that william crawford brought his beautiful daughter from the fashionable boarding-school in which she had received her education her grandfather had died leaving her the five thousand pounds that had once been allotted to her mother her aunts and uncles were scattered and not one of them had been able to obtain any lasting hold upon the impulsive little heart which beat in miss crawford's breast she came to the fountains at her father's bidding and her pretty caressing ways were very pleasant to him but she did not fill the void in his heart he looked in her face very sadly sometimes for it recalled the vision of another face with a tender loving light in the eyes which was wanting in flo's flashing glances she was such a frivolous creature compared with her mother the difference between them was as wide as the contrast between the tender cooing dove which nestles in your bosom and a beautiful butterfly that flits and skims hither and thither in the sunshine miss crawford was fond of her father and proud of him after a fashion but she had no power to appreciate the sublimity of his art the grandeur of his triumphs she admired him and was pleased with his success because it had given him wealth and fashion alone in a desert that other one would have rejoiced with him in the glory of his work however unprofitable however remote from the possibility of reward because it was his and because he loved it there were times when flo's frivolous criticisms jarred on the painter's ear for there were tones in her voice which even yet reminded him too painfully of the lost one he was an overindulgent father said people who estimated a father's indulgence by the amount of a daughter's pocket money but it may be that he would have been less indulgent if he had loved his child better or rather if she had been able to reach that inner sanctuary of his soul where the image of the dead reigned alone lady cecil felt a thrill of delight when the painter turned his easel and revealed his finished picture ah wonderful power given to a man in such fullness as it had been given to william crawford once in two hundred years rarest of all earthly gifts the masterdom of colour the power which makes the painter's hand second only to the hand of the creator who bade eve come forth out of the shadow of night and reveal to awakening adam 
the perfection of womanly loveliness in the prison scene the painter had full scope for his wondrous power of colour the light in the picture was subdued only through the open door of poor gretchen's cell one saw a lurid glimmer of the coming day in this open doorway lounged mephistopheles with a horrible smile upon his face and his figure darkly defined against that low lurid glimmer the light of the prison lamp shone full on the faces of the lovers and the sickly yellow light made a kind of aureola around gretchen's golden head while cecil stood before the picture in rapt admiration miss crawford laid down her brushes and came to look at her father's labour the painter lounged against the wall opposite his easel gazing dreamily at his completed work o oh, butterflies of fashion driving male phaetons or tooling teams of four in hand in the ladies mile sybarites and loiterers in pleasant drawing-rooms loungers in clubs and triflers with existence lotus-eaters of every species have any of you ever known a joy so deep as this the joy that drove pygmalion mad the intoxicating triumph of the creator who sees his work complete in all its beauty and perfection hum yes it's very pretty said flo after contemplating the picture under the shadow of two pretty jewel twinkling hands arched over her piquant eyebrows but isn't gretchen's arm a leetle out of drawing i'm sure i could never get my arm into that position but i dare say people's arms were more flexible in those days how awfully blue you've made mephistopheles but i'm very glad you haven't allowed him to cross his legs why a diabolical person should always cross his legs is a mystery that i have never been able to fathom it's very nice papa but i don't like it so well as pericles and aspasia your proclivities are classic you dear old thing so you'd better stick to your lamprière and let us have rosy gods and goddesses ad infinitum ad nauseum perhaps said the painter sadly the critics had been very hard upon william crawford and there had been people besotted enough to utter the shameful word sensualism in connection with the purest and simplest creature who ever worshipped the divinity of beauty and then there were all the host of funny little writers who wrote facetious little criticisms upon the great man's pictures his cupid had the mumps his psyche was in the last stage of scarlet fever his alcibiades was a butcher's boy his tamandra a scorbutic shrew his bodicea a prize-fighter disguised in female raiment the funny little writers who could not have sketched the outline of a pump-handle correctly had fine fun out of william crawford he was happy in spite of all adverse criticism and had succeeded in spite of his critics of course there were some who knew what they were writing about and to such adverse opinion as he felt to be just william crawford bowed his head meekly not too proud to believe that he could have done better if he had taken more pains who could be more acutely conscious than he was of his shortcomings whose eyes were keener than his to perceive the weak spots in his work there is no finer tonic for the true worker than adverse criticism the friend's lavish praise may enervate the foe's hardest usage braces and fortifies guy patin in a criticism on sir thomas brown which in the christian benevolence of its tone is not altogether unlike some criticism of the nineteenth century regrets that the man is alive because he may grow worse how completely the slashing critics of the present day seem to forget that so long as the man is alive it is possible for him to grow better william crawford was very happy in the painting-room where the greater part of his life was spent what man can be so happy as the triumphant artist convinced of the innocence and purity of his triumphs assured of being remembered when all other labourers are forgotten knowing that his glory will be revealed to posterity by no musty records written by a stranger but by his own handiwork instinct with his own soul revealing himself in a language that needs no translation and is almost as familiar to the savage as to the savant so nearly does it copy nature florence thought it a very hard thing that her father would not take her to perpetual parties and grumbled sorely at being sent under convoy of any grumpy old chaperone who might be available but on this matter the painter very rarely gave way do you know how long art is as compared to a man's life he asked can you guess what raphael might have been if he had lived to be as old as titian 
if there is any special strength in my hand flow it is because in twenty years i have worked as hard as most men work in forty when i paid fifteen shillings a week for my lodgings my landlord grumbled because i kept my fire in all night in order that i might be at work before daybreak i don't make any merit of having worked hard you know my dear i've worked because my work pleased me and you would never believe how little i ever thought of the fame or money that success would bring me i don't think your real artist ever sets much value upon the price of his labour he may want money as much as any other man and of course he is glad to get it but it is the triumph of his art that he rejoices in rather than any personal success the creation of his work is in itself happiness and would be though his picture were foredoomed to melt and vanish under his hand at the moment of its completion i would answer for it that michelangelo enjoyed modelling his statue of snow quite as much as if he had been putting the finishing touches of his chisel to the fairest marble that ever grew into life under the craftsman's hand to receive a soul from the last touch of the master don't worry me about parties flo i will pay as many milliners bills as you like and i'll paint you in all your prettiest dresses and your most bewitching attitudes and give you the price of your beauty for pocket money but i won't go to be crushed to death upon staircases or martyred in the act of fetching an ice i won't go to people who only want to see what the painter of aspasia is like as if i must needs be like something different from my fellow-men and who will think me an insignificant-looking fellow with very little to say for myself what should i have to say to people who don't know the a b c of the language to the study of which i have given my life so flo was obliged to be satisfied and was fain to go into society under the wing of benevolent matrons who had no daughters of their own to be crushed by miss crawford's beauty flo had her maid and her carriage and was quite a little woman of fashion while the painter lived his own life opening his doors every sunday evening to all who cared to visit him and generally hiding himself in some snug little corner of his spacious drawing-rooms amongst the friends of his soul while fashionable visitors who had been received with perfect aplomb by florence prowled about in search of him and stared at the wrong man through gold-rimmed eye-glasses or pronounced adverse criticisms upon his own pictures under his very nose of course florence crawford was perfectly aware that her father's protege the landscape painter was desperately in love with her we live in a fast-going century and though flo was only eighteen she was fully versed in the diagnostics of a hopeless passion of which she was the object she knew poor philip's weakness and laughed undisguisedly at his folly she was a very dashing young person and she declared herself to be an utterly heartless young person whenever she became expansive and confidential whether the heartlessness were real or affected was an enigma which no one had yet been able to solve whatever were the follies of the age flo went with them at full gallop she talked slang and affected a masculine contempt for all feminine pursuits had been heard to ask what bodkins were meant for and whether shirt buttons were fastened on their foundations with glue she had a tiny tiny morocco volume lined with satin and emblazoned with gold and obnoxious with patchouli a volume that was called a betting book and which had about the same relation to the greasy volumes kept by the bookmen who gather on the waste ground in victoria road or meet one another furtively at the corner of farrington street as a rosebud has to a red cabbage dozens of jarvins or danse six and a quarter gloves were the principal entries in this mystic volume but flo had been known to obtain an actual tip from some aristocratic member of the jockey club by whose friendly agency real money had been wagered and won she was very fast and had once been seen under the marble colonnade at the fountains puffing daintily at a coquettish little cigarette but it is only fair to add that the daring exploit resulted in deadly pallor and unpleasant faintness and that the experiment was not repeated she had her horse and her own groom a steady old fellow who helped in the garden and of whose boots and costume poor flo was inclined to be rather ashamed when she met her stylish friends in the row did she ever pause to think that her life was useless and extravagant and unwomanly well no not yet she was only eighteen remember the age when a woman has not quite ceased to be a kind of refinement upon a kitten beautiful graceful capricious mischievous treacherous she was at an age when a woman is apt to take pleasure in treading on masculine hearts and if remonstrated with upon her cruelty would be quite inclined to echo the question of the poetess and cry why should a heart have been there in the way of a fair woman's foot flo insisted on making a, a confidant of cecil i'm the most mercenary of creatures you know dear she said 
and i made up my mind ever so long ago that i would marry for money and nothing but money all the nicest girls marry for money nowadays and live happy ever afterwards i dare say there was a time when it was quite nice to be poor and live in a cottage with the husband of one's choice what a musty old minerva press phrase that is cried flo with a grimace the husband of one's choice but that was in the days when women wore cottage bonnets with a bit of ribbon across the crown or hideous gypsy hats tied down with handkerchiefs and white muslin dresses with a breadth and a half in the skirt and when a woman on horseback was a show to be followed by street boys i suppose lady Godavia and queen elizabeth were the only women who ever did ride in the middle ages nos avons change tout cela a woman in the present day must have three or four hundred a year for pin money if she is not to be a disgrace to her sex in the way of gloves and bonnets and she must ride a three hundred guinea hack if she wants to escape being trampled upon by her dearest friends and she will find herself a perfect outcast unless she has a box and a good position at one of the opera houses and she must go in for dogs and china not vulgar modern dresden abominations in the way of simpering shepherdesses and creatures in hoops drinking chocolate or playing chess but old vienna or chelsea with the gold anchor or deliciously ugly wedgwood or soft paste in short my dear cecil a woman nowadays is a very expensive creature and love in a cottage is an impossibility why there are no cottages for the poor lovers the tiniest tiniest villa on the banks of the thames costs about two hundred a year and if the poverty-stricken creatures who marry for love want a house they must go to some horrible place beyond the seven sisters road and be happy amongst a wilderness of brickfields and railway arches lady cecil had seen florence and philip together and had taken it into her head that they loved each other her own sorrowful love-story had made her very tenderly disposed towards youthful lovers and she had ventured to remonstrate with florence one reads about cruel parents and heart-broken damsels but i don't think your papa would set his face against mr foley so sternly as you set yours flory she said he was talking of that young painter the other day and he told me that your friend philip has a great career before him if he works patiently yes and when he is as old as papa he will be able to earn two or three thousand a year i suppose exclaimed miss crawford do you think that is a brilliant prospect for a girl who cannot live out of society people with anything under five thousand a year are paupers in society do you know what it is that is bearing down upon us and crushing us all cecil like an avalanche of gold it is the wealth of the commercial plutocracy the triumphant monster commerce is devouring us all ask papa who buys his pictures ask where the gems from christie's go when the great auctions are over ask why diamonds are worth twice as much to-day as they were twenty years ago it is all because the princes of trade have taken possession of our land cecil and nowadays a girl must set her cap in the direction of manchester if she wishes to marry well florence i can't bear to hear you talk like this i am a woman of the world dear and i mean to do the best i can for myself it is very dreadful i know but at least i am candid with you i went to a fashionable school and you've no idea how we all worshipped wealth and finery papa used to come and see me in horrid old handsome cabs that jingled and rattled as if they would have fallen to pieces when he stepped out of them but some girls had fathers and mothers who came in two hundred guinea barouches and oh what a gulf there was between us and then again poor mamma's people live in russell square and there were girls at that school who made me feel that it was a kind of disgrace to have friends in russell square and when i spent the holidays with my uncles and aunts i used to have mamma's foolish marriage dinned into my ears and though i always took her part and declared that it was better to marry papa than to marry a prince of the blood royal i did think in my secret soul that it was very silly to go and live in shabby lodgings near the noisy dirty strand is it any wonder that i have grown up heartless and mercenary and that i want to have a fine house and horses and carriages when i marry i hope you will marry a rich man too so and give nice parties you won't have thursdays though will you dear i have set my heart on having thursday for my own own evening to this effect miss crawford would discourse in her own vivacious fashion and it was in vain that cecil appealed to the unawakened heart philip foley is a most estimable creature said flo and if he were not absurdly self-conscious all young men are so self-conscious nowadays in fact in a general way i consider young men perfectly hateful and if he were a marquis with something under a hundred thousand a year i should think him quite adorable but then you see he isn't a marquis and he will never earn anything like a hundred thousand a year by painting those wild skies and dismal rocks of his do you know what the princess elizabeth that dear sweet darling whom every one so admires said when she saw one of mr foley's red and yellow sunsets hung next the ceiling in trafalgar square why what do the hanging committee mean 
by sticking up pictures of eggs and bacon said the princess and ever since that the poor young man's skies have been called eggs and bacon End of chapter five chapter six of the lady's mile this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the lady's mile by mary elizabeth braddon chapter six wedding cards returning from the fountains one day after a pleasant morning spent half in the garden half in mr crawford's painting-room cecil found the dowager in one of her worst humours has anything annoyed you while i have been away auntie she asked gently has anything annoyed me indeed auntie echoed mrs macclaver house with unusual acrimony i begin to think that i was only sent into the world for the purpose of being annoyed do you know that the mail from marseilles comes in to-day lady cecil cecil's downcast face grew first crimson and then pale the indian letters the very mention of the post that brought them set her heart beating fast and passionately and she had no right to be interested in their coming she had no right to be glad or sorry for any tidings that the indian mail could bring you have heard from captain gordon i suppose auntie she said falteringly yes i have heard from him answered the dowager in her most snappish manner i hope he is well oh yes he is well enough or as well as a man can be who is such a fool as to become the victim of any designing minx who chooses to set her cap at him what do you think of that enclosure lady cecil the dowager tossed an envelope across the table towards the spot where her niece was standing downcast and sad cecil knew what the enclosure was yes a little shiver went through her as she took up the envelope for she knew only too well what it contained a glazed envelope with a crest emblazoned in silver was within the outer covering and inside the flap of the glazed envelope was inscribed the name of mary chesham two limp slippery cards dropped from cecil's hand as she read the name of her rival the name which was hers no longer for on the larger card appeared the more dignified title of the matron mrs hector gordon she put the cards back into the envelope and laid it gently on the table god grant they may be happy she murmured softly yes answered the dowager and we are to live in dorset square all our lives i suppose upon my word cecil you are enough to provoke the patience of a saint you might have married hector gordon if you had liked yes child you might i watch the man i've known him since he eat his first top and bottom and i can see him eating it in my mind's eye at this very moment so i think i ought to know his ways he was over head and ears in love with you and if it hadn't been for some high-flown nonsense of yours he never would have gone back to india to marry that designing minx he was engaged forsooth and if he was i suppose he could have disengaged himself he was in love with you cecil and you know that you might have married him as well as i do what was he whimpering about that night i should like to know when you sang him your doleful songs if he wasn't in love no man in his proper senses would moon about all day with two women reading poetry and listening to doleful songs unless he was in love however i've no doubt some nonsensical scruples of yours sent him back to calcutta to become the prey of a minx called chesham who are the cheshams i should like to know it sounds a decent name enough but i don't know any cheshams give me the first volume of burke's landed gentry cecil and let me see if there are any respectable cheshams lady cecil went into an inner room to look for the volume her aunt required 
she found herself standing before the bookshelves looking dreamily at the backs of the books and wondering what it was she had come to seek for some few moments she was quite unable to collect her thoughts was she sorry that hector gordon had fulfilled his engagement ah no ah no no to have wished his promise broken would have been to wish him something less than he was oh i am proud to think him good and honourable and true she murmured in a kind of rapture i am proud and glad to think that he has kept his promise ah reader can you not imagine that the pale girl in mr millais picture was in the depths of her soul almost glad that her huguenot lover refused to have the white scarf tied about his arm his refusal would cost him his life perhaps but oh how proud she must have been of him in that moment of supreme agony lady cecil carried the volume of burke to her aunt and mrs mcclaverhouse set herself to discover the antecedents of mrs hector gordon nay chesham there's a letter from mrs lochiel on the table there she said without looking up from her book with an account of this fine wedding you can read it if you like the dowager was an inveterate gossip and kept up a correspondence with a dozen or two other dowagers who took a benign interest in all the births marriages and deaths that came to pass within their circle perhaps if mrs mcclaverhouse had not been soured by the bitter disappointment and mortification which had befallen the pleasant castle she had built in hyde park gardens at her nephew's expense she might have been a little more merciful to poor cecil's wounded heart but it must be remembered that she did not know how deeply the girl's heart was wounded cecil read mrs lochiel's letter is it necessary to say that she read every word of that gossiping epistle more than once though the reading of it gave her exquisite pain there are poisoned arrows for which some women bear their breast there are tortures which some women will suffer unbidden there never was a woman yet in lady cecil's position who was not eager to be told what finery her rival wore and how she looked in the wedding splendour mrs lochiel was very discursive on the subject of millinery dear mary chesham looked very sweet she wrote she is not pretty but remarkably interesting fair with soft blue eyes and a very winning expression i know you will be pleased with her when captain gordon brings her to england and they do say that his regiment will be ordered home next year i am sure you ought to be proud of such a nephew for he is one of the most popular young men in calcutta and one meets him at all the best houses every one says that mary chesham has made a wonderful match and of course there are some people who insinuate that her brother manoeuvred very cleverly to bring about the marriage but i have met mr chesham who seems a very superior young man and not at all the sort of person to manoeuvre the wedding was one of the gayest affairs we have had in calcutta this season mary had six bridesmaids some of the nicest girls in the city and of course the military and civil service mustered in full force the bride wore white glace made with a high body and short sleeves and trimmed with bouillonne of tout l'illusion and a large tulle veil which covered her like a cloud the dress was very simple and certainly inexpensive but quite parisian in style mary has a very lovely arm those pale insipid girls with fair hair generally have lovely arms and she wore a very superb pearl bracelet given her by her uncle colonel cutterly who is i believe expected to leave her money so you see your nephew has not done so very badly after all though people here say he might have made a much better match however i am told that he is quite devoted to mary and i am sure his manner when i have seen them together has been most attentive lady cecil laid down the letter was this jealousy this cruel pang which seemed to rend her heart asunder as she read of her rival's bliss oh surely not jealousy had she not with her own lips bidden him to fulfil his promise and was she grieved and wounded now 
to find that he had kept the spirit as well as the letter of that promise had she expected that he would marry the girl who loved him and yet by his cold indifference bear witness that he loved another surely she could never have thought he could be base enough to do that what did i want she thought what did i expect i told him to go back to her and yet my heart aches with a new pain when i hear that he is happy by her side could i wish it to be otherwise could i wish him anything but what he is good and true and noble a royal lover a tender husband alone in her own room in dorset square cecil chudley knelt long and late that night praying for resignation and peace of mind but even amidst her prayers the face of hector gordon looking down upon her with melancholy tenderness came between her and her pious aspirations oh i wish that i had never seen him she cried passionately what a happy thing it would have been for me if i had never seen him the day came when lady cecil had need to utter this cry with a wilder meaning the day came when she had reason to think that she would have been a blessed creature if she had died before hector gordon came to fortinbras end of chapter six chapter seven of the lady's mile this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the lady's mile by mary elizabeth gladden chapter seven the great o boinville the dowager was of a lively disposition and by no means inclined to spend her evenings in the dusky solitude of her drawing-room in dorset square where the departed general's monster mandarin jars and oriental cabinets loom dark and grim in the twilight in the halls and on the staircases of tyburnia and belgravia in the deliciously squeezy little drawing-rooms and antechambers of the tortuous byways in mayfair wherever there was festivity or junketing in which a gentlewoman might share mrs mcclever house and her black silk and diamonds were to be seen she took cecil with her everywhere and she informed the young lady that it was on her account that the phantom chariot and the grumpy coachman with doubtful legs and feet were called into service every evening it was quite in vain that cecil remonstrated declaring that she was happier with her books and piano in the little back drawing-room in dorset square than at the most brilliant assemblage of the season was she happier at home than abroad in this sad season when it seemed to her as if all hope and gladness had utterly vanished out of her life was she happier she employed the word in her remonstrance with her aunt for she would fain have hidden her wounds from the sharp eyes of that unsentimental protectress and at home she had at least the liberty of being unhappy she could sit alone playing his favourite music softly to herself in the dusk while the dowager dozed at ease in the adjoining chamber in society she felt like a slave crowned with roses compelled to wear the same company smile night after night to affect an interest in the same frivolous subjects to hold her own amongst brilliant young ladies who would have laughed her girlish sorrow to scorn could they have penetrated beneath the frozen calm of her manner the brilliant young ladies declared that cecil chudley was proud the aspendell chudleys always have been poor and proud it was said there were faster spirits who called her slow and who were pleased to ridicule the black robes of the dowager and the pale face and white muslin draperies of her niece and in the meantime cecil went wherever the dowager chose to drag her with an uncomplaining patience which might have won for her the crown of martyrdom if there were any crowns for the martyrs of everyday life the slow season dragged itself out ah how long and how slow it seemed to cecil chudley while she heard so many voices declare how delicious a season it was how especially gay and brilliant it was over at last and mrs mcclaver house conveyed her niece to brighton 
where on the windy downs so familiar to her girlhood cecil found a pensive kind of pleasure in wandering alone with her sealskin jacket wrapped tightly across her chest and the plumes of her little hat fluttering in the autumn blast the weather could not be too cold or too dull for cecil she went to look at the little lonely house where so many years of her joyless life had been passed and standing in the distance she looked sadly at the familiar windows the patch of lawn where the salt sea breezes had blighted her geraniums where the cruel breath of the mistral had slain her pet blossoms of rose and honeysuckle i did not know him when i lived there she thought what foolish creatures women must be it seems to me that now as if there could not have been a time in which i did not know him hector gordon his name would have meant nothing if i had heard it then and now the sound of any other name at all like his sends a thrill of anguish through my heart after the autumn at brighton there came the dowager's customary winter round of visits the christmas festivities the refined hospitality of a modern country house from which only the coarser elements of old-fashioned joviality have been eliminated it was all very cheery and pleasant and to any one but a young lady with a broken heart could scarcely have failed to prove delightful other people besides lady cecil had their troubles and contrived to forget them gay young bachelors blotted from their memory the amounts of their tailors bills and the threatening phraseology of lawyers letters which had followed them even to that hospitable shelter match-making matrons forgot the ages of their daughters and the failures of the past season the tendency of dear maria's nose to get a little red after dinner and the alarming sharpness of poor sophie's shoulders pater familias forgot the delinquencies of his favourite son it almost always is the favourite son who turns out so badly and the young cantab who had lately been plucked lulled himself into a sweet unconsciousness of his featherless condition grim care found the door of anner wold manor house shut in his face and was fain to obtain an entrance to the hospitable mansion by sneaking down the chimney of cecil's chamber to haunt the girl with the memory of hector gordon's face as she lay awake in the dead of the night she could not forget him yet when the first snowdrops peeped pale and pure from their sheltering leaves the dowager went back to dorset square and all the old dreary round of housekeeping detail began again for cecil chudley the spoons in the china the butcher's uncertainty as to wait and the poulterer's extortionate prices seemed more than usually wearisome to cecil this year her burden had been easy to bear before the coming of hector gordon before that one bright interval in her life by contrast with which the rest of her existence was so dull and joyless he had loved her and left her it was her own decision which had separated them for ever but sometimes in some weak moment of depression some foolish dreamy interval of reverie there arose before her the vision of what might have been if the man who loved her had refused to accept her decision if love had been stronger than reason if in spite of herself he had beaten down the barrier that divided them and had stayed in england to make her his wife how do i know that this girl loves him as well as i do she thought bitterly my aunt may be right perhaps in her worldly wisdom and this miss chesham may have only cared for him because he was a good match girls are sent out to india on purpose to get married and how can it be expected they should be otherwise than mercenary but in the next moment lady cecil reproached herself for having thought so basely of her happy rival the heart of lord aspendell's daughter was brave and generous womanly and true but there are moments of weakness and uncertainty which overtake the noblest of the vanquished in the battle of life in these weak moments cecil tried in vain to shut from her mind the picture of what her life might have been if hector gordon had been free to marry her she had loved him for himself alone and would have loved him as truly as if he had been penniless but in her thought of him she could not forget the fact of his wealth that gold which is so sordid a thing in itself is also the keystone to many things that are not sordid and the only man who needs be ashamed of his affection for the yellow dross is he who loves it with a morbid and diseased passion 
for the stuff itself and not the noble uses that may be made of it cecil remembered the scotchman's wealth and all the power that goes along with wealth and there rose before her the vision of a spot in which her childhood had been spent and which she loved with a passionate affection a place she never hoped to see again except in her dreams and the image of it haunted her in them when she was most sorrowful most weary of the joyless gaieties of her london life the place was a long rambling white house built under the shelter of woody hills and surrounded by the loveliest gardens in north devon it lay hidden in the very heart of a wood and was called chudley combe you heard the distant roar of the waves breaking on a rocky shore and only by that sound knew how near all that luxuriant pastoral beauty was to the mighty grandeur of the sea within a mile of chudley combe there was a tiny fishing village a steep hilly street almost inaccessible to any but its wild denizens a bay of bright yellow sand and a ruined fortress on a rock the place had been invaded lately by exploring tourists some of whom found their way to chudley where there were a few valueless old pictures of the most severely dingy school a handsome collection of oriental china and a good deal of quaint old furniture brass inlaid chests of drawers wherein evelina and cecilia might have kept their finery indian secretaire at which clarissa harlow might have written her famous letters high-backed chairs on which sir charles grandison might have sat gentlemanlike and unbending the exploring tourists of these latter days were told that the chudley combs estate had been bought by the grandfather of the late lord aspendell and paid for with his wife's fortune and that the mansion had been built by the same earl and paid for with the same money the estate had never been entailed and had been sold by the last earl cecil's father to a wealthy citizen who after occupying the lonely mansion through a rainy summer repented himself bitterly of his bargain and tried to sell the estate but an estate buried in devonian woods and twenty miles from a railroad is not every one's money and while chudley combe was yet in the market the merchant died leaving a will so badly worded as to occasion a chancery suit this suit had been pending for more than a year and the house was left in charge of a superannuated cook and the grounds in custody of a couple of gardeners it was this place whose image haunted cecil in her dreams the scene in which her childhood had been passed and the spot which was associated with the happiest period of her life she thought how easy a thing it would have been for hector gordon to buy chudley combe and to take her back to the familiar gardens the dear old-fashioned rooms how easy if there had been no such person as mary chesham the old life in dorset square brought with it all the old responsibilities the dowager's health had been very uncertain all through the winter and the dowager's temper was something worse than uncertain she had founded high hopes on the chance of a marriage between her nephew and niece a marriage which should bring hector gordon and hector gordon's wealth comfortably under her dominion and now that all those fond expectations had been disappointed she was inclined to resent her disappointment as a wrong inflicted upon her by cecil in such peevish lamentations did mrs mcclaver house bewail her poverty at this period that cecil began to feel herself a burden on her aunt's slender income and to taste all the bitterness that poisons the bread of dependence she did not know the world well enough to know that there are people to whom it is delightful to grumble mental voluptuaries who would be unhappy if they could find no crumpled rose-leaf for the justification of their discontent cecil fancied that her protectress had substantial cause for her lamentations and she began to be ashamed of her useless life and the trifling expenses which her presence inflicted upon her kinswoman i am as well educated as most of the governesses i have met with auntie she said once why shouldn't i go out as a governess and earn my living what screamed the dowager lord aspendell's daughter would be a nice sort of person to teach a regiment of tiresome brats for twenty pounds a year upon my word cecil i haven't common patience with you when i hear you talk such nonsense but i needn't tell people who i am auntie if there's any reason why a nobleman's daughter shouldn't earn her living i could call myself miss chudley or miss anything and i might earn more than twenty pounds a year 
nonsense child don't let me hear any more of such absurdity what's to become of my silver i should like to know if you leave me i consider it very unkind and heartless of you to talk of deserting me but i wouldn't leave you for the world auntie if i really am any use or any comfort to you answered cecil tenderly only sometimes i can't help thinking that i am a burden to you wait till i tell you that you are a burden lady cecil replied the dowager severely i have been disappointed about you and hector and i don't deny that i have felt the disappointment very deeply but well that's over and i suppose i am to end my days in dorset square it might have been all very different if the general had been tolerably prudent however all i have to say is that if i were as poor as job no niece of mine should degrade herself by going out as a governess lady cecil bowed her head to this decision but she remembered with a sigh how many governesses she had seen in the households of her friends who were infinitely less dependent than she was and whose lives were infinitely happier than hers the sordid cares of dorset square were heavier than usual this year for her aunt's feeble health threw the weight of financial and housekeeping arrangements entirely upon cecil and to this were added the constant anxiety of the sick-room the long summer days spent in the stifling atmosphere of a sunny drawing-room whose windows were rarely opened from dawn to sunset the tension of the mind kept always on the stretch to amuse or soothe a peevish invalid and lady cecil bore all her trials with meek uncomplaining patience she was very patient and in the unbroken round of her daily duties she found very little time to think of her one great sorrow so little time that the shadow of the past grew dim and dimmer until she was able to remember hector gordon with perfect resignation to the fate that had separated her from him and to hear his name spoken suddenly without a painful consciousness of the hot blood rushing to her cheeks the season was drawing to a close and the early glories of the ladies mile had faded when the dowager was well enough to array herself in black silk and diamonds and to go to parties once more she was nothing if not a woman of the world and the chief consolation of her sick chamber had been the friendly visits of other dowagers and gossiping maiden ladies who brought her the freshest scandals of the west end to her the dullness of the dorset square drawing-room had been far more painful than to cecil and within a week from the day on which her medical man pronounced her well enough to take an airing in the phantom chariot she buckled on her armour of state and accompanied cecil to a ball at the house of the fashionable physician who had attended her occasionally during her illness it was at this assembly that cecil chudley met the person who was destined to exercise a very powerful influence over her fate once in every season dr molyneux's sombre old house in harley street burst into a sudden blaze of splendour and brightness once in every season the marble busts of divers pagan notabilities more or less connected with the science of medicine trembled on their scagliola pedestals as the light feet of fashionable beauty and the varnished boots of gilded youth trod the physician's stately chambers the popular medical man gave many parties snug dinners at which the amber wines of the fair rhineland and the violet scented vintages of burgundy were consumed by connoisseurs who could fix the date of a vintage as easily as an archaeologist decides the period of a frieze or a column but these pleasant dinner parties were given chiefly to learned old fogies of the doctor's own profession and were given for the doctor's own pleasure it was only once in a year that he flung open his house for the benefit of polite society in general and his own patients in particular gunter had carte blanche on these occasions and sent in a bill some six months afterwards which was by no means a carte blanche groves of exotics and wagon loads of evergreens came to harley street from unknown regions beyond the edgware road and the doctor's patients calling upon him on the morning before the festival found the sombre hall a forest of moderator lamps and candelabra and the dining-room in which they were wont to wait the great physician's summons completely abandoned to the possession of the confectioner's minions every one who was worth meeting was to be met at dr molyneux's parties fashionable countesses and pretty daughters of nameless citizens from far northern regions of commercial splendour beyond islington and hackney cabinet ministers and briefless barristers a popular actor who had been taken up by the aristocracy literary men and african explorers 
the very latest celebrity in the musical world and the last promoter of the last company for the cultivation of the art of lace-making by spiders or the construction of a canal across the isthmus of panama all these and many more were to be met in the harley street drawing-rooms or on the harley street staircase for it was only the more adventurous spirits who penetrated the drawing-room or heard anything but the highest notes of the last scandinavian tenor there were people who preferred the desultory snatches of conversation and rapid circulation of new arrivals on dr molyneux's staircase to the splendid crush of his rooms in the crowded drawing-rooms beauty waxed pale in the glare of lamps and tapers but on the staircase wandering breezes from open windows and doors fluttered the gauzy draperies of youth and the stately plumage of age and there was a dash of bohemianism in the gaiety which is apt to be pleasing to modern revellers for a thoroughgoing cross-country flirtation there was no place like dr molyneux's broad landing there were deep window seats that must surely have been devised by some designing architect with a special view to the annihilation of masculine peace and the triumph of feminine loveliness there were stands of exotics whose friendly shade protected edwin the briefless and angelina the beautiful from the awful eye of angelina's mamma there were statuettes of marble and parian in pretended contemplation of which celadon and amelia could bask in the light of each other's eyes while amelia's papa was powerless to tear her from the companionship of her penniless adorer there were voluminous curtains falling artistically from the carved cornices of massive doorways beneath whose shelter irrevocable engagements were made only to be broken by death or the distracting complications of an ensuing season arriving late at dr molyneux's assembly the energetic dowager was fain to content herself with a resting place in one of the broad window seats where she installed herself very comfortably but much to the discomfiture of a young lady in pink tulle spotted and festooned with innocent white daisies the damsel in pink had been working the destruction in a clubable point of view of an aristocratic guardsman of six feet two and a half but the advent of the scottish widow scared her covey and the irrevocable word remained unspoken the dowager who read almost everything that was to be read had fallen on a new view of some important feature in the science of physiology and insisted upon discussing her theories with a distinguished surgeon while cecil very weary and indifferent found her way to a seat on the broad flight of stairs leading to an upper floor and sat there above an animated group of pretty girls who were eating ices and talking through the banisters to the gilded youth upon the lower stairs sitting here enthroned above the rest as on a dais and fanning herself listlessly lady cecil was seen by the man who was to make himself the master of her destiny scarcely ten minutes had elapsed since the arrival of mrs mcclaverhouse and her niece when the gilded youth upon the staircase were fluttered by the advent of a sturdy stranger whose broad shoulders made a passage through the elegant crowd very much as a blundering collier might cut her way athwart a fleet of prize wearies while a massive forehead and a bush of straight brown hair arose above all those beautiful partings and ambrosial locks of exactly the same pattern the gilded youth turning indignantly upon the pushing stranger with the stalwart shoulders and resolute elbows beheld a man who was known to most people by sight and to all england by the record of his doings and sayings in the newspapers the pushing stranger was no other than mr o boyneville queen's counsel one of the most popular men at the english bar and the man whose reckless audacity and ready cleverness had won more causes than were ever gained by the eloquence of a barrier or the splendid declamation of an erskine the loungers on the staircase were almost reconciled to being pushed when they discovered how popular a man had elbowed them and several claimed acquaintance with the great o boyneville read your speech in that breach of promise case said one never read anything so jolly i should like to have seen you and valentine pitching into each other in the common pleas yesterday it isn't every man who can shut up valentine said another mr o'boyneville bestowed a friendly nod upon his admirers he had all that easy consciousness of his own abilities and good-natured wish not to be proud which seems a distinguishing characteristic of the hibernian mind he pushed his way upward nodding right and left but his mind was at that moment full of a great case of vendors and purchasers speedily to be decided in one of the courts of equity in which some irish slate quarries were 
distractingly involved with the operations of a gigantic builder and in which innumerable folios of affidavits have been filed on both sides the great barrister was by no means a party-going man and the gilded youth made merry upon the antediluvian cut of his dress-coat the yellow tinge of his cambric cravat and the high shirt-collars which fenced his massive jaws as he passed out of their ken he came to dr molyneux's ball only because the doctor was his personal friend and had carried him through a very sharp attack of brain fever induced by overwork but he would fain have taken his red bag with him and ensconced in some obscure corner have refreshed himself with a dip into the great slate case he was a tall broad-shouldered man with massively cut features a mouth and chin that were almost classic in their modelling strongly marked eyebrows and large bright blue eyes the eyes that are better adapted to threaten and command than to melt with tenderness or darken with melancholy nobody had ever called him handsome nobody had ever called him plain in his face and figure alike there was a daring that was almost insolence a manliness that approached nobility he was the man of men to wear a barrister's wig and gown to wind himself into the innermost souls of irresolute jurymen and to freeze the heart's blood of timid witnesses when something less than forty lawrence o boyneville had found himself the most successful man of his age far higher on the ladder of fortune than many men who were twenty years his seniors and who had worked well too in their time but to the irish lawyer had been given an indomitable energy which is so good a substitute for the sacred fire of genius that it is very apt to be mistaken for that supernal flame nature had bestowed upon him and education had sharpened a rapidity of perception that was almost like inspiration and the more desperate the case he had undertaken the more brilliant was his handling of its difficulties the more daring his defiance of his opponent he had the true warrior spirit and rose with the desperation of anticipated defeat his greatest triumphs had been achieved by movements as wildly hazardous as the charge of the six hundred at balaclava he was a charles the twelfth a frederick the great a napoleon of the bar and he enjoyed a good fight as only the born warrior can enjoy it for seventeen years he had known no interest and found no pleasure outside his profession patiently and uncomplainingly he had passed through his probationary years of poverty and disappointment he had seen his contemporaries young men who had started with as much ambition as himself grow weary of the long waiting and turn aside to begin anew in other and easier paths the pursuit of fortune but he held on and from the first insignificant chance that had been flung in his way to the full triumphs of his present position he never swerved by one hair's breadth from the line he had drawn for himself or neglected the smallest opportunity he found himself rapidly growing rich for he had neither time nor inclination for the spending of money he exacted his price in that tacit manner peculiar to his profession but he set little value on the produce of his labour when the golden stream flowed in upon him he neither drank nor smoked he rarely played at any game of hazard and though while watching the darby canter with ignorant eyes his rapid perception showed him the one horse out of twenty whose build stamped him a winner he had only been induced to visit a race-course some half-dozen times in the twenty years of his london life in all those twenty years lawrence o boyneville had been a voluntary exile from feminine society the successful barrister has no time for flower shows or fancy fairs morning concerts or archaeological society meetings picnics kettle-drums or thé d'assons for him the days are too short for social intercourse the nights too brief for rest and mr o boyneville loved his profession and had given all his mind to the labour of his love the years went by him with all their changes of fashion and left him unchanged his brief holidays were scarcely times of rest for he carried his work with him wherever he went thus it was that at nearly forty years of age the mighty lawrence was still a bachelor he had seen pretty women and had admired them with an artistic pleasure in a pretty face but they had passed him by like the shadows of fair women in the poet's vision he had no time for more than transit admiration or let it rather be said that as yet the one face which was to awake his soul from its dull slumber had not dawned upon him mr oboyneville was rich and was known to be rich and on those rare occasions when he did appear in society he found himself received with extreme courtesy by some members of the gentler sex there were mothers with unmarried daughters of five-and-thirty who would have been quite willing to cultivate mr 
oboinville's acquaintance but the irish luminary appeared only to vanish and the fair damsels of five-and-thirty who were so inclined to be interested in his triumphs and so ready to talk of his last great success had little opportunity of impressing him with their intellectual graces or charming him by their amiability for twenty years from the day in which he had come from the banks of the shannon to drop friendless into the wilderness of london with only one letter of introduction and one five-pound note in his pocket until to-day when his name was a synonym for daring and success he had gone scatheless cupid's fatal shadow rarely darkens the sombre thresholds of the temple nor does the god care to penetrate those courts of lao where his name has so often been taken in vain by mercenary damsels seeking golden ointments for the wounds inflicted by his arrows pretty witnesses had stepped into the box believing their charms invincible and had retired weeping after a verbal contest with the great o boinville as some tender fawn may fly mauled and torn by the mighty boar of the forest grecian noses and timid blue eyes blooming cheeks rendered more blooming by the coquettish adjustment of a spotted veil might exercise a charm of potent power in other regions but they availed nothing when lawrence o boinville rose to cross-examine the witnesses of his opponent put up your veil ma'am and let us see your face if you please he said at starting and then came the torture the searching tone of voice that seemed to imply an occult knowledge the seesawing of trivial facts which seemed to transform the moral standpoint of the witness into a shifting quicksand of uncertainty the frivolous questions beside the subject that seemed so foolish and unmeaning till all in a moment they wove themselves into a fatal web in which the witness was inextricably entangled in such ordeals beauty appealed vainly to the merciless advocate and having derived his chief knowledge of the fair sex from witnesses in nisi prius breach of promise and divorce cases it may be that mr o'boinville's estimate of womankind was scarcely an elevated one of all living creatures perhaps lawrence o'boinville would have seemed to a superficial observer the last to fall a victim to a sudden and unreasoning passion when a man attains the age of forty without one pulse of his heart being quickened by any tender emotion it is to be expected that he will jog quietly on to fifty and that if then he dislikes the prospect of a lonely old age uncheered except by the attentions of a housekeeper who if she does not poison him with subtle doses of tartar emetic will most likely forge a codicil to his will and possess herself of his goods and chattels when he is dead he will look out for some wealthy widow of his own age and settle quietly down to the enjoyment of ponderous dinners and expensive wines and yet on reflection it seems very probable that the busy man the plodding labourer in the arid fields of life is the most likely subject for that sudden love which springs into life vigorous and perfect as minerva when she burst armed and helmeted from the brain of jove the man most apt to fall in love with unknown beauty in an omnibus is the man who has least time for the cultivation of accredited beauty society in the drawing-rooms of his friends sooner or later the god claims his prey and the unbeliever who has gone scatheless for twenty years has good reason to dread the chances of the one and twentieth mr o'boinville pushed his way up dr molyneux's staircase at half-past eleven a free man but he descended the same staircase at a quarter to one as fettered a slave as samson when they bore him from the false embraces of delilah and yet no artful enchantress spread her nets for his entanglement no mercenary circe wove her spell for his destruction the crowd upon the landing-place grew closer as the night waxed older and in the confusion occasioned by one set of people always struggling to get away and another set of people always struggling to get into the drawing-rooms to say nothing of chivalrous young men for ever striving to carry ices or other airy refreshments to distressed damsels the loungers who did not care about dancing had enough to do to keep their ground it was this perpetual motion that drove the mighty oboinville on to the very flight of stairs where cecil sat pensive and silent while the buzz of voices around her grew every moment louder having nothing better to do the barrister lounged with his back against the wall and looked down at the fair aristocratic face of his neighbour while he meditated upon the great slate case but being a student of character he fell to musing on the lady sitting below him sitting almost at his feet as it were with only the width of the stair carpet between them i shouldn't like to drive her too hard he thought if i had her as a witness on the other side she's the sort of woman who could keep her self-possession and make a man look foolish 
i saw valentine tackle such a woman once and he got considerably the worst of it and then after ruminating for some minutes upon an intricate point in the slate case he took courage and addressed lady cecil his hibernian daring rarely abandoned him even in that feminine society to which he was so unaccustomed and yet there was a kind of restraint upon him to-night and a strange schoolboy feeling took possession of him as he spoke to cecil do you like this sort of thing he asked molly no saved my life three years ago or i shouldn't be here but he can't have saved the lives of all these people and yet if he hasn't i don't understand why they come here dr molly no is very popular answered cecil smiling a little at the barrister's manner i think he almost saved my aunt's life in the spring and if everybody here has as much reason as i have to be grateful to him they may very well endure a little crushing besides one is crushed quite as much at other houses where the parties are not so pleasant mr oboyneville shrugged his shoulders well i suppose there are sane people who consider this sort of thing agreeable said he it is one of the enigmas of social life i am a working man and the mysteries of fashion are a sealed book to me but of course if it is the fashion to be hustled upon a staircase people will submit to be hustled on a staircase just as the chinese women pinch their feet and savages flatten their skulls and elongate their ears so Molino attended your aunt did he is she with you to-night oh yes she is here cecil glanced unconsciously towards the embrasure between the curtains where the dowager was seated as she said this and mr boyneville accustomed to watch the glances of witnesses and jurymen was quick to interpret her look the lady in black is your aunt he said what's her name mac claverhouse answered cecil looking with some wonder at this uncivilized stranger who questioned her so coolly i suppose he is an american she thought and yet he doesn't talk like one and you are miss mcclaver house of course said the presumptuous o boyneville he was determined to know who this young lady was this aristocratic beauty with a fair classic face and listless manner another man would have left cecil unmolested and would have stolen away to extract the information he wanted from the master of the house but the unsophisticated o boyneville had no idea of any such diplomacy he had been asking questions all his life and he questioned cecil almost as he would have questioned one of his own witnesses with a friendly unceremoniousness my name is chudley said the young lady very coldly why that's the name of the aspendell family and you belong to that family i suppose miss chudley yes the late lord aspendell was my father indeed ah i met the earl once ten years ago and that unfortunate young man who ran through so much money and was killed in the alps he was my brother murmured cecil rising as if she would have made her escape from this uncivilized monster i beg your pardon a thousand times yes to be sure i ought to have remembered that your brother of course and i suppose he really did contrive to make away with every acre of the aspendell property eh lady cecil looked indignantly at her questioner and the stairs immediately below her being a little clearer just now she moved downwards and made her way towards her aunt the barrister looked after her with a bewildered aspect i suppose she didn't like my talking to her about her brother he thought he was a thorough young scamp if ever there was one and the present lord aspendell must be as poor as job and this girl's his niece i suppose or his cousin poor and proud that's a pity and she's a nice girl too he looked after her she was entering the dancing-room on the arm of an irreproachable cavalier mr o boyneville watched her till she disappeared and then tried to take up the thread of his meditations upon the slate case at the exact point at which he had dropped it but for once in his life he found his thoughts wandering away from the contemplation of his professional duties the image of the patrician face on which he had so lately been looking haunted him as no such image had ever haunted him before i am sorry i offended her he thought for she really seems a nice girl the doctor came out upon the landing in animated conversation with one of his guests at this very moment and perceiving mrs mcclaver house in the shadow of the window curtain stopped to give her cordial greeting i have seen lady cecil and she told me where to look for you said the physician won't you come into the rooms we're a little crowded but i'll find you a comfortable seat and herr kurtz crotton the german bass is going to sing his great drinking song but before dr molyneux could steer the dowager through the crowd about the doorway mr o boyneville had pushed his way to the elbow of his physician whom he saluted in that sonorous voice which was one of the most useful gifts a liberal nature had bestowed upon him after a briefly cordial greeting the irishman bent his head to whisper in the ear of his friend introduce me to the old lady dr molyneux looked at him in some astonishment as he complied 
i know you are a hunter of lions mrs mcclaverhouse he said so i don't think it would be fair if i didn't introduce you to a gentleman whose name must be tolerably familiar to you in the law reports that enliven your morning papers mr o'boyneville mrs mcclaverhouse the barrister who had found so little to say to lady cecil recovered the natural flow of his eloquence in the society of the dowager and made himself eminently agreeable to that lady he took her quite off the hands of her host and contrived to find her a corner on a sofa near the piano where some ladies of the wallflower species were primly seated he talked with more animation than was pleasant to the german bass during that gentleman's great song but mrs mcclaverhouse was one of those people who make a point of chattering throughout the progress of a musical performance and praising it loudly when it is concluded she was delighted with the irish barrister and from her he obtained all the information he wanted about lady cecil chudley perhaps the wily dowager perceived that this uncivilized hercules of the law courts was smitten by her niece's tranquil beauty and knew that he was rich and speculated upon the possibility of his being able to support that corner house in hyde park gardens for whose lofty chambers her spirit languished however it might be she was monstrously civil to the great o boyneville and before her niece came to seek her she had invited him to dine in dorset square at an early date to meet a distinguished luminary of the sutter diwani cecil did not condescend to honour the irishman by one glance as she talked to her aunt shall we go now auntie the rooms are very warm and i am sure you must be tired i suppose that means you are tired answered mrs mcclaver house however i am quite ready to take my departure shall i go and look for your carriage asked mr o'boyneville no thanks cecil replied very coldly captain norris has been kind enough to go in search of it he will not fetch us till it is really at the door auntie i hope not said mrs mcclaver house but i sometimes fancy dr molyneux sows the seeds of his winter bronchitis cases while his visitors are waiting for their carriages in that windy vestibule of his perhaps you will be good enough to get me through the middle passage mr o'boyneville while captain norris looks after my niece captain norris the irreproachable gentleman who had walked the solemn measures of a quadrille with cecil arrived at this moment flushed but triumphant the carriage is there mrs mcclaver house may i offer you my arm but the dowager slipped her hand over mr o'boyneville's sleeve and the captain took possession of cecil there were a good many pauses on the way pleasant salutations and friendly greetings but in due time the ladies were safely installed in their chariot and looking out into the summer night cecil was obliged to bow to mr o'boyneville who stood bareheaded upon the pavement what a horrible man auntie she exclaimed with something like a shudder and how could you be so friendly with him and mr o'boyneville on his way to a big house in bloomsbury where he ate his hurried meals and took his brief night's rest and which was popularly supposed to be his home abandoned himself to musings of quite a different fashion if ever i were to marry he thought and heaven knows it's a remote contingency i would marry such a woman as lady cecil chudley many men have pronounced such resolutions as this and have lived to allow themselves to the most vulgar opposite of their chosen ideal but then lawrence o'boyneville was a man with whom will was power End of chapter seven chapter eight of the ladies mile this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the ladies mile by mary elizabeth braddon chapter eight the dowager's little dinner lady cecil was both surprised and annoyed when the dowager announced mr o boyneville as one of the guests at her next little dinner how could you ask that dreadful man auntie she said because the dreadful man is a very distinguished person in the law and as mr horley the indian judge dines with us next wednesday i thought i could not do better than ask this irish barrister i know those lawyer people like to meet one another though goodness knows with salmon at half a crown a pound and ducklings at eight shillings a pair i ought not to involve myself in the expense of dinner parties cecil shrugged her shoulders ever so slightly as she seated herself at her piano after this little discussion it mattered so little to her who came to her aunt's dinner parties 
imagine the indifference of lucy ashton as to the guests who partook of the lord keeper's ponderous banquets during that dreary interval in which ravenswood was away but poor cecil obeyed her aunt's orders and did battle with the poulterer for a reduction in the price of his ducklings and went through all manner of intricate calculations as to the difference between the expense of lobster cutlets and fricando or oyster patties and chicken rissoles i think spixen makes his lobster cutlets smaller than ever this year said mrs mcclaver house as she looked over the confectioner's list of made dishes and as to his fricandos i am always on tender hooks for fear they shouldn't go decently round the table and i can't get that man peters to calculate his spoonfuls and if he's weak enough to let people help themselves there's sure to be unfairness about the truffles though what any one can admire in truffles is one of the mysteries i have never been able to fathom as to dessert cecil i shall take the carriage into the city to-morrow morning and get what i want for i have no notion of paying eight pence apiece in covent garden for peaches that i can get in tim street for threepence on the appointed evening cecil was the first to enter the drawing-room for the dowager had taken a siesta after luncheon and was late at her toilette dressed in some transparent fabric of pale blue with a fluttering knot of ribbon here and there and a turquoise cross upon her neck lady cecil looked very elegant very pretty with that delicate loveliness which so rarely kindled into brilliancy with that patrician calm which so seldom warmed into animation she looked at the clock on the chimney-piece as she took a book from a cabinet where a few of her aunt's choicest volumes were ranged on alternate shelves with china teacups and quaint old oriental monsters only seven and the people are asked for half-past which always means eight she thought as she sank listlessly into a low chair near the open window she opened her book and tried to read it was a volume of shelley and the dreamy mysticism of the verse soothed her with its magic harmony the shadows of her life had been fading gradually away from her within the last few months but no sunshine had succeeded the darkness she was too gentle and womanly to be cynical but an indifference to everything on earth an indifference almost as profound as the dreary ennui of hamlet had come down upon her and yet she went to parties and danced quadrilles and even waltzed on occasions to dance and to make merry while the ruthless serpent gnaws at the heart is no new pastime there is something pathetic in the simplicity with which lucy aiken tells us how the great elizabeth went to a festival while her favourite her benjamin of favourites the brilliant essex languished under the burden of her dread displeasure while the imperious spirit of the ruler was at war with the woman's doting heart and the most terrible struggle of her life was going forward there was dancing at my lord cobham's that night and a mask performed by women and one of these ladies wooed the queen to dance who are you asked the sovereign my name is affection returned the masker affection said the queen is false and yet she danced remarks the historian with unconscious pathos it was only ten minutes after seven and cecil was quite absorbed in the pages of alister when the door was flung open with the stately swing peculiar to the accomplished dairyman who did duty as butler on the dowager's reception days and the accomplished dairyman announced with perfect distinctness mr o boyneville accomplished as the dairyman was he might have made a mess of any other name but the great barrister's appellation was familiar in his ear as household words and he had many household words with his better half when the propensity for strong drinks contracted in the riotous days of his butlerhood beguiled him from the domestic shelter he knew mr o'boyneville and had sat on juries in the courts where that gentleman was mighty and had been cajoled by the irishman's insidious eloquence and slapdash mode of argument he had laughed over mr o'boyneville's speeches and cross-examinations recorded in the newspapers and he ushered the barrister into the little drawing-room in dorset square with all the respect due to 
so brilliant a luminary cecil was very much annoyed by the irishman's early arrival but he was her aunt's guest and she was bound to receive him courteously she laid aside her book and made the barrister a curtsy and the brilliant o'boyneville the man with whom cool impudence often rose to the level of genius that luminary before whom the lesser lights of the bar waxed faint and pale how did his familiarity with feminine psychology as exhibited in the witness-box serve him in the dowager's drawing-room alas for hibernian wit and hibernian audacity for mr o'boyneville could think of no more interesting subject of remark at this moment than the fact that the day had been warm and a warm day in the last week of june is not exactly a notable phenomenon lady cecil agreed to the barrister's statement with regard to the weather and then went on to say that town was not so full as it had been and this is again not exactly a phenomenon in the last week of june i don't know about that lady cecil replied mr o boyneville if you'd been in the court of common pleas this morning you'd not have thought london empty and then there was a pause for the barrister being more accustomed to browbeat and terrify the fair sex than to make small talk for their amusement found himself brought to a standstill and cecil did not like her aunt's guest well enough to make any desperate conversational plunge he sat looking at her in silence not with the bold stare of admiration with which he was wont to take a feminine witness off her guard before entrapping her into prevarication or perjury but with a more earnest gaze than he had ever fixed on any woman's face before she reminds me of my mother he thought and yet it's only a pale shadow i can remember when i think of my mother i was such a child when she died lady cecil glanced at her aunt's new acquaintance as he sat opposite to her he was quite different from any one she ever had seen before and to her eyes so accustomed to look upon the graceful perfection the harmonious elegance of high-bred youth there was something almost uncivilized in his aspect he wore the high shirt collars in which she had seen him at the doctor's ball the tight-fitting dress coat of a departed age a rusty black cravat and boots of dubious symmetry his brown hair was thick and long but the massive head had something leonine in its character the aquiline nose and large bright blue eyes had that stamp of power which is so near akin to beauty that brief contemplation of lawrence o bourneville awakened cecil chudley to the consciousness that the dreadful man to whom she so much objected was not quite the kind of person to be despised i dare say he is clever in his own way she thought but what could have induced my aunt to ask him to dinner she was spared the trouble of finding some new subject wherewith to bridge the gulf of silence yawning so blankly between her and the barrister for the all-accomplished cow-keeper announced mr and miss crawford and wherever flo went she put to flight the dull horror of silence the crawfords had been invited to please lady cecil and because mr crawford is a nice sort of person to have you know my dear the dowager said to one of her confidants for there is such a rage about these painter people just now and i assure you his place at kensington is a perfect palace with marble pillars in the hall and old stained-glass windows and carved oak panels that he has picked up at antwerp and i hear the prices he gets for his pictures are something fabulous but he's the dearest unaffected creature you ever met and if you like to come on wednesday night between nine and ten you shall see him flo greeted her dearest cecil with enthusiasm and saluted mr o boyneville with the faintest indication of a curtsy as she swept her silken skirts past him and then when she had shaken hands with her dearest friend she turned to look at the barrister with a charming insolent little look which seemed to express and what outlandish creature are you i wonder of course mr crawford knew the great q c almost every male inhabitant of london was familiar with that ponderous figure and defiant face few were the dwellers in the mighty city who had not seen those big white hands waved in the face of an opponent or lifted in the denunciatory periods of virtuous indignation the painter began to talk to the barrister and in a moment the great lawrence was at his ease he knew how to talk with men and there was no question within the regions of heaven or earth too mighty for his audacity too small for his powers of argument 
he would have talked to herschel about the last discovery in the starry system and it is ten to one but in a mixed company he would have made herschel look foolish he would have demonstrated before the face of newton that his theory of gravitation was a false one he would have offered for mr paul bedford's consideration new views upon the subject of jolly nose or if a question of tailoring had arisen in an assembly of tailors he would have proved to the satisfaction of the company that he alone amongst them all had fully mastered the science of cutting out a coat was it not his business to know everything or to seem to know everything if any mad-brained counsel on the opposite side had been pleased to set a flute or recorder before him would it not have been his duty to play a tune thereupon for the edification of the court there was no subject that he had not been called upon to handle in the course of his legal career he had pleaded the cause of a musician whose copyright in a ballad had been assailed on the ground of plagiarism and ignorant of a note of music had talked the jury into idiocy with a farrago of sounding nonsense such as the syncopated passage in the second bar of my client's composition gentlemen it is said to resemble the third bar of mozart's sonata in c minor but to any one who is familiar with the first principles of harmony gentlemen the introduction of the supertonic in place of the subdominant must be a convincing proof of the falsehood of this assertion and if anything were required to demonstrate the puerility of the argument adopted by my learned friend on the other side it would be the group of semi-quavers which concludes the phrase he had carried a french milliner triumphantly through all the intricacies of an action against an aristocratic customer for the recovery of a disputed account and had demonstrated with crushing force the meanness of the lady defendant and the honesty of his client's charges to the lookers-on from the outer world his triumphs may have appeared easy it seemed as if he had only to elevate his voice with a certain emphasis and to look round the court with a certain self-assured smile and lo his audience rejoiced and were merry the great question at issue gentlemen of the jury is the question of trimmings laughter you have all of you heard no doubt of a leg of mutton and trimmings renewed laughter but the trimmings in question are of far greater value than the turnips of a cincinnatus or the potatoes of a raleigh the question in point gentlemen if i may venture upon that play of words which the great samuel johnson held in such detestation is a question of point the point lace flounce for which my client charges one hundred and thirty nine pounds fourteen and sixpence was i am told one of the rarest specimens of the workmanship of the beguines of flanders and who and what are these beguines gentlemen of the jury by whose patient fingers this delicate fabric was manufactured were they common work women to be recompensed at a common rate no gentlemen of the jury they were ladies ladies of honourable lineage and independent means who of their own free will retired into a beguinage a religious house which was yet not a convent and there free from the bondage of any formal vow they devoted themselves to the consolation of the poor and afflicted and the manufacture of that rare old lace which is now the proudest boast of our female aristocracy why gentlemen the price demanded by my client is somewhat pitiful when we remember the circumstances under which that point lace was made the taper fingers that have toiled to fashion those intricate arabesques the solitary tears that have bedewed the fairy fabric and here it may be the great oboinville himself produced a palpable tear on the end of his finger and gazed at it for a moment in absence of mind as wondering what it was or seemed so to gaze while in reality his piercing eyes shot towards the jury to see whether they were laughing at him or whether his rhodomontade had told this was the man who had found himself so ill at ease in the society of one beautiful woman the dowager appeared presently oh you two punctual people exclaimed the lively mrs mcclaver house you come to see an old woman who lives in lodgings and i dare say you expect everything as well reglay as if you were going to dine at mr horborough's palace in park lane how do you do florence my dear how do you do crawford so you and mr o boinville are old friends that's very nice but i hope you're not going to talk about texture and modelling all the evening do you know we had a couple of musical celebrities once at one of the general's dinners in portland place and they talked about harmony and composition all dinner time and as they sat on opposite sides of the table it was so agreeable for the rest of the company do you know what that fellow simpkins will do says brown why he'll use consecutive fifths he's got them more than once in that last sonata of his god bless my soul cried smith i never thought much of him but i did not suppose he was capable of that and that's the way they went on the whole evening so you dear crawford tell us as many nice stories about your artist friends as you can about their having their furniture seized by sheriff's officers and taking their pig pictures 
wet to that stupid pawnbroker who rubs out a pig with his thumb and dying in sponging houses and stabbing their models in order to get the proper contraction of the muscles but please don't be technical the indian notability made his appearance presently with a very stately wife in brown velvet and carbuncles a costume which flo declared reminded her of haunch of mutton and currant jelly to mr o boinville's escort this stately matron was entrusted an elegant young belgian diplomatist who spoke very little english took charge of florence while mr crawford devoted himself to cecil and the judge of the sutter de Wants offered his arm to mrs mcclaverhouse whose brain was racked by doubts as to whether the salmon would go comfortably round or whether those two ninepenny lobsters ordered for the sauce were equal to the eighteenpenny one which she had rejected suspecting sinister motives lurking in the mind of the fishmonger who had recommended it the dinner a la russe is a splendid institution for the economical housekeeper and might on some occasions be called a dinner a la russe so artful are the manoeuvres by which half a dozen oyster patties or a few ounces of chicken and a handful of asparagus tops can be made to do duty for a course so inexpensive are the desserts which consist chiefly of fossilized conserves and uneatable bonbons and which are of so indestructible a nature that they will last a managing hostess as long as a chancery suit the dinner went off well mrs mcclaverhouse's little dinners were almost always successful in spite of those conflicting emotions which agitated the heart of the hostess the indian judge and the irish barrister talked shop and there was a very animated discussion of a great international law case the details of which had filled the columns of the times for the last three weeks a case in which masculine intelligence perceived a thrilling interest but which to the female mind appeared only a hopeless complication of politics and shipbuilding in so small a party the conversation was tolerably general mr crawford entered heartily into the shipbuilding case and only florence and the elegant young diplomatist were confidential chattering gaily in that exquisite language which seems to have been invented in the interests of coquetry the gentlemen came to the drawing-room very soon after the ladies had settled themselves in opposite corners florence and cecil on a cosy little sofa by the open window a sofa just large enough to accommodate their ample skirts the dowager and the judge's wife on easy chairs near a ground glass screen which concealed the empty grate florence had so much intelligence of a peculiarly confidential nature to impart to her friend that she looked almost coldly on the elegant young belgian when he presented himself before her it is very nice for a young lady whose french is undoubtedly parisian to discuss lamartine and de vigny hugo and chateaubriand and such other gallic luminaries whose works a young lady may discuss with an agreeable companion but florence crawford had made a conquest within the last week and was bright with all the radiance of a new triumph and unutterably eager to impart the tidings of her last success to cecil he has called on papa twice within the week dear said the animated flow in that confidential undertone which is the next thing to whispering and papa says it is the most absurd thing in the world to hear him ordering pictures he has asked papa to paint him too and when he was asked if he had any special idea of his own about the subject he said no but he wanted them to fit the recesses between the windows of his billiard-room at pevens hall he has a place called pevens hall somewhere in that dreadful north for he is rich ah millions you know to ce qu'il y a de plus manchester his father and grandfather made all the money and he is to spend it i am sure he would never have made any for himself but papa has declined the unfortunate young man's commission fancy one of papa's cleopatras stinging herself to death between the windows of a manchester man's billiard-room there are men in manchester who know art thoroughly papa says and it is utterly absurd for a painter to turn up his nose at the patronage of traders for if you go into the galleries of those dear old sleepy towns in belgium you will find that the noblest works of your van eyck's and hans what's his names were paid for by wealthy citizens and what a blessing the modern patrons don't insist on having themselves painted looking through cupboards or riding on horseback in the corner of a picture imagine a manchester man's head poking through a hole in the sky in mr millet's vale of rest or peering out of the cupboard in a corner of mr frith's derby day however papa has declined to paint anything for mr labier so the unfortunate young man will have no excuse for calling on unorthodox occasions but he must be a very stupid person florence i cannot imagine your taking any interest in him nor can i imagine myself tolerating his society for half an hour if he were not what he is answered flo blithely don't i tell you that he is the rich mr labier 
even his name is horrible you see lobbier he might make it a little better by tacking on some aristocratic prenom vavasour lobbier or plantagenet lobbier or something of that kind might sound almost tolerable yes he is very stupid cecil but he seems rather a good young fellow he laughs good-naturedly when other people are laughing and he gets on wonderfully with my cockatoos there seems to be an instinctive kind of sympathy between him and cockatoos and they allow him to rumple their feathers and scratch their foreheads in the most amiable manner you know what a place the fountains is and how often i sit in the conservatory that leads to the painting-room or else just outside papa's bay window so of course when mr lobier came to talk about the pictures he loitered and hung about playing with the birds and sniffing at the flowers in that horrible fidgety manner peculiar to some young men until papa came out of the painting-room to tell me i had better go for a drive which meant that mr lobier was to take his departure and i really think cecil that if i had not kept him at bay that unfortunate young man would have made me an offer that very morning after meeting me rather less than half a dozen times but florence you surely would never marry such a person for goodness sake cecil don't call him a person haven't i always told you that i meant to marry for money and don't i tell you that mr lobier is preposterously rich i acknowledge that he is stupid and ignorant more manchester than manchester itself but are there not guardsmen with long pedigrees who are as boorish and ignorant as mr lobier i am not like those absurd girls who look in the glass and fancy they are like the two beautiful miss gunnings and have only to show themselves in the park in order to captivate marquises and royal dukes and you would really marry for money florrie said cecil very sadly is there anything so well worth marrying for who was that stupid old legal person who said that knowledge is power why did he take bribes and sell public offices if he thought that depend upon it cecil that money is power and the only power worth wielding money is power and beauty and grace and fascination do you think anne of austria fell in love with plain george villiers no cecil she fell in love with the duke of buckingham and his white uncut velvet suit and his diamonds and the jewels he dropped among her maids of honour and all the pageantry and splendour around and about him was it of any use to reason with a young lady who talked like this miss crawford had enjoyed all those advantages of education which fall to the share of middle-class damsels of the present day and the possession of which a century ago would have made a young lady a phenomenon she spoke french perfectly she knew a little italian and had read the pro messi sposi and could quote little bits of dante and petrarch she could read german and quote goethe and schiller on occasions she played beautifully and painted tolerably and waltzed exquisitely but of that moral education which some mothers and fathers bestow upon their children florence crawford was utterly destitute she had brought herself up and she prided herself on that high-bred heartlessness or affectation of heartlessness which seemed one of the most fashionable graces of her day she had founded herself as she fancied on the best models better to be becky sharp than amelia sedley she said and the world is full of beckys and amelias she could find a very tolerable excuse for herself and her companions the men complain that we are fast and mercenary that we talk slang and try to make rich marriages and there are articles about us in the fashionable newspapers just as if we were a new variety in animal creation on view in regent's park do they ever stop to consider who taught us to be what we are can the gentleman whose highest praise of a woman is to say that she is jolly and has no nonsense about her and sits square on her horse wonder very much if we cultivate the only accomplishments they admire cecil had often tried to remonstrate with her volatile friend and had as often found her efforts utterly thrown away so to-night she allowed flo to devote herself to the belgian attache and abandoned herself to her own thoughts only making a little pretence of joining in the conversation now and then sometimes while well, she listlessly turned the leaves of an album whose every leaf she knew by heart lady cecil glanced upward to the angle of the mantelpiece by which lawrence o boyneville stood in conversation with the judge and the painter for however charming the society of lovely and accomplished women may be men have an attraction for one another in comparison with which all feminine witchery is weak and futile looking at the little group by the chimney-piece cecil saw that the barrister had by far the largest share in the conversation he was very animated and those large white hands which were so eminently useful to him in court were considerably employed to illustrate his discourse that he was talking well she could see in the attentive faces of his listeners for indian judges and popular painters do not listen with any show of interest to a man who talks nonsense lady cecil began to think that after all there must be something a little out of the common in this dreadful man the evening came to a close presently and as he bent over cecil to say good-night mr o'boyneville's manner was very much out of the common 
i have been talking to your aunt lady cecil he said and she tells me you leave town early next week i have asked permission to call on you to-morrow and mrs macclaver house has given it so it is not good-bye you see but au revoir this was about the coolest speech which cecil chubb had ever had addressed to her she looked at mr oboyneville with an expression of unmitigated astonishment but he gave her hand a grip that wounded the slender fingers with the rings which adorned them and departed i've three hours to work to get through before i go to bed to-night he said as he went downstairs with the painter and his daughter and so he had the first hansom that he encountered conveyed him to that sepulchral mansion in brunswick square which he had chosen for his habitation not because he particularly liked brunswick square but because it was necessary for him to live somewhere he let himself into the gaunt stone hall with his latch-key and walked straight to the library at the back of this spacious mansion a gloomy chamber lined with law-books and provided with that species of furniture which may be seen exhibited by the merchants of queen street lincoln's inn fields this dismal apartment was the retreat in which mr oboyneville spent the greater part of his home life he very frequently took his dinner on the library table with his plate surrounded by papers and an open brief propped up against his decanter of manzanilla to-night he found the red bag which his clerk had brought from the temple waiting for him on the table he did not open it quite at once he did not pounce upon its contents as he had been wont to do he sat for some minutes leaning back in his chair with a smile upon his face a dreamy smile which was new to that eager resolute countenance so well known to the legal world for its hawk-like glances and insolent defiance my own sweet darling he thought and i shall have a wife and a home good heavens how many years of my life have i spent without ever dreaming of any such happiness and now now i wonder that i could have lived so long as i have i wonder that i could have lived without her and then after abandoning himself a little longer to this delicious reverie he roused himself with an effort and opened his bag but as he took out the first handful of papers he exclaimed with a sigh and yet god knows i wish i had never seen her i went on so well before and my mind was free for my work and now he began to read and in five minutes time was as deeply absorbed in his papers as if no person such as cecil chudley had existed and yet he loved her with that foolish and unreasoning passion called love at sight with that love which coming for the first time to a man of his age comes as surely for the last End of chapter eight chapter nine of the lady's mile this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the lady's mile by mary elizabeth braddon chapter nine lawrence o boyneville's first hearing to the dowager mr o boyneville had been very confidential he was as frank and ingenuous as some lovesick schoolboy in his revelation of that sudden affection with which cecil chudley's pensive face had inspired him the unconscious audacity which was one of the chief attributes of his character supported him in a position in which another man of his age and habits would have suffered an agony of self-consciousness a torturing sense of his own foolishness he was close upon forty years of age his childhood had been spent on the greensward of irish hills and valleys among the wildest of hibernian agriculturalists his boyhood had been passed in an irish city far south of the brilliant capital his manhood had been a long scrambling helter-skelter journey upon one of the dustiest and most toilsome roads of modern life his habits were not the habits of the men who were to be met in cecil chudley's world his cleverness was not their cleverness and those graces and accomplishments which in their education had been the first consideration were just the very points which in his rough schooling had been neglected or ignored another man under such circumstances and even another irishman might have regarded lady cecil from afar with fond admiring glances and returned to his law library in bloomsbury or his dusty chambers in the temple not scatheless but hopeless and despair being a fever of but brief duration it is your intermittent sickness of alternate hope and fear 
that hangs so long about the sufferer the victim might have speedily recovered the wound inflicted by a flying cupid's random shot but it was not thus with lawrence o'boyneville he knew that he was eight-and-thirty and that he looked five years older nor was it long since the tailor who made those garments which the barrister insisted should be constructed after the fashion of his youth had sighed as he took his patron's measure murmuring plaintively another inch round the waist mr o boyneville and bless my heart it seems only yesterday when twenty-five inches was your figure the barrister contemplating himself in the glass during the process of shaving and scowling not at himself but at the visionary countenance of the sarcastic valentine or the unctuous o smay with whom he was to do battle before the day was done might have perceived had he chosen to consider the matter that he was by no means the sort of person whom women call handsome the strongly marked eyebrows so quick to contract above the cold blue eyes the aquiline nose the firmly set lips the massive chin and the broad square brow with his prominent range of perceptive organs overshadowing the eyes these were not the component parts of a countenance on which women care to dwell with admiring glances but that which would most likely have discomfited other men had no power to abash or to disturb the resolute spirit of lawrence o boyneville perhaps the secret of his audacity was that he had never failed in anything from the boyish days when he had breasted the falls of the shannon and done battle with the power of the waters his career had been one long hand-to-hand -hand struggle with difficulties penniless he had succeeded where other men's money had been powerless to win them success friendless he had trampled upon the fallen hopes of rivals who could boast of kindred and friendship with the mighty ones of the earth a stranger and an alien he had won for himself wealth and renown in a country in which vulgar prejudice had made the very name of his people a byword and a reproach was this a man to be turned aside from his purpose because the woman with whom he had fallen in love happened to be above him in rank and the daughter of a world with which his world had nothing in common no after seeing cecil chudley for the first time lawrence o'boyneville decided that he would never marry any other woman on seeing her for the second time he determined to marry her the most presuming of coxcombs could scarcely have been more sublimely assured of his own invincibility and yet the barrister had nothing in common with a coxcomb he was only accustomed to succeed if he wanted to do anything he did it and opposition or difficulty only gave a keener zest to the process of achievement he wanted to marry lady cecil chudley and he meant to marry her she might object at first of course people almost always did object to his doing what he wanted to do but he always did it had not his professional rivals objected to his success and banded themselves together to keep him down and had he not succeeded in spite of them in his native wilds mr o boyneville might have twirled his shillelagh and screamed hurroo so light were his spirits as he set forth to call on the lady of his love in civilized and crowded london he could only swing his stick loosely in his hand as he strode triumphantly from the hall of the wasted footsteps whereby he drew down upon himself the maledictions of an elderly gentleman whose shins the weapon had smitten in descending that the pavements of the metropolis had not been laid down for his sole accommodation was a side of the question which mr o boyneville had never taken the trouble to contemplate he had been to westminster had heard the opening of a case in which he was concerned and had given his brief and whispered his instructions to hodger a painstaking junior who was very glad to do suit and service to the great o boyneville the great o boyneville's client a soap boiler in lambeth who was at war with his parish upon the question of whether he did or did not consume his own smoke was by no means gratified by the substitution and looked as black as if he had indeed in his own proper person consumed all the smoke of his furnaces 
but the distinguished irishman strode away from westminster heedless of his client's rage it was very rarely that lawrence o'boyneville gave his work to another man the solicitors who swore by him told their clients that if o'boyneville undertook a case he would see it through to the very end there never was such a resolute beggar said a fast young attorney who had witnessed one of the q c s triumphs the more desperate a case is the sweeter o boyneville is upon it he has all the hibernian love of fighting and if anybody says peas he's ready to spill his blood in the cause of beans egad if there were a victoria cross for desperate valour exhibited in the law courts larry o boyneville's silk gown ought to be decorated with it but to-day for the first time in his life the barrister neglected his work for his own pleasure that solemn crisis which for some butterfly creatures comes once or twice in every london season came to this man for the first time after twenty years of manhood he was in love and he was going to ask the woman he loved to be his wife he was going to ask her to marry him and he had met her on dr molyneux's staircase and he had watched her at a dinner-party as she talked to her aunt's guests he knew her so little and yet was eager to win her for his wife good heavens exclaims common sense what a fool the man must be and yet for once dear simple straightforward common sense is out in her reckoning for lawrence o boyneville knew cecil chudley better than she was known by her most intimate friends it was a gift with him this intuitive knowledge of human character this rapid perception of human motive and it was by the possession of this gift quite as much as by his cool audacity of showy eloquence that the irish barrister had made for himself a name and a position before a witness had kissed the book and answered a preliminary question or two lawrence o boyneville knew what manner of man the witness was show him the most trumpery photograph that was ever bought for eighteen pence and he would penetrate the inmost depths of that man's mind whose face was dimly shadowed in the smudgy portrait it was doubtful if he had ever read lavater and yet more doubtful if he had waded through the big volumes of george combe and yet he was in his own person an unconscious lavater and to him the teaching of the great comb could have imparted no new wisdom a man's eyes are not overshadowed by a bumpy ridge for nothing and to lawrence so boyneville had been given in excess that wondrous faculty called perception he had scrutinized lady cecil with eyes that were experienced in the reading of every expression the human countenance is capable of assuming he knew that she was pure and true and generous and high-minded a little proud perhaps but only just as proud as a good woman has need to be in a bad world he knew that she was a prize worth winning and he meant to win her no apprehension of failure troubled the serenity of his mind he did not expect to win her all at once had it not cost him fifteen years of hard labour to obtain his silk gown and could he expect that providence would give him this far higher prize without inflicting on him some interval for the exercise of his patience some manner of probationary ordeal for the trial of his faith and devotion mr o boyneville did not believe in that french proverb which asserts that happiness comes to the sleeper i will serve my seven years apprenticeship and my seven years after that if necessary but she shall be my wife before i die thought lawrence but it may be that mr o boyneville's fourteen years was only a figurative expression for he said to himself presently if i play my cards well we may be married in the long vacation and then i'll take my wife to ireland and get a glimpse of the shannon for the first time these twenty years arrived in dorset square mr o boyneville did not endanger his prospects by any untimely modesty he told the servant who opened the door that he came by appointment and when the dowager's own maid emerged from some dusky back parlour whence issued that odour of heated iron 
and singed blanket which attends the getting up of feminine muslins and laces he brushed unceremoniously by that prim young person and made his way upstairs fortune favoured him she seems but a craven spirited divinity after all and always places herself on the side of the audacious cecil chudley was sitting at the piano not playing but leaning over the keyboard in a thoughtful attitude with her head resting on one hand while the listless fingers of the other trifled with the leaves of her music-book she looked up as the door opened and her face betrayed anything but pleasure as she recognized her visitor he had prepared her to expect such an intrusion but she had not expected him so early and had engaged an ally in the person of florence crawford who had promised to come to her dearest cecil directly after breakfast unfortunately flo's directly after breakfast meant any time between ten and two and as the dowager rarely made her appearance before luncheon poor cecil had to encounter the great o boinville alone but in spite of the special manner in which the popular barrister had announced his coming cecil had no suspicion that the visit itself was to be of any special nature no eccentricity could have surprised her in the wearer of that tight-sleeved frock-coat and those exploded shirt-collars in which mr oboinville exhibited himself for the edification of modern society his solemn announcement of course only referred to the conventional morning call of the grateful diner out the stamped receipt for an agreeable entertainment lady cecil was prepared to be a little bored by the eccentric irishman's visit and there an end i wish flo had been here to talk to him she thought wearily flo could receive a deputation of aldermen or a church commission whatever that is mr oboinville murmured some feeble truism in reference to the weather in spite of his audacity in spite of his calm assurance and unfaltering faith in ultimate victory his ease of manner his popular swagger and his ready flow of language abandoned him for the moment when he found himself in the presence of that unconscious enchantress who had awakened the soul of a middle-aged barrister from its twenty years torpor but the paralysis called bashfulness was a very temporary affliction with mr o boinville before he had been talking ten minutes to lady cecil he had drawn his chair close to the piano by which she was still seated before he had been talking to her twenty minutes he had asked her to be his wife she looked at him with a smile of utter incredulity mr oboinville she exclaimed you must surely intend this for a jest and believe me it is a very foolish one a jest lady cecil what don't you know sincerity when you meet with it well i confess it was foolish of me to come to you like this and to tell you i'd fallen over head and ears in love with you before a fine gentleman of the modern school would presume to ask you how you are but you see lady cecil i'm not a fine gentleman for the first seventeen years of my life i lived amongst people almost as simple and primitive as those happy savages columbus found in hispaniola for the last twenty years i have been too hard a worker in my own world to have any leisure in which to acquire the thoughts and ways of yours i never thought that any break would come in the rapid current of my busy life but i suppose there is one fateful hour in every man's existence i who so seldom go to parties went to molly nose ball i who so seldom talk to young ladies talk to you and before i turned the corner of harley street that night my destiny was a settled thing she has come said i and she brings my fate in her hand to my mind lady cecil that which your romance writer and your poet call love at sight if not an adam at his birth he is no love at all and so on is rather an intuitive consciousness which a man has in the hour 
that brings him face to face with the woman who is to be the happiness or the misery of his life i am not going to use high-flown language lady cecil eloquence is my stock and trade elsewhere the words cannot be too plain in which i tell you that i love you there is very little to be said in my favour i am what people call well off but you might reasonably expect to marry a much richer man i come of a good old irish family but proscription has diminished its lands to a single farm and the taint of treason has blotted its name i am nearly twenty years your senior and i have few of the accomplishments which distinguish the young men of the present day it is the cause of the leaden casket which i am pleading lady cecil and against all the outward splendour of gold and silver which my rivals can boast i can set nothing except the unselfishness of my love the strength of my devotion cecil had listened very patiently to this address she could not doubt the depth of feeling which was breathed in every accent of the barrister's voice subdued and grave in tone and altogether different from the sonorous thunder which so often awoke the echoes of the law courts she was touched by his appeal though it stirred no warmer feeling than a gentle thrill of womanly pity it is not in the nature of a woman to feel unkindly to the lowest of human beings who reveals to her a pure and noble affection a miranda will pardon and pity a caliban if his devotion is instinct with the divinity of innocent love are you really in earnest mr o'boyneville asked lady cecil i was never more in earnest in my life i am very sorry for it i am very sorry answered cecil gently i am sure i need not tell you that i am touched and flattered by your preference for me eccentric as it may be but you must be indeed a stranger to the society of women if you can imagine that any woman knowing as little of you as i do could reply otherwise than in the negative to such an offer as you have made me yes i dare say it's very absurd murmured mr o'boyneville despondingly it's my headlong way of doing things a national characteristic i suppose lady cecil i ought to have waited a week or two till we knew each other intimately and then would there have been any hope for me if i had waited a week or two asked the barrister in that soft insinuating tone to which he had been known to drop after a burst of loud and lofty declamation with a sudden transition of style that had often proved irresistible with an impressionable jury cecil chudley shook her head gently i might have been less surprised by your flattering proposal mr o'boyneville she said but no circumstances could possibly arise under which i could give you any other answer than that i have given you to-day and that answer is no it is mr o'boyneville irrevocably no irrevocably lady cecil forgive me if i ask you a question is there any one any one who occupies the place in your heart that it would be my dearest hope to win for myself ah oh, you don't know how patiently i would bide my time if there were ever so distant a gleam of sunshine to lure me on is there any one else lady cecil no there is no one else ah then that's bad indeed said the irishman with a sigh if there had been any one else i might have hoped mr o'boyneville's habit of subduing the stolidity of a jury by a happy colloquialism when all grandiloquence of language had failed to produce an effect very nearly betrayed him into saying to punch his head he pulled himself up with an effort and concluded i might have hoped to prove myself the worthier man of the two but if there is no one lady cecil and you say the answer is irrevocable my doom is sealed i will not tell you that i shall die broken-hearted for in this bustling nineteenth century men have no time to break their hearts in the old-fashioned way they can only overwork their brains and die of some commonplace heart disease the effect of your rejection will be that i shall work if anything harder than i have been accustomed to work 
and go down to my grave a single man and now i'll not bore you any longer lady cecil and i hope you'll forget that i've talked about anything that isn't appropriate conversation for an ordinary morning call he held out his hand as frankly as if he had shaken off all sense of mortification or disappointment lady cecil had received her due share of matrimonial proposals and had been accustomed to see a rejected swain depart with an air of dignified sulkiness there seemed to be something almost magnanimous in the irishman's simple heartiness of manner it appeared as if he were rather anxious to relieve cecil from any natural embarrassment than oppressed by a sense of his own humiliation she shook hands with him very cordially and thought better of him in this moment of parting than she had thought yet but she did not make him any conventional speech about her desire to retain his friendship or her anxiety respecting his ultimate happiness she fancied that his sudden passion was only the folly of an overgrown schoolboy and she had little fear of the consequences of her rejection i dare say he falls in love with some one every week of his life and passes his existence in making offers that are refused she thought as she sat down to the piano after he had left her but even after thinking thus of her departed admirer cecil could not altogether dismiss him from her mind she might smile at the remembrance of his folly but she could not question his sincerity for the moment at least he had been in earnest but then it is the nature of an irishman to be desperately in earnest about trifles the arrival of a bloom coloured coat from mr philby the tailor seems as great an event to goldsmith as the grant of a pension can appear to the calmer mind of johnson mr o'boyneville walked away from dorset square vanquished but not disheartened he had been prepared for a rejection of his suit for for him cecil's irrevocable no was not entirely appalling his experience had shown him many a verdict set aside many a decision appealed against and are there not courts of appeal in the kingdom of lovers as well as in the vulgar everyday world of lawyers in spite of what the barrister had said to lady cecil he had been much relieved by her assurance that her heart and hand were alike disengaged he had affected the resignation of despair while a glow of hope had gently warmed his breast and as he swaggered along the pavement of baker street on the watch for a passing hansom he had by no means the appearance of a rejected and desponding lover i dare say she'll think me a fool for my pains but at any rate she will think of me and that's something mused mr o'boyneville how prettily her eyelids drooped when she gave me her irrevocable answer just as if she shrank from seeing the disappointment in my face and how good and true and pure she is there'd be little need for divorce courts and less work for the lawyers if all women were like her and i don't despair of calling her lady cecil o boyneville yet there never was a good woman who wasn't to be won by the love of an honest man provided there's no mistake about his love or his honesty there's not a day of one's life but one hears of oddly matched couples what could pretty mrs green have seen in that awkward lout green says gossip why what should she see except that he loved her better than any other man in creation and then if fate is the master of men circumstance is the tyrant of women a man may marry the woman he wishes to marry a woman can only marry the man who wishes to marry her and at this point the barrister espied an approaching hansom and beckoned to the driver i may be in time to see the soap boiler through his troubles yet he thought as he sprang into the vehicle westminster hall cabby and lose no time about it end of chapter nine chapter number ten of the lady's mile this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Lady's Mile by Mary Elizabeth Braden. The Rich Mr. Lobier. Before the season was over, Lady Cecil enjoyed the honor of an introduction to Florence Crawford's wealthy admirer, Mr. Thomas Lobler, of Pennsylvania Place, Yorkshire, and of the Lobler Mills in the Cotton Country. The dowager and her niece were amongst the Sunday evening droppers in at the fountains within a week of Mr. O'Bonneville's declaration and it was on that occasion that cecil beheld her friend's admirer for the first time the deeply smitten lobber had made good use of the sunday evening privilege and every sabbath found him lounging with a lumbering gait and creaking footsteps in the painter's pretty drawing-rooms or lurking darkly in the dimmer light of the conservatories where he held mysterious converse with the cockatoos. It was not that he so especially affected the society of cockatoos, but he was a young man who always seemed restless and uneasy if deprived of the companionship of some animal. He carried a toy terrier in his pocket when he made morning calls, and caressed the miniature brute stealthily in the frequent pauses of the conversation he was dull and embarrassed in the presence of an accomplished young lady but he got on admirably with a ferret or a weasel and there were people who said he could have made himself at home with a boa constrictor the cry of rats stirred him with a profound thrill of emotion that which vibrates through the frame of a thoroughbred dandy dinment or agitates the bosom of a sharp young bull terrier he was fond of his horses and still more fond of his dogs but the animals he affected were not the mighty natives of newfoundland or the noble denizens of Mount St. Bernard. The dogs which Mr. Lobger purchased at high prices from crack dog fanciers were generally accomplished raptors and miniature specimens of the bulldog tribe, renowned for their tendency to attach themselves to the calves of unoffending legs and their high-bred objection to being severed from their prey as the uncertain temper and occasional restlessness of his favorite terriers rendered it rather dangerous to take them to evening parties mr lobger was always glad to fall back upon the society of any animal attached to the household in which he visited he would retire into a dusky corner and stir up the inhabitants of an aquarium with the point of his gold pencil in the apparent hope of getting up intimate relations with the jellyfish he would beguile the golden inmates of a crystal globe by tearing up minute fragments of one of his visiting cards and passing them off for such edible morsels as unwise benevolence offers to goldfish. His intercourse with the inferior animals was not necessarily of a friendly order. His hands were defigured by the teeth of his dogs, goaded into desperation by his plainful salix, for it was sometimes his humor to worry the distinguished ratters very much as the distinguished ratters worried the rats in sorrowful earnest mr lobier was not a nice young man he was rich and there were many people who would have been very glad to think him nice but who were fain to abandon the attempt 
and to demand tribute of admiration for their favorite on other and loftier grounds and this was very easily done there is no cub so brutish no lout so clumsy uncouth and insolent who cannot be made to pass for a rough diamond society especially represented by matrons with marriageable daughters decided that mr lauber was a rough diamond a dear good candid creature who blurted out everything he thought he was an original character and his unpolished manners were quite a relief after the fade graces and courtesies of over-educated young diplomatists and amateur literatures this was what people said of mr lobure during the two seasons in which he exhibited his clumsy figure and his bullet head in the assemblies of second-rate fashion not the creme de la creme but that excellent milk from whose surface a very decent layer of cream may be gathered in a second skimming and society smiled upon the wealthiest bachelor from cottonopolis he was neither handsome nor clever he was neither amiable nor well-bred but he was the wealthiest available bachelor in the circles which he adorned the gold worshippers who saw in mr lobier the genius of commercial prosperity were anxious to make the best of their idol he had feminine admirers who called him handsome he had masculine allies who declared that he was clever his features were regular but cast in that heavy mould which seems better adapted to a good-looking animal than a handsome man he had big brown eyes but so has a newfoundland dog and the eyes of an intelligent dog possess a beauty of expression which was utterly wanting in the round van dyke brown orbs of thomas lobber his complexion was dark and sallow pale always but capable of assuming an unpleasant livid whiteness when he was very angry the physiognomists were tolerably unanimous as to the character of his thick red lips and sloping chin but the fair denizens of the western suburbs were equally unanimous in their admiration of his carefully trained moustache and the luxuriant beard and midst which he was wont to entangle his fingers when temporarily excluded from animal society he dressed well for he had just sufficient good taste to know that his taste was bad and he delivered himself an unreasoning block of humanity into the hand of the most expensive west end tailor i don't pretend to know much about the build of the thing he said when complimented on the fashion of a new overcoat but my fellow charges me what he likes and he gets a check for his account by return of post so i suppose i'm a good customer mr lobier had a lodging in jermyn street a pied de terre he called it and it is to be set down to his credit that his french would have inflicted no outrage on ears accustomed to the pure accents of the francais the days are past in which commercial wealth and ignorance have gone hand in hand the parvenu of to-day is generally an elegant and highly accomplished gentleman who has seen everything that is to be seen and been taught everything that an expensive course of education can teach mr lobger has played cricket with young lordings on the meads of eton 
he has been plucked at oxford he had scampered over europe and improved his mind in the society of the crocodiles of the nile he had steeped himself to the lips in the worst dissipations of paris and had given as much pain and anxiety to a very worthy father as can well be concentrated in the declining years of a parent's life there were scandal mongers in the cotton country who said that thomas lobier jr had broken the heart of thomas lobier senior he was an only son an only child and the wealthy manufacturer had beguiled the dull routine of his business life by a splendid dream during the years of his son's boyhood if the boy had been a prince his education could scarcely have been more carefully supervised or paid for with a more lavish hand but conscientious tutors washed their hands of the profitable pupil when they found that he was stupid and arrogant profligate and hypocritical and that he was gifted with a bulldog obstinacy which rendered all efforts at correction hopeless the time came before the death of his father when there was no alternative but to let him go his own way i might disinherit you and leave my money to a hospital wrote the old man in the last letter he ever addressed to his son and god knows you have given me enough provocation to do so but if i could forget that you are the child of the wife i loved i should still be deterred from such a step by the fear of its consequences if you have done so badly with all the advantages of wealth what would become of your exposed to the temptations of poverty your grandfather began his life as a workhouse apprentice there are plenty of people in manchester who know all about him but there wasn't a man in his native city who wasn't proud to shake him by the hand or a woman who didn't point to him as an example to her sons thomas lobier the elder died within a few weeks after the writing of this epistle and his son who was giving a charming little dinner to some distinguished friends in the pavilion of the hotel henri cotra at st germain while his father lay dying at Penshell was summoned homeward by a telegram and arrived to find himself sole master of the accumulated fruits of two industrious lives the young man's acquaintances and neighbors his agents and advisers were loud in his praises during his brief residence at Penishal. it seemed as if the old story of prince henry's reform were going to be acted over again mr lobier detained the lawyer who had made his father's will and with that gentleman's assistance he entered into a searching investigation of his possessions he so dull to learn anything appertaining to the graces of life he so slow of intellect where the wisdom of sages or the harmonious numbers of poets were the subject of his study proved himself a match for the keenest in all that affected his interests or touched his pocket he who had been so reckless in his extravagance while drawing on the resources of a generous father astonished the family solicitor by the minuteness of his calculations the sharp economy which prompted all the changes he made in his dead father's household and the calm determination with which he announced 
that he should make a rule of only spending a third of his income during his bachelorhood i don't wonder my father was always growling about my extravagance considering the amount of money he contrived to get rid of here said the amiable young man two of the housemaids may go and two of the grooms may go one man will look after half a dozen horses in a livery stable in london and keep them in better condition than my horses are in and one man can look after the half a dozen here i shall only come down in the hunting season and i don't want to pay lazy hulking fellows for gorging themselves with meat and making themselves dropsical with beer at my expense and i don't want to pay young women for looking out of the windows and talking to them in the gardens i shall not make any changes but i must have an arrangement made with the fruiterers in the market town by which the forcing houses may be made to pay their own expenses when i marry and come to live here i shall double the household and build a new wing to the stables for i like to see plenty of fellows and horses and dogs and that kind of thing about a place but for the present we must retrench mr gibson we must retrench such was mr lobier he came to london and took his place in a certain circle of london society with nothing to recommend him but a reputation for enormous wealth there were those who remembered him in paris and who knew the manner in which he had completed his education in that brilliant capital but if there went abroad the rumor that the millionaire's youth had been wild and foolish feminine compassion and masculine generosity conspired to forget and ignore his early follies from a crowd of beautiful and intellectual women the manchester man might have chosen the loveliest and would have incurred small hazard of a refusal there were women who scorned his money as utterly as they despised himself but in the drawing-rooms of tyburnia and kensingtonia those women were few and far between the value of wealth increases with the growing refinement of taste the purest attributes of the human mind the love of art the worship of beauty the keen sense of grace combine to render intellectual man the slave of material prosperity the gems of ancient art the work of modern artists the thoroughbred hack on which beauty prances in the row the villa on stratham common or the cottage on by strawberry hill for whose shelter the soul of the retiring citizen yearns as the refuge of his declining age all command a higher price every year and every year the steady march of intellect advances and there are more connoisseurs to sigh for old pictures more would-be patrons of modern art more citizens who cultivated sense of the beautiful inspires a yearning for villas on streatham common or cottages by strawberry hill more ambitious middle-class belles who have seen from afar off the prancing of patrician beauty's steeds and who sigh for thoroughbred saddle horses of their own mr lobger himself was unattractive but in mr lobger's wealth there lurked the elements of all those costly treasures and refinements that make life beautiful he was known to be stupid 
and mercenary beauty jumping at a conclusion decided that he was just the sort of person to submit himself unresistingly to the management of a wife under the wand of the enchantress the dull figures in his banking book might be transformed into the art treasures of a second grosvenor house the gardens of a new chatsworth the estables of a lord stamford a fairy boudoir which even the empress eugenie might approve and jewels which the duchess of newcastle might admire and the duke of brunswick envy this was what portionless beauty had in her mind when she smiled on mr lobgur rich as he really was the amount of his riches was doubled and troubled by the tongue of rumor and there is really something interesting in boundless wealth for its own sake it is a kind of power and there seems to be some slavish attribute inherent in the breast of man which prompts him to fawn upon every species of power from the physical force of a ben Kant to the intellectual supremacy of a voltaire a flavor of monte cristo hovered about the person of thomas lobler and though he had never been known to say anything worth listening to or to do anything worth recording he was interesting nevertheless the men who had borrowed money from him or thought they might some day had occasion to borrow money of him said that there was a stamp of power about the fellow you know and there was something racy even in his cubbish ness you know for it isn't every fellow would have the pluck to be such a thoroughbred cub there were people who called mr lobgur genius and there always will be people who will call the giver of sumptuous dinners a noble and generous creature the man who keeps a drag for his own pleasure and allows his friends to ride upon the roof of it is likely to be considered more or less their patron and benefactor though their companionship is as indispensable to his triumph as the slaves who attend the chariot wheels of an emperor who are necessary to compete the glory of their master mr lobgur was as generous as the man who never stints the cost of his own pleasure as mean as the man who grudges the outlay of a sixpence that is not spent for his own gratification this was the individual who after inspiring alternate hope and despair in unnumbered breasts by the fickleness of his clumsy attentions succumbed at last to the piquant charm of florence crawford's bright hair and tiny retroussed nose she was insolent to him and her insolence charmed him for it surprised him and stirred the dull stagnation of his brain with a sensation that was like pleasure she laughed at him and he so keen in his perception of the weaknesses of better men than himself was weak enough to think that she alone of all the women he knew was uninfluenced by any consideration of his wealth the girls i meet make as much of me as if i were a sultan and seem to be waiting for me to throw my handkerchief amongst them said mr lobier i like that painter fellow's girl because she laughs in my face and treats me as if i were a government clerk 
with a hundred and fifty pounds a year. That's the sort of girl I call Jolly. The Sunday evening visitors at the fountains were not slow to perceive Florence Crawford's conquest. She was a coquette of the first water and encouraged her loutish admirer by a persistent avoidance of him. If he hung over her piano, she rattled brilliantly through the shortest of valses de salon, or sang the briefest and crispest of her ballads, and had risen from the instrument and flitted away, before Mr. Lobger had made up his mind as to what he should say to her. If he worked his way to the sofa on which she was seated, or the open window by which she was standing, the lively Florence immediately became absorbed in confidential discourse with a feminine visitor, and intensely unconscious of Mr. Lobger. If Florence Crawford, anxious to marry this man for the sake of his money, had acted on the most profound knowledge of his character, she could scarcely have played her cards better. A dogged obstinacy of purpose was the ruling attribute of Thomas Lobger's mind, and the coquettish trifling of a schoolgirl aroused the bulldog characteristic as it had seldom been aroused before. Miss Crawford was eager to know what Cecil Coudelet thought of her new conquest. She was childish enough to be proud of having made such a conquest. She was weak enough to be flattered by the admiration of a man whose sole title to respect was summed up in the figures in his banking book. What do you think of him, Cecil? she asked her friend. You mean Mr. Lobger? Yes, of course. I don't think he is particularly agreeable, Flory. He seems to me to be rather stupid and awkward. Oh, but he is not stupid. I hear that he has a great deal of common sense. He's rather good looking, isn't he, Cecil? I suppose he would be called so, but I don't admire his face. Oh, Flory, you surely cannot be interested in my opinion of him. Why shouldn't I be interested in your opinion of him? Flo echoed peevishly. He is good-looking and well-dressed, and by no means stupid. He may be a little clumsy, perhaps, but I have seen heavy cavalry officers quite as clumsy, and in them clumsiness is considered distingu. However, I won't talk to you about him any more, Cecil. You are as romantic as a girl in a novel. Among the witnesses of Miss Crawford's triumph was one in whom the spectacle inspired despair. Philip Foley, the landscape painter, privileged to join the miscellaneous crowd at the fountains, looked on from the shadowy corner where he sat unnoticed and little known, and ground his strong white teeth as he watched the tactics of the coquette and the hopeless entanglement of the cub. His old friend Sismond was near him, but Sismond Smythe, the novelist, was better known to fame than Philip Foley, the unsuccessful landscape painter, and some people were eager to be introduced to Mr. Smythe, and liked to talk to him for five minutes or so, after which they were apt to retire disappointed. It's no use disguising the fact, the young man said plaintively. I do not meet their views, and they don't hesitate to let me know that I'm a failure. I ought to be dark and swarthy like, Dumas, or tall and thin and wiry and hook-nosed, and satanic. What would I not give to Madame Rochelle 
if she would make me diabolical forever what recompense should i think too much for my tailor if he could build me a coat that would make me look like mephistopheles i know a literary man who is like mephistopheles and a very handsome fellow he is too but he writes essays on political economy and his demoniac appearance is of no use to him in spite of mr lobger poor philip contrived to speak to florence before he left the fountains so you are going to be married miss crawford he said who told you anything so absurd cried flo with a disdainful little laugh everybody tells me so then everybody is wrong she answered with an airy toss of her head and even if everybody were not as utterly absurd and incorrect as a stupid gossiping everybody generally is i don't see what right you have to catechize me mr folly no i forget my place i forgot that i was only here on sufferance what has an unsuccessful painter in common with the daughter of the most popular of modern artists and yet i have heard your father talk of his probation i have heard him speak of the day when he went to trafalgar square in a fever of hope and expectation to find the picture he believed in glimmering through the darkness of the octagon room an unmeaning daub of red and blue and yellow it is very good of you to remind me that papa was once a pauper answered florence haughtily and before philip could say anything more she had turned away from him to shake hands with some of her departing guests after this the young man watched in vain for any opportunity of addressing florence crawford he saw the rooms grow empty and waited with the dog determination of outstaying the cub but the cub made no sign of departure though the last of the other guests had vanished and though flo who sat in a listless attitude beside a stand of engravings had yawned audibly more than once the prince of the cotton country stood by her side stolid and unabashed pretending to be interested in the engravings which she turned with careless hands and glared at mr folly in the intervals of his conversation florence yawned for the third time and more audibly than before mr crawford who had been walking up and down the room with his hands in his pockets staring absently at the pictures and stopping before one every now and then to meditate with bent head and moody brow roused himself suddenly from the reverie and looked from the little group by the open portfolio to the spot where philip foley stood leaning against a low marble chimney-piece glum and dejected of aspect come young men said the painter my daughter seems tired so you had better bid her good night and come and smoke a cigar in my painting room florence rose and made a curtsy which included both her admirers but she did not seem to perceive mr lobger's outstretched hand nor did she deign to reward philip for the impressment with which he flew to open the door for her as she passed out of the room but when she was alone in her own room sitting before her pretty dressing table and looking at herself dreamily in the glass as she removed the slender golden necklace and glittering locket from her neck 
It was of Philip and not of Mr. Lobber that she thought. What a nice fellow he would be if he were rich, she said to herself. How frank and brave he is. I never like him so much as when he is uncivil to me. And if I were quite a different sort of girl, I can fancy that it would be very nice to marry him and live in lodgings and take an interest in his painting. But what would become of me if I were to marry such a man? I, who haven't the faintest idea of a pudding and never could sew a button on one of my muslin sleeves without spoiling half a dozen needles and making myself like a murderer with blood, I never could marry a poor man after the things I've said. I can fancy how Lucy Chamberlain and those Werner girls and Mary Masters and all the girls who know me would laugh. No, the day is past for that sort of thing, and as my heart is so free that I don't even know whether I've got a heart, and as Mr. Lobger is by no means bad-looking, and as Papa seems to like him, or at any rate, doesn't seem to dislike him i suppose it is my fate to be mistress of pen shell end of chapter ten recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter number eleven of the ladies mile this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Lady's Mile by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Chapter 11 at Nasdale. Mr. Horatio Mountjoy, the Anglo Indian judge for whom Mrs. Mc Claver House had made her little dinner, had been one of the departed general's most intimate friends, and having now returned to England to pass the rest of his days in peaceful retirement, was anxious to show all possible kindness to the general's widow. He had brought an estate in Surrey since his return, a charming old mansion of the Queen Anne period with prim gardens of the Dutch school, a noble park, and a home farm large enough to admit all the experiments of an amateur agriculturist, but not so extensive as to swamp the experimentalist's fortune. It was to this pleasant retreat that Mr. Mountjoy invited his old friend's widow and her niece. "'We are to have a very nice party,' wrote the judge's wife, and Horatio begs me to tell you that we shall expect you and dear Lady Cecil to stay till Christmas, even if our other friends grow tired of us and run away before then. I thought your niece was looking pale and ill, but the breezes from the Surrey Hills will set her up for next season. Now, that's what I call hospitality, exclaimed mrs mcclaver house but mr mountjoy always was so magnificent in his way of doing things that man has a regal mind i used to say to my husband after one of the mountjoy's calcutta dinner parties and she's a good warm-hearted soul though there's not much in her there's nothing pays so well as a long visit cecil and if the Mountjoys press us to stay till Christmas, I shall stay, for skipping about from one house to another eats into so much money in the way of travelling expenses and servants' fees that you might almost as well stop at home. Cecil could only acquiesce in her aunt's arrangement. What 
was she but the handmaiden of her kindly protectress bound to go wherever the lively dowager chose to take her and to be pleased and merry at the will of others she was very tired of her life driving through pleasant suburbs in the phantom chariot she looked with sad yearning eyes at tiny cottages enshrined in tiny gardens and thought how simple and placid existence might be in such modest habitations what happiness to be one's own mistress she thought never to be obliged to smile when one is sad or talk and laugh for the pleasure of other people if my poor father had left me a hundred a year i might have lived in such a cottage with my books and piano and a few birds and flowers i might have been good to the poor even for it is so easy for poor people to help one another i envy the dowdiest old maid who ever eat out her tiny income i envy any one and every one who can live their own lives but after indulging in such thoughts as these cecil felt ashamed of the ingratitude involved in her mute repinings was not her kinswoman good and affectionate after her own sharp fashion and was it not the dependent's duty to be pleased and satisfied with the home that sheltered her even if there was some sacrifice of freedom demanded from her cecil could have made that sacrifice without complaining if the dowager would only have let her alone but to refrain from interference with the business of other people was just one of those things which mrs mccleaver house could not do she had set her heart upon her niece making good marriage and to that end she kept watch upon every eligible bachelor who came within her ken it was in vain that cecil protested against anything like matrimonial scheming in her behalf the dowager did not hesitate to remind her of the dull dead level of poverty that lay before her in the future do you happen to remember that my pension dies with me lady cecil she demanded angrily and that i have only a wretched pittance and a collection of obsolete indian trumpetry to leave you so long as i live you will be able to keep afloat somehow in society but i should like to know what will become of you when i am gone you turn up your nose at my managing ways but it is only by management that i have contrived to keep my head above water and have my own carriage to ride in and my own maid to travel with me as for you you are no more of a manager than one of these indian idols and a landlady wouldn't dare to take half a glass of wine out of the cellaret or a spoonful of tea out of the caddy while i am alive would pilfer you out of the house and home before i'd been in my grave a month it's all very well to talk about not wishing to marry and being happy alone with your books and piano and so forth but you're not the stuff old maids are made of lady cecil the girls of the present day are not brought up to make old maids they are like the houses that the cheap builders run up that are made to sell and not to last the girls of the present day are delightful creatures but they are brought up to marry rich men and live in fine houses and be imposed upon by their servants i pity the children of the rising generation for they will have no maiden aunts to spoil them mrs mcclaver house had been shrewd enough to perceive the impression made on mr o'bonneville by her niece's attractions she knew that the barrister was rich and indeed had sounded mr crawford as to his probable income 
which was of course exaggerated by the painter who accepted the popular report of the lawyer's gains without that grain of salt with which all such reports should be taken on questioning cecil very closely respecting mr o'bonneville's call the dowager had speedily perceived that something special had distinguished it from common visits he asked my permission to call said mrs mcclaverhouse and he said quite enough to convince me that he had fallen over head and ears in love with you it's my opinion he came to make you an offer of marriage and that's why i kept out of the way but bless my heart and soul i needn't have taken the trouble for of course you refused him though i am told his income is little short of four thousand a year you are bent upon dying a homeless pauper and all i hope is that you'll have improved the casual wards of the unions before your time cecil tried to parry miss mcclaverhouse's attack but the elder lady was past mistress of the polite art of conversational fencing and she did not abandon the assault until her niece had unwillingly confessed the secret of mr o'bonneville's visit and you refused him shrieked the indignant dowager that's what i call flying in the face of providence this is the second chance you've had within two years lady cecil chandelier and i hope i may live to wish you joy of the third but i freely confess i don't expect to do so this sort of expultation is by no means pleasant to hear and poor cecil had to listen patiently to much harping on the same string she was familiar with every variation which such a theme can undergo in the hands of a skilful composer the minor wailings and lamentations the brilliant crescendos of feminine mockery the base grumblings and sharp forte passages of anger the peevish ralentados and diminuettos the unhappy girl bore it all but she suffered acutely the change to nasdell did not set her free from her aunt's lectures for considerate mrs montjoy allotted two charming bedrooms with a pretty sitting-room between them to the two ladies and here on rainy days cecil enjoyed a great deal of her aunt's society i don't want to detain you here if you'd rather be in the billiard room or making yourself sticky with decocomani among those frivolous girls in the drawing-room what regiments of girls there are in the world and what in goodness name is to become of them all i wonder exclaimed the dowager parenthetically as to the men of mount joys have collected i never saw so many married forgies gathered together in one house and the way they stuff themselves at luncheon is something dreadful tiffin indeed i'd tiffin them if they were my visitors a glass of dry cherry at thirty-five shillings a dozen and a picnic biscuit is all they'd get between breakfast and dinner from me but nasdell was a very pleasant place in spite of the elderly fogies who overate themselves at luncheon and the frivolous young ladies who devoted themselves to the decoration of cups and saucers that wouldn't bear washing and dessert plates the painted splendors of which rarely survived the ordeal of preserved ginger or guava jelly hospitality reigned supreme in the comfortable mansion people did as they liked the scenery for twenty miles round was superb and if mr mountjoy was not quite so magnificent as the nabob who ordered more curricles 
the Nassendale stables supplied plenty of horses, and the Nassendale coach houses contained every variety of modern vehicle for the accommodation of the visitors, from the omnibus which took the servants to church or the ladies to a county ball, to the miniature Croydon basket chaise and the deliciously stumpy little pony, which the most timid of the decocomanics was scarcely afraid to drive. After returning from a hurried run up to town, the judge astonished the dowager and considerably disconcerted Cecil by exclaiming in the middle of dinner, Oh, by the by, Mrs. McClever House, I met your friend O'Bonneville in London Inn today, and I asked him if he could run down for a day or two. He seems to be full of business, but when he heard you were down here, he evidently felt inclined to come. Not very flattering to me, you say. I told him of our archery meeting on the 20th, and he said, If it's possible, I'll be down in time for the archery meeting, but it's about as nearly impossible as anything human can be. Lady Cecil breathed more freely. She dreaded the appearance of her rejected suitor, and the friendly persecution to which his coming would inevitably expose her. But when the two ladies retired to their room that night, the dowager cried triumphantly, Oh, if Mr. O'Bonneville is as much in earnest as I think he is, he'll come to the archery meeting, Cecil, and I do hope if he renews his offer, you'll be wise enough to accept it. The archery meeting of which the judges had spoke was to be a very grand affair, and the young ladies at Nasdell had made their fingers sore and their shoulders weary with the twanging of bows. The meeting was to take place on a noble plateau at the top of the noblest range of hills in all Surrey, and all the fun of a picnic was to be combined with the excitement of a toxovillity contest. We might have had our archery meeting in the park, said the judge, when he explained to his guests the arrangements he had made for their pleasure. But to my mind, half the fun of these things is the going and returning. The officers of the 14th are to drive over from Burtonslow to meet us, and I've invited all sorts of people from town. I won't say anything about the two prizes I selected at Hunt and Rosekell's this morning, but I hope my taste will please the ladies who win them. Cecil did not affect the twanging of bows, and was content to remain amongst the young ladies who, after vainly endeavoring to hit the bull's-eye and losing their arrows in distant brushwood without having so much as grazed the outermost edge of the target, retired from the contest and declared that there was nothing so very exciting in archery after all, and that croquet was twenty times better. Amongst these milder spirits Cecil beguiled the fine summer afternoons with that gentle tapping of wooden balls and liberal display of high-heeled boots, which is the favorite dissipation of modern damsels, and thus, amid quiet pleasures, with a good deal of riding and driving, and novel reading and billiard playing, and much good eating and drinking, time glided by at Nasdell until the 19th, and as yet there were no signs of the Queen's Council. If O'Bonneville had meant to be amongst us to-morrow, he'd have made his appearance by this time, said the judge in the course of dinner. He knows we start early to-morrow morning. I can't fancy O'Bonneville at the picnic, said a listless young gentleman, 
who was amongst the new arrivals. I can't fancy him anywhere except in the law courts. One sometimes meets him at men's dinners, but he never seems to enjoy himself unless he can talk shop, and he looks at the other fellows as if they'd like to cross-examine them. The usual meanderings on the terrace outside the drawing-room windows with which the younger members of the Nasdell party were wont to beguile the warm summer evenings were impossible tonight, for at nine o'clock a violent clap of thunder shook the roofs and chimney of the old mansion, and pretty little feminine shriekings and screechings fluttered the tranquillity of the party. The young ladies who were not afraid of the lightning made a merit of not being afraid, and the young ladies who were afraid made a merit of being horribly frightened and shivered and started in the most bewitching manner a sight of every flash. And one young lady who had written a volume of poetry in which a weak solution of L.E.L. was artfully intermingled with a still weaker solution of Mrs. Browning, stood before a window and exclaimed about the grandeur and sublimity of the spectacle. Cecil, sitting quietly at work under a reading lamp, was rather rejoiced when she heard the violent downpour of rain which succeeded the storm. Mr. O'Bonneville will scarcely come tonight, at any rate, she thought. There was a great deal of lamentation about the rain, and considerable discussion as to whether it augured ill or well for tomorrow. It was a blessing to get the storm over, but then the grass would be damp, most likely, and so on. The young ladies thought of their delicate boots, their dainty dresses. My hat cost two guineas and a half, murmured one damsel, to a sympathizing confidant. A ruche of peacock's feathers, you know, dear, and the sweetest mother-of-pearl butterfly, and a tiny, tiny green chenille bird's nest, with three gold eggs in it, at the side, and one shower of rain would utterly spoil it. The rain came thicker and faster, nothing short of a hurricane would serve to dry the grass after such a storm. But Cecil did not think of the picnic. She only congratulated herself upon the improbability that Mr. O'Bonneville would care to travel in such weather. No chance of O'Bonneville, said Mr. Mountjoy, as he stood before the fire which he had ordered to be lighted since the advent of the rain. I told him to write and announce his coming, so that I might send a vehicle over to the station to meet him. It's a ten-mile drive, you know, and there's very seldom so much as a fly to be had at that miserable little station. However, the last London post is in, and there's no letter from O. Bonneville. The pattering of the rain against the windows made itself heard in every pause of the conversation, and the noise of the pelting drops grew louder every moment. Cecil was still bending quietly over her work in a cosy corner near the angle of the wide velvet-covered mantelpiece, and the judge's guests had gathered in a circle about the cheery fire when the bell of the great hall door rang loudly. Who the deuce can that be, and at this time of such a night? cried Mr. Mountjoy. Whoever he is, he is the owner of a tolerably strong arm, and he knows how to make his arrival public, said one of the listless visitors. The drawing-room opened out of the hall and in the silence that followed the clamor of the bell, Mr. Mountjoy and his visitors heard the opening of the ponderous door, the rapid ascents of a sonorous bass voice asking questions, 
and a fluttering sound which resembled the noise made by an enormous Newfoundland dog, who shakes himself dry after emerging from the water. There was a pause of some ten minutes, and then the drawing-room door was thrown open, and the servant announced, Mr. O'Bonneville. I thought as much, said the dowager in an undertone, which was intended only for the ear of her niece. The barrister made his appearance, a little damp and weather-strained in spite of the hurried toilet he had made since entering the house, but with the freshness of the open air upon him and the aspect of a man whose heart is aglow with triumph. He received the cordial welcome of his host, shook hands with the people he knew, offered a big cold paw to Cecil as coolly as if there had been nothing out of the common in their last parting, showing his white teeth, laughed at nothing particular, till every crystal drop in the old-fashioned chandelier shivered and trembled, and, in short, made more noise in five minutes than the rest of the party had made in the whole of the evening. Yes, it certainly isn't the nicest weather for traveling, he said, in reply to his host's eager inquiries. But you see, I said I'd come if it was possible, and here I am. I was on a committee in Victoria Street at half-past five, took a hansom and told the man to drive to Bunswick Square, like wildfire, packed my portmanteau, and put on my dress coat while the man waited, drove to the Oriental Club, and left my portmanteau with the porter while I dined with the Governor-General of Seringpatam, rose from the table at a quarter before nine, borrowed a railway rug from one of the waiters, and caught the nine o'clock train at Waterloo, found myself an hour after at a little station where there was one deaf porter and no vehicle of any description whatever, had considerable difficulty in getting anything at all out of the deaf porter, but finally extracted the pleasing intelligence that Nasdale was a good ten miles, and that, barring Joe Cole's own bay mare at the Pig and Whistle, there wasn't an animal of any kind to be had within a mile and a half. Of course, after hearing this, the best thing was to get John Cole's bay mare, and fine work I had with John Cole before he would let me have the beast which he keeps for his own pleasure and convenience, and which has never been ridden or driven by man or boy, except himself since he brought her at Barnet Fair, six years come next October. However, when he saw that I meant to have the animal, whether he liked it or not, and when he heard where I was coming, he made a virtue of necessity and brought her out, and here I am, and I think, my dear Montjoy, of all the lanes I ever had the pleasure of beholding, the lanes between this place and the station are the muddiest, and of all the rain that ever reduced the civilized universe to pulp and slop, the rain I came through tonight has been the heaviest. After this, Mr. O'Bonneville took possession of the company, as it was his wont to take possession of any assemblage in which he happened to find himself. He went into society very rarely, and the laws of society had very little restraint for him. He could talk well, and he knew that he could talk well. The necessities of his professional career had obliged him to possess himself of a superficial knowledge of every subject and some smattering of almost every science. A native audacity did the rest, and a frank bonhomie of manner, a slapdash mode of expression, 
which was too original to be vulgar, won the suffrages of people who would have tabooed a smaller man for lesser sins against conventionality than those which were permitted in Mr. O'Bonneville. He talked well, and like most good talkers, he very often talked nonsense, for the man who weighs his sentences before he utters them, who pauses to consider the force of an argument before he launches it, is rarely a brilliant conversationalist, and sometimes he seems as if the brightest creatures of the brain are those epihermal and unconsidered trifles which a man utters haphazard in the heat of argument or the abandonment of purposeless small talk. Posterity values Samuel Johnson rather for the happy sayings of a convenial evening than for the ponderous polysyllables of his most carefully considered compositions. A silver saver bearing a monster tankard of mulled claret was brought into the drawing-room before the assembly dispersed and in the diversion afforded by the handing about of the wine mr bonneville contrived to seat himself between cecil and her aunt and after artfully conciliating the elder lady he drew his chair near to the little table by which the younger sat absorbed in her work. "'You don't know what difficulty I had to get here tonight, Lady Cecil,' he said, "'and it was only because you are here that I came. "'Then I am very sorry you should have come,' answered Cecil gravely. "'Are you still so hard-hearted? "'Mr. O'Bonneville, it is a gentlemanly act, to follow me here where i have no power to avoid you and to talk to me in this manner if you come here for your own pleasure to make one of an agreeable party i am happy to see you as any one else in this house can be but if you come here to persecute me by attentions which are as ungentlemanly as they are foolish i shall beg my aunt to take me away from this house to-morrow morning the barrister looked at her pale proud face with an expression of profound sorrow that will do lady cecil he said that is quite enough i thought what you said the other day might mean only a lady's negative I thought I was too abrupt, that I surprised and offended you by my way of plunging into the subject, and so on. But I see now that I was mistaken. Good night, Lady Cecil. I shall never offend you again. He held out his hand, but he scarcely clasped her slender fingers as they rested for one brief moment in his expansive palm. The sadness in his voice, the sorrowful expression of his face, had touched her, and she felt the natural womanly desire to heal the wounds she herself had inflicted. But before she could think of anything to say, which should in some degree console the Irishman's wounded feelings, yet in no matter embolden him to renew his attack, Mr. O'Bonneville had left her, and was bidding his host good night. Lady Cecil had to endure a lecture from her aunt before she shut herself in her own room that night, and when she went to bed it was to think compassionately of the Irish barrister's sorrow, and while she pitied him, Mr. O'Bonneville settled himself complacently to his placid slumber and mused upon the evening's adventures as he fell asleep. You are very haughty, and you're very resolute, but you'll marry me sooner or later, for all that, my bright Cecil, 
my beautiful Cecil. It isn't possible for a man to be as much in earnest as I am, and yet wind up by making a failure. End of chapter 11 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 12 of The Ladies' Mile. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Lady's Mile by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Mr. O'Bonneville's Motion for a New Trial. The Naysdale Picnic, or the Naysdale Archery Meeting, was a success, but it may be that the noble supply of sparkling wines, the gorgeous banquet of delicate viands set forth under a spacious marquee, contributed as much as the excitement of the toxophilite contest to the gaiety of the day. Mr. O. Bonneville forgot his profession and behaved as if he had spent the greater part of his existence at toxophilite meetings and picnics. Cecil heard more than one young lady declare that the Irishman was the life of the party, and she had reason to be grateful to him for his delicate avoidance of her, even though her good taste might compel her to condemn his too obvious flirtation with more than one fair damsel in Lincoln Green. But if Cecil was glad to be released from the attention of the Queen's Council, Cecil's aunt was by no means pleased with the altered aspect of affairs. She glowered upon the unconscious O'Bonneville from the distance whence she watched his proceedings, and was snappishly disposed towards the young ladies with whom he had flirted whenever they happened to cross her path. Once only in the course of the day had she any opportunity of addressing her niece confidentially, and then her manner assumed its bitterest shade. "'I hope you are satisfied now, Lady Cecil Chundelay, she said, and at night, when the long day's festivities and flirtation and archery and croquet and dust and sunshine had at length come to a close, Mrs. MacClaver House was eager to attack her dependent, but Cecil stopped her at the first word. "'Pray do not say any more about this business, Auntie,' she said in a quiet, resolute tone." If you are angry with me because I am unwilling to marry Mr. O'Bonneville, whom you wish me to marry only because he is rich, I must submit to your anger and leave you. I will not stop with you to be persecuted upon such a subject, and if I have displeased you, I can only thank you for all your past goodness to me and bid you good-bye." If people ever said hoity-toity, Mrs. McClaver House was just in the humor to have indulged in such an ejaculation, but she contented herself with exclaiming, Well, I am sure. The young women of the present day fly in a passion if you venture to say an unpleasant word to them. The world is moving on at a nice pace, upon my word. I wonder what the children of the rising generation will be like, and how they'll treat their mothers and aunts. I suppose they'll take the story of the Grecian daughter out of those children's story books, and supply its place with the obedient father, or the dutiful grandmother, or parental submission, or something of that kind. You may go to bed, Lady Cecil and since you are bent upon ending your days as an indoor pauper, you must go your own way, and I wash my hands of all responsibility. The dowager carried matters with a high hand, but Cecil had vanquished her nevertheless, 
and though Mr. O'Bonneville had left Nasdell before the family met at the breakfast table, Mrs. McClaver House forbore to bewail his departure in her niece's presence. He had gone, but when his circuit work was over, he came back again, and made himself a favorite with all the household. He had his own little study, and he had some of the judge's law books carried thither for his use. He spent three or four hours every morning in hard work, and for the rest of the day was the life of the party, talking, arguing, disputing, putting down listless visitors, and laughing at his great ha-ha laugh at their discomfiture, cross-examining pretentious talkers, and bringing them to shame, flattering frivolous matrons, expounding great political theories with much flourishing of his white hands, delighting the Anglo-Indian judge by respectful attention to his anecdotes, offending and pleasing people a hundred times a day, and making himself the principal figure in every group, his voice the ruling voice in every discussion. And in all this time Lady Cecil had no reason to complain of his presence. He was true to the quiet tone of resignation with which he had received her reproof on the first night of his coming to Nasdell. If he addressed her now, it was as nearly in the ordinary tone of polite society as was possible to this rough diamond of the British law courts. Nor did he in any special manner seek her society. Mrs. McClaver House sniffed ominously as she watched the eligible bachelor's attentions to other young ladies, while Cecil sat unnoticed and apparently forgotten by her late admirer but the dowager refrained from remonstrance and only allowed stray allusions to the horrors of genteel pauperism and the miserable destiny of the unprotected female to crop up now and then in her confidential talk with her niece and cecil was satisfied she had subdued her aunt and had freed herself from the unwelcome attentions from an audacious adorer. She was inclined to feel kindly disposed towards Mr. O'Bonneville now, that he no longer presented himself before her in the absurd position of a lover. She was able to appreciate his cleverness now that her aunt no longer harped upon the amount of his income. She owned to herself that many a girl in her position would have been glad to accept the hand and heart of this stalwart, good-looking, loud-voiced Irishman. She grew accustomed to his noisy laugh, his boisterous gaiety, his energetic declamation, his animal spirits in this rare holiday time made him as boisterous as an overgrown schoolboy and there is always something pleasant in the fresh joyousness of a schoolboy in the abstract however obnoxious that member of society may make himself in the concrete lady cecil who had begun by thinking lawrence o'bonneville the most unpleasant of men came to consider him as a person whose friendship at least was worth possessing he had spent a week at nasdell talking every morning of leaving before night and lingering day after day until the week was out but at last he announced his departure so positively that to have changed his mind after such an announcement would have been a weakness unworthy a man of business a vacancy had arisen in a certain northern borough and some of mr o'bonneville's friends had persuaded him to allow himself to be put in nomination to linger longer in that garden of armida called nasdale would be to endanger this new ambition everybody was loud in lamentation of his departure with the exception of those younger and more superciliously indifferent gentlemen 
whom he had made a point of annihilating once or twice in the course of every evening the feminine portion of the community was not behind hand in the expression of regret the young ladies declared they should miss mr o'bonneville terribly awfully one rather fast young lady went so far as to say disgustingly had he not appointed himself the umpire of their toxophilite matches had he not learned the whole art of croquet in half an hour and then insisted on playing after a fashion of his own whereby he had split a dozen or so of walnut wood balls in a week had he not thrown them into convulsions of laughter one evening by conducting a mock trial of a case of breach of promise the broken pledge being that of a botanically disposed young gentleman who had promised to go out for a woodland ramble with three botanically disposed young ladies and had gone partridge shooting instead was he not the most delightful middle-aged creature in existence and not so dreadfully middle-aged either for he could scarcely be forty and what is forty but the prime of life and the meridian of intellectual splendor to each discourse as this cecil had to listen during the rainy morning which succeeded mr o'bonneville's departure the feminine assembly in the pretty old-fashioned painted drawing-room enlivened the labors of decomani and berlin wool-work with their praises of the departed barrister the matrons were as enthusiastic as their daughters of all partners at whist there was no one they had ever met so invincible as mr o'bonneville although he had declared that he had not handed a card since his boyhood and then he was so unlike the young man who called a middle-aged lady a venerable party and a sober married man a dozy old bird and then and then and then there seemed no end to the feminine laudation of lawrence o'bonneville only two ladies in that assembly were silent and those two were cecil chaudelet and mrs mcclaverhouse but an occasional impatient sniff from the dowager gave evidence of her state of mind he was gone and every one was loud in his praise he was gone and though cecil chaudelet had only been accustomed to his presence within the last six or seven days the place seemed to her just a little dull and empty without him and she was fain to confess to herself that she as well as the others missed the sound of his sonorous voice the gaiety of his boisterous laugh and from thinking of the departed queen's council she went on by some indefinable train of thought to pondering upon the dull blank life of spinisterhood and poverty that lay before her to muse a little sadly upon the text of all her aunt's sermons her lonely helplessness her penniless dependence the presence was well enough so long as it lasted she was happy or at any rate content even though the dowager's temper grew sharper and the dowager's tongue more bitter every day she was resigned to the prospect of alternating between dorset square and watering places and other people's houses for the rest of her life but there were times when her pride revolted against the whole scheme of her existence and a vision of the future arose before her blank and terrible she was such an unnecessary creature such a mere waif and stray to be drifted hither and thither on every tide which carried her kinswoman a lady's maid without a lady's maid's wages a slave without a slave's apathy perhaps my aunt is right after all she thought bitterly and i have been foolish to throw away any chance that would have given me release from such an existence 
the day was wet and dull and miserable the sort of day so harmoniously described in mr longfellow's poem the dead leaves fell from the dripping trees in the park and the splash of rain upon the terrace made a monotonous accompaniment to conversation the gentlemen of the household had defined jupiter pluvis and had set off at early morning provided with waterproof garments and the clumpiest of shooting boots to wage war upon innocent young partridges in stubble and turnip field but they came home at three and after a tremendous luncheon and a careful toilet presented themselves in the drawing-room where they proposed an immediate adjournment for a game of billiards the young ladies were delighted to accept the invitation two or three good-natured matrons consented to join the party while less vivacious dames discovered suddenly that they had important letters to write in their own rooms which important correspondence was popularly supposed to be the ladylike excuse for an after luncheon nap mrs mcclaver house was among the matrons who retired to her apartment i suppose you'll come upstairs to have some tea at six lady cecil she said to her niece whom she had addressed in this ceremonious manner through the visit of mr o'bonneville but you'll come and play lady cecil cried one of the young ladies no thank you dear i too have got some letters to write i don't believe a bit in people's letters exclaimed the impetuous young damsel letter writing in country houses is nothing but an excuse for being unsociable isn't it dear mrs mountjoy if i were you i'd put up an inscription over my hall door no letters to be written on any pretense whatever i would do away with the post bag and oblige my visitors to correspond with friends at a distance by electric telegraph after which the lively damsel skipped off with her arm encircling her dear mrs mountjoy's waist and cecil found herself alone in the drawing-room of course she had letters to write if she found herself equal to the labor of writing them where is the civilized being who can honestly declare that he or she has wronged no man in the matter of neglected correspondence cecil was deeply in debt to a half dozen lively friends who wrote her long descriptions of the places where they were staying and were eager to receive her account of the place where she was staying and the people whom she met there she was in debt to flo who sent her voluminous epistles from brighton with pen and ink sketches of eccentric costumes to be seen on the king's road and caricatures of mr lobier in divers attitudes he passed the greater part of his existence on the brighton railway flo told her friend and if the brighton line were not the best in england the unhappy being would be reduced to a state of imbecility by the effects of railway travelling added miss crawford cecil meant to write her letters before the first dinner bell rang but when the billiard players had left her she sank into a luxurious easy chair by the fire and sat looking dreamily at the red coals she was in one of those melancholy moods which came upon a woman sometimes without any tangible reason but which are not the less sad because their sadness is vague and intangible for the moment she abandoned herself utterly to sorrowful musings the past that shadowy past which always comes back to the gayest of us with a sorrowful aspect returned to cecil as she brooded over the low neglected fire her father her mother the loved and lost whose faces had once made the solo brightness of her life looked at her once more out of the shadows 
she thought of what her life might have been if her father's fortune had never been wasted before her sad eyes arose the picture of the home that might have been hers if her only brother had lived to mend his wild ways and hold his own among honest men i should never have felt this bitter sense of loneliness if my brother had been my protector she thought there is something in my aunt's kindness even when she is most kind that reminds me how little right i have to her love or protection abandoned to such melancholy thoughts as these cecil kept little note of the progress of time a servant came into the room to replenish the fire but his coming and going did not arouse her from her sombre reverie the dull afternoon sky grew duller and her thoughts grew sadder as the sky darkened a bell rang but she took no heed of its ringing what was it to her who came and went in the utter solitude of her life there was no room for care for there was no one upon earth except her aunt whose fate was in any way involved with her own she heard a rapid footstep in the hall a hand turning the handle of the door and she shrugged her shoulders impatiently knowing that she would have to put aside her sorrowful thoughts to smile upon the intruder she looked up as the door opened and it was with unmitigated astonishment that she beheld lawrence o'bonneville mr o'bonneville i thought you had left us for good and so i had lady cecil as i thought but there are some places or rather some people whom it is very difficult to leave i have been to london got through a gigantic day's business made arrangements for starting on my parliamentary work to-morrow instead of to-day and have come back here for an hour for an hour echoed cecil yes answered the barrister taking out his watch and comparing it with the clock on the mantelpiece it's now half past five by me though it's only a quarter past by my friend mistopheles and the ivy leaves at seven thirty six the up train leaves that miserable shed called desborough station i was lucky enough to get a fly this time and the antiquated vehicle is waiting for me i fear mr mountjoy has gone out said cecil who imagined that her late admirer must needs have some important business to transact with his host since only some affair of importance could have brought him back so hurriedly but you will find almost everybody in the billiard room and no doubt some one there will be able to tell you where he is you are very good but i don't want to see mr mountjoy you don't no mr o'bonneville was on the verge of saying not a haporth but he substituted not in the least in fact i am very grateful to the dear old fellow for being out of the way i have come back to see you lady cecil there was a little pause cecil could find nothing to say the sense of mr o'bonneville's power subjugated her as she had never before been subjugated she was like the weakest of little birds who was ever spellbound by the gaze of a monster serpent whether it was animal magnetism whether it was the intellectual force of a dominant will she never knew from first to last she knew only that lawrence o'bonneville exercised an influence over her which no other living creature had ever exercised and that she was powerless to resist his dominion the irishman seated himself and drew his chair close to hers cecil he said why should we trifle with our destiny in the first hour in which i saw you something told me that you were to be my wife 
and in pursuing you I have only obeyed the voice of my fate. I am not a romantic man, and the current of my life has taken its course between the most arid and blossomless shores that border the great river, but some remnant of my national superstition clings to me still, and from the first moment in which I looked upon you, I felt that you were something more to me than the crowds of pretty women whose faces have floated past me like the faces of a dream. You have thought me insolent, presumptuous. Believe me, Lady Cecil, I have been neither. It has been no confidence in my own merits that has me been so bold. I have been been bold only because i believed in my fate when i came here i came at peril of hopes that had once been the brightest part of my life the man whose dinner table i left unceremoniously to come to this house is a man who can raise me to the bench i to whom social life is almost as strange as it would be to an obijue have wasted a week in knocking about wooden balls and holding bad hands at long whist and i have done this because i wanted to be near you lady cecil i know from the first that you were intended to be my wife and that it rested with me alone to win you cecil dear cecil are you going to fly in the face of your destiny these were the tenderest words he had ever addressed to her. His voice, practiced in every transition, sank to its most melodious tones as he uttered these last words. Perhaps there is some magnetic power in such a voice. Cecil, looking up at the earnest face that was bent towards hers, felt herself subdued by some wondrous fascination and knew that she had found her master. Had he wooed her at any other moment, it might have been different. But he came to her in an interval of depression, which had subdued her courage and crushed her pride. Never had the dull stagnation of her life seemed to her so dull and hopeless as it had seemed to-day. Never had the prospect of the future appeared so utterly blank and empty. Her aunt's sermonizing, her sense of loneliness, her yearning desire for some change in the routine of her profitless life all conspired to strengthen the cause of Mr. O'Bonneville. Cecil, are you going to send me away again? Suppose I do not believe in your fatalistic theory she asked with a faint attempt at a laugh your incredulity will not help you what is it the turks say kismet it is written you are to be my wife lady cecil it is only a question of time and why should we waste time in discussion sooner or later the hour of victory will come cecil you thought me an pertinent fool when i first told you of my love you know me better now and you must know that i am in earnest i have kept myself aloof from you during the last week in order to show you that i can obey you if i disobey you in coming back to-day it is because i obey my fate which is stronger than you Mr. O'Bonneville had composed this little speech during his downward journey and was rather inclined to be proud of it. Cecil, what is to be my answer? For some moments Lady Cecil was silent, her head averted from Mr. O'Bonneville, her eyes looking dreamily at the fire. She was so lonely, so unprotected, and here was this man whose intellectual power impressed her with a sense of protection and support. Here was this man whom she had scorned and rejected once more at her side, too faithful to accept repulse, 
still eager to give her shelter and affection to lift her from the dreary uncertainty of her position into woman's most fitting sphere an hour ago and she had felt herself so utterly friendless and now here were the love and devotion of a lifetime lying at her feet to be gain rejected if she pleased it seemed almost as if providence taking compassion upon her loneliness had thrown this one last chance her way her voice trembled a little as she answered her lover i do not know what i have done to deserve your love she said but i suppose love never yet was measured by desert i do know that i cannot give you what the world calls love in return the only person i ever loved left me to marry another woman he left me because it was his duty to do so and i was proud of him because he was so good and true he is married now and i have every reason to believe he is happy there is little chance that he and i will ever meet again but if we do we shall meet as strangers it was my bounden duty to tell you this mr o'bonneville before i answered your last question has my confession altered your sentiments toward me no lady cecil it has only made me admire you a little more than i did before do you think i expected to win the whole heart of such a woman as you all at once no cecil when a man loves the woman he marries as truly as i love you it must be his own fault if he does not teach her to love him before the end of the chapter always provided she is a good woman and you still offer me your affection i do as heartily and unreservedly as i offered it to you in the first instance and you will be my friend my protector my counsellor all the wide world to me for i am very friendless and will be contented with such gratitude and such affection as a woman gives to the best and dearest friend she has on earth more than content unutterably happy cried lawrence o'bonneville and by jove it's a quarter to six and it's as much as i shall do to catch the up train he added in his most business-like manner as he started to his feet he only lingered long enough to take lady cecil in his arms as if she had been a baby to imprint one resounding kiss upon her forehead and to exclaim god bless you and good-bye my darling and lo he was gone and i shall have a friend a husband and a protector a home thought cecil with a thrill of happiness such as she would a few hours before have been slow to believe could have been inspired by lawrence o'bonneville she was glad to be bound to some one to have some one bound to her glad to be the promised wife of this irish barrister whom she had so lately spoken of shudderingly as a dreadful man End of chapter twelve recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter thirteen of the ladies mile this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the ladies mile by mary elizabeth braden chapter thirteen cecil's honeymoon before the end of the year cecil chandelay had become cecil o'bonneville the barrister was not a man to lose time in making himself master of the citadel that had capitulated 
and having once obtained cecil's consent to be his wife he moved heaven and earth to bring about a speedy marriage the powers that be were in this instance represented by mrs mcclaver house and the mountjoys the dowager was delighted to marry her penniless niece to a man who confessed that his professional income was over two thousand a year and that he had invested between ten and fifteen thousand in certain very profitable railway chairs the interest of which he was prepared to settle upon lady cecil during his lifetime while the principal would be hers at his death the mountjoys and all the nasdell visitors were delighted by the idea of a wedding and young ladies who had heard of cecil's engagement from mrs mountjoy and were anxious to disport themselves as bridesmaids besieged the poor girl with entreaties and bewildered her with their praises of mr o'bonneville against so much friendly persuasion with the mighty o'bonneville swooping down upon her suddenly by all manner of express trains and by every complication of loop-line and junction cecil was powerless to make any successful resistance she had promised to be his wife she was grateful for his affection and she looked forward with a sense of relief to the marriage which was at least to be the end of her dependence and then lawrence o'bonneville's influence was not without its weight from the hour in which cecil had promised to be his wife his power over her had grown stronger with every moment she spent in his society the strength of will which had carried him triumphantly over all the obstacles in his path sustained him here the singleness of his purpose the depth of his feeling invested him with a kind of dignity that come bind force of a strong will and brilliant intellect had a almost magnetic influence over cecil if she did not love her future husband she at least felt that it was something to be loved by such a man and the strong current of his will drifted her along with it walking in the avenue of nasdell under a dull october sky with her hand under lawrence o'bonneville's arm and inspired with some vague sense of protection by the stalwart figure that sheltered her from the autumn wind cecil consented that the wedding should take place early in november she could not oppose her lover's wishes from the moment in which she had accepted his devotion mr o'bonneville had in a manner taken possession of her judgment and her will and it mattered little when he claimed her entirely for his own you are so good lawrence she said once and i have such a sense of protection in your presence that i sometimes fancy you are like a new father to me indeed you have more influence over me than my father had though i loved him very very dearly i suppose it is because your will is so much stronger than his mr o'bonneville nodded and pressed the little hand resting on his arm another man of forty engaged to a woman of twenty-two might have been slightly disconcerted by cecil's speech but lawrence had implicit faith in the divine right of honest love and in his thoughts there was no shadow of fear for the future i must be a fool indeed if i can't teach her to love me loving her as i do he thought backwards and forwards by loop line and junction by midnight express and morning mail 
rushing through the chill mists and fogs of autumnal dawn sped mr o'bonneville all through the bleak october he took his rest in snug corners of railway carriages and lived upon sandwiches peppery soups and adulterated coffee his electioneering business went on as smoothly as his love suit and provincial electors yielded readily to the beguiling accents of the hibernian candidate but the candidate's heart was at nasdale and he sacrificed his parliamentary ambition to his love for cecil he made light of two or three hundred miles of cross-country travelling if thereby he could obtain a quiet day with his future wife to walk with her in the long avenue to stand with his back to the fire talking to her as she bent over her work to drive her in a male phantom with a couple of merry girls in the back seat and a pair of the most unimaginable horses in the judge's stables devouring the road before him these things delighted the man who had spent the best years of his life amidst the clamour of law courts and the dull quiet of dingy chambers there was very little in common between himself and the woman he loved but he had that dash of romance which the hardest friction of a practical existence cannot entirely obliterate from the composition of an irishman and he was really and truly in love so one misty morning in november the bells pealed gaily from the village church whose norman tower loomed dark above the leafless woods of nasdale park and the nasdale servants were gay and busy it was to be a quiet wedding cecil had been earnest in her entreaties that there might be no unnecessary trouble incurred by her cordial friends but the childless mountjoys were as pleased as if they had been arranging a daughter's marriage ceremonial i shall be quite angry if you talk about trouble my dear cecil said the kind-hearted hostess here have horatio and i been puzzling our brains to find out something or another to enliven the house in this wretched weather and just at the very time when we were most at loss for amusement and occupation this marriage of yours happens to afford us both you don't know what it is my dear to have nine marriageable girls in a home with only three unmarried men and those three more listless and lazy and stupid than words can describe or you wouldn't talk of giving trouble all i dread is the reaction which we shall suffer when it's all over and you and mr o'bonneville have gone to ireland thus it happened that although it had been promised that the wedding should be a private one the program of the day grew to an alarming extent before the day arrived the officers who had assisted at the archery meeting were invited to the breakfast much to the delight of the nine young ladies and much to the aggravation of the three listless young gentlemen who gave utterance to the most crushing sarcasms when the martial visitors were alluded to and affected to consider the profession of arms entirely incompatible with the faintest scintillation of intelligence or the smallest modium of education yes drawled the most listless of the listless ones captain hardup is a remarkably fine fellow 
of course it's a great merit in a man to be six foot two and three quarters and a merit which society is bound to recognize but did anybody ever hear the captain read or did anybody ever see the captain write it's my belief that the greatest pull the jew bill discounters have over their military customers lies in the fact that they witness the agonies which the martial mind experiences in the process of signing its name and it's also my belief that when a cavalry officer takes up the times and throws it down again exclaiming ha nothing in the papers today i suppose he does so simply because he can't read of course mr o'bonneville happening to overhear some such speech as this arose in his might and crushed the scorner proving that from the days of caesar whom in the excitement of argument he called caesar to the time of the conqueror of waterloo soldiers had been even more renowned for the power of their intellect than for the prowess of their arms and that the helmet and buckler of minerva were only typical of the fact that from the earliest period of history wisdom and valor had gone hand in hand through the misty november morning went the train of carriages to the little church where mr o'bonneville awaited his bride after spending the night on loop line and at junction and after making a hurried toilet at the village inn there was no rain only a soft autumnal mist which took the fresh crispness out of tall bonnets and the artificial undulations out of feminine bandeau but the wedding was a success in spite of the weather there was no weeping during the ceremonial and it was only when the dowager kissed her niece in the vestry that one solitary teardrop glistened in each of that matron's piercing eyes the bridegroom was in the highest spirits though in the midst of his gaiety a very close observer if such people ever were to be found in a wedding party might have detected an undercurrent of deeper feeling near akin to tears there was the usual monument of crystallized sugar and silver foliage and artificial orange blossom the usual combination of the savory solidity of fortnum and mason with the airy frivolity and bilious sweetness of gunter the usual popping of corks and pleasant sound of frozen liquids trickling into cool fragile glasses the usual protestations from young ladies who infinitely preferred tea or coffee to sparkling hawk or moselle but who overcome by masculine persuasion generally ended by drinking the latter the usual open renunciation of her sex from the one fast lady generally to be found in every party who always happens to sit next and who tells him confidentially that she likes sparkling moselle and doesn't believe in the girls who pretend not to like it nor could the breakfast reasonably be expected to come to an end without a little speechifying the judge in a few appropriate well-rounded sentences invoked for his guests all those impossible blessings which it is the fashion to pray for at a wedding breakfast while in the heat of returning thanks for these good wishes mr o'bonneville was betrayed into speaking of his host as 
his ludship, and on more than one occasion addressed his audience as ladies and gentlemen of the jury, and by and by appeared the traditional chariot and post horses, driven by that blue and antique postillion who seems to emerge from the shadows of the past only on such occasions and then there was a little animated flirtation in the hall among the nine unmarried young ladies and the cavalry officers while the listless young gentlemen looked on with countenances expressive of unutterable scorn and elderly anglo-indian merchants and lawyers and red-faced anglo-indian colonels and majors gathered comfortably round their host at one end of the long table in the dining-room telling old anglo-indian stories and laughing at old anglo-indian jokes in due time lady cecil came down the broad old-fashioned staircase dressed in a pale gray silk and wearing an airy bonnet that seemed constructed solely with a gray feather and a large full-blown blush rose while the handsomest of her aunt's indian shawls draped her slender figure like a classic mantle of scarlet and gold mrs mccleverhouse had insisted upon her niece wearing this shawl and no other it's the last but one that stupid extravagant hector sent me and if i know anything about indian shawls i know that this one must have cost him something like a hundred guineas and as i am not rich enough to buy you a wedding present you must take this cecil though why the fact of a person being married should oblige the other people to half ruin themselves in the purchase of bracelets and dressing cases is more than i can understand however that has nothing to do with you and me cecil i am your aunt and your nearest living relative so it would be hard indeed if i couldn't give you something and if you don't take hector's shawl i shall be very much offended and mind you don't go wasting your husband's money on trumpery dresden china for when i'm dead and gone you'll have more mandarin jars and carved ivory chessmen and inlaid caskets and envelope boxes then you'll know what to do with whereupon mrs mcclaverhouse kissed her niece and shed one more solitary tear which she brushed away sharply and followed the bride down the staircase and so it happened that cecil went to her husband wrapped in the shawl which hector gordon had chosen in calcutta three years before the traditionary chariot and post horses drove away amidst a volley of cheers and the very fast young lady who was rather proud of her foot launched a fairy bronze boot into the air as the bridal chariot departed the heel of which fairy boot coming in contact with the eyebrow of one of the listless gentlemen inflicted a blow that ultimately resulted in that vulgar appearance of mingled blues and greens which is popularly described as a black eye the last which the nasda party saw of the bride and bridegroom was mr o'bonneville's radiant face at the carriage window and mr o'bonneville's big white hand waving a parting salutation and then the irishman realized the fondest desire of his later years he went back to the land of his youth and with his young wife by his side trod once more the
the country of his birth he had consulted cecil's wishes as to that honeymoon tour but as he had previously revealed his own yearning for a glimpse of his native town the river and mountains so familiar to his childhood she set aside all thought of her own inclination let us go to ireland she said i know you wish to see your own country once more and it will be all new ground to me you really wish to see ireland really then we will go there but only one condition there is a place in devonshire i have heard you talk of the place where your childhood was spent we will get across country somehow or another from hollyhead and we will visit it together cecil she looked up at her lover and smiled of all the pleasures that he could have offered to her this was the sweetest the thought was one of the inspirations of love so mr o'bonneville took his wife to ireland in the dull november weather there are autumnal seasons in which the rain it raineth every day in this green isle encircled by the sea and it seemed to cecil as if a new deluge were about to blot fair hibernia from the universe it was no fitting season nor had the barrister sufficient leisure for the ordinary pleasure seekers tour the newly wedded pair spent a few wet days in dublin driving in the phoenix park where the autumnal sunsets were very beautiful to behold in the brief intervals of the rain and then one bleak early morning an express train bore cecil and her husband southward to shannonville and under the cloudy november skies lawrence o'bonneville once more beheld the city of his youth he had looked forward with such a fond yearning to the day in which he should tread those familiar streets once more and now the day had come and the long dreamed of pleasure was a very sad sensation after all the glory of shannonville had fled since the irishman last had looked upon it and the sight of its decay smote him to the heart modern civilization and the mighty steam demon who makes naught of distance and but little of time had left shannonville far behind commerce had no longer need of that far southern port and where rich granaries had stored the wealth of southern ireland empty storehouses looked blankly on a deserted quay there where the vessels of many traders had jostled one another in the crowded docks a fisherman's briancairn was slackly moored by a rotting rope the broad streets were standing yet but the crowd that had once made them gay had vanished the clubhouse was still called a clubhouse but where were the noisy revellers who had once made its walls resonate with their boisterous laughter and the dashing young men and the lovely blue-eyed maidens whose presence had rendered the chief thoroughfare of shannonville so delightful a promenade where were they gone gone only pinched faces looked up at the hotel windows where cecil gazed sadly out upon her husband's native city only squalor and misery ruin and decay greeted lawrence o'bonneville as he walked slowly along the deserted quays looking 
for the vanquished brightness of his youth he went back to his wife sick at heart the place is as dreary as a city of the dead cecil he said i have brought you to desolation and ruin my darling we'll leave shannonville by the first train to-morrow morning the sight of the old place cuts me to the heart but mr o'bonneville grew tolerably cheerful by and by and took his wife to dine with the oldest friends he had the oldest surviving friends for there was a sad list of the dead whom he had known and loved in shannonville lady cecil was pleased with the kind of simple people who received her with open arms and were unceasing in their praises of her husband's youthful virtues the twenty years of his professional career seemed to melt away like a dream as he sat in that shannonville drawing-room where tall young ladies whom he had dandled in his strong arms looked at him wonderingly and where youthful matrons whom he remembered as tiny toddling children brought their tiny toddling children to his middle-aged knees people talked as if events of a quarter of a century back had been the events of yesterday and don't you remember the picnic at nicoldesolotherium lawrence and i'm sure you've not forgotten the dance at mr o'hennessy's when patrick mcshindy proposed to flora mcrae in the little back parlor and old mr o'kelly caught him on his knees and don't you remember the murder at castle slogeron and major o'warks riding fifty miles across country on his chestnut mare devil's hoof to take the scoundrel that did it ah lawrence shannonville's but a quiet place now and and you'd scarcely know if you came back amongst us again but even that genial evening amongst old friends could not quite restore mr o'bonneville's spirits i'm sure you won't care to stay here cecil he said as they drove home to the hotel and i think my heart would break if i spent a week in the place so in the bleak november under another cloudy sky and with another day's ceaseless rain pattering against the windows of the railway carriage cecil and her husband went back to dublin and from dublin to holyhead and thence across country to exeter and then to chudley combe here there was no sign of decay save the beautiful decay of nature commercial civilization had never approached within twenty miles of the secluded old mansion half buried in the woods and the eternal loveliness of nature is subject to no changes save those gradual transitions through which she passes for ever and ever serenely beautiful in every phase the old woman who had charge of the deserted mansion was very glad to admit mr o'bonneville and his wife for the portly presence of the barrister and the carriage and pair that had brought them from the nearest post town augured a handsome recompense for her trouble she led the visitors through the empty rooms where the atmosphere was chill and musty and where the mice behind the wainscot scampered away at the sound of the intruder's footfall the old-fashioned furniture had a wasted 
half-starved look to modern eyes it seemed as if the chairs and tables had been sentient things and were slowly perishing by in Asian. as the aspect of shannonville had depressed mr o'bonneville so the cold dampness of this untenanted mansion depressed cecil i can't bear to see the dear old rooms looking so cold and cheerless she said i can show you the very chair in which grandmamma used to sit the little table on which i used to write she opened an old-fashioned square piano and ran her fingers gently along the keys but tenderly as she touched the notes the instrument gave out a shrill discordant wail that was almost like the shriek of a banshee but if the aspect of the place saddened mr o'bonneville's young wife her sadness was not all pain there was a tender pleasure mingle with her regret you could never guess how often i have seen the old place in my dreams lawrence she said amidst all the confusion and contradiction and absurdity that make dreams so bewildering i have seen dead people restored to life and have felt no surprise in seeing them in a dream one always seems to forget that there is any such thing as death i thank you a thousand times for bringing me here lawrence you could never believe how much i have wished to see the dear old home again and now you see it in the hands of a stranger and going to ruin cecil said mr o'bonneville the water comes through all the ceilings upstairs and if the man who owns the place doesn't care what he's about there'll be a new roof wanted before very long but the old woman hereupon explained that the ownership was at present vested in the court of chancery a suit was in progress and had been in progress for the last three years on settlement of which the entire property was to be realized for the benefit of the disputants and if the place is to be worth anybody's buying it had need be sold soon said the old woman for the rain do come in here and the rain do come in there and the wind do come in everywhere and the rats gnaw holes in the wainscot and eat their way through the flooring and the windows rattle of a winter's night to that degree that the house isn't fit for a christian to live in a few hundreds lay out upon it would make it comfortable enough said the practical mr o'bonneville but i don't see how the place could ever be worth more than a hundred a year at this distance from london and it must sell as cheap as rags to give you five per cent for your money oh if i had only been rich enough to buy it she thought she did not know anything about percentages or profitable investments but if she had been free to do her own will she would have given every sixpence she possessed in the world to be owner of chundale Coombe, and yet she never thought of asking mr o'bonneville to purchase the dwelling place she loved with some portion of the money he had settled upon her she had tried with all her might to prevent the making of that settlement and had told her lover that under no circumstances could she ever bring herself to look upon the money as her own i have very little use for what people call pin money she said 
for you know lawrence that i have been accustomed all my life to be economical let me have fifty or sixty pounds a year for my clothes if you like and i will dress as well as i have ever been used to dress but i don't want to be extravagant because you are generous the barrister kissed his affianced bride and told her that she was an angel and that she dressed exquisitely but the settlement was made nevertheless and mrs mcclaverhouse declared that lawrence o'bonneville had acted nobly and during the visit to chandelay combe he was very kind and very patient though he examined the window sashes and sounded the partitions and rattled the locks and poked the ceilings and peered up the chimneys and jumped upon the floors with a view to testing the strength of the timbers and altogether behaved in a more practical way than quite harmonized with cecil's pensive spirit but he gave her plenty of time for tender meditations while he prowled amongst stables and offices tasted the water from a couple of pumps in a long stone courtyard and measured the length and breadth of the grounds with a surveyor's accurate three-foot stride it was only when the autumn afternoon was deepening into evening that he swooped down upon cecil as she stood on the lawn by a rustic basket that had once held such a wealth of geraniums and in which now only a few straggling sprigs of magonet lingered amid a wilderness of weeds and asked her sharply if she was ready to go away yes lawrence she said quite ready and then as they walked back to the carriage she said rather to herself than to her husband i wonder who will buy chandelay coombe ah so do i cried mr o'bonneville swinging his stick he'll have to spend something like a thousand pounds upon the place before he makes it habitable whoever he is end of chapter thirteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter fourteen of the ladies mile this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Lady's Mile by Mary Elizabeth Braden. Mr. Lobier's Wooing. Another season had commenced the carriages in the ladies mile were gathering thicker every day though as yet there was not a leaflet on the trees in hyde park nor a ray of warm sunshine on the serpentine january the bitter had given place to february the uncertain when florence crawford tore herself away from the blusterous delights of the brighton esplanade in obedience to her father's summons she had been staying with some stylish friends who had taken a house on the east cliff while william crawford made the best of the dark short days working steadily at a picture which was to be one of the glories of the academy in the coming season florence crawford had not exaggerated her wealthy admirer's devotion mr lobier had spent the winter in perpetual rushing to and fro between london and brighton another man as deeply smitten as mr lobier would have been content to have taken up his abode 
at Piccadilly Supermar and to have devoted himself entirely to the society of his enchantress. But Miss Crawford's admirer could not altogether tear himself away from the companions of his bachelor life. There were winter races and mysterious pugilistic meetings and secret cock-fightings and diverse other entertainments connected with the annual creation from the delights of which beauty was powerless to beguile Mr. Lobier. He wanted to marry Florence Crawford, and he meant to marry her. The more completely she held him at bay and defied him by her coquetry and insolence, the more dogged he became in his determination to win her for his wife. He admired her beauty, her grace, her piquancy, and he thought it would be a fine thing to have such a woman seated at the head of his table or sitting by his side in his male phantom with the most thoroughbred of bull terriers on her lap and a forty-guinea tiger skin over her knees he admired everything that was gorgeous and expensive and out of reach of that large class of humanity whose members did not possess bankers books and whom he contemptuously generalized as cads he admired florence crawford because in his own phraseology she was the best thing he had seen in the way of girls but he had carefully considered the prudence of the step before he committed himself by any deliberate avowal of his admiration i might marry a woman with plenty of money he thought but then i shouldn't have much of a choice i like to choose my horses and dogs and i should like to choose my wife florence crawford must have some money for she's an only child and those painter fellows make no end of money nowadays and as crawford has been a widower sixteen or seventeen years i don't suppose there's much chance of his making an idiot of himself by marrying again after regarding the matter with extreme deliberation mr lobier arrived at the conclusion that he might as well gratify his own inclination and marry the painter's daughter whose bewitchingly disdainful airs gave zest to his courtship so when florence went back to the fountains she returned as the affianced wife of thomas lobier and she carried in one of her portmanteaus a casket of jewels which winked and twinkled in the cold winter sunshine when she lifted the lid to peep at her treasures she had left the east cliff radiant with feminine vanity bright with the golden halo of success for her friends knew that before the year was out she would be mistress of pevenshaw place and a west end mansion and she knew that they envied her good fortune mr lobier's society was not eminently delightful but mr lobier's male phantom and thoroughbred steppers were absolute perfection mr lobier's conversational powers were very limited but the establishments of brighton jewelers are more fascinating than any other jewel shops in england and are scarcely to be surpassed by the glories of the rue de la paix and mr lobier had been a liberal customer in castle square william crawford had heard of his daughter's conquest and had been congratulated upon the brilliancy of her prospects but he had not taken upon himself to interfere with her arrangements the manners and ideas of modern young ladies were something past the pure-minded artist's powers of comprehension he remembered his wife with her primitive notions and womanly tenderness 
so fond so clinging so loving so girlishly sentimental so quick to be pleased with any simple pleasure so ready to be frightened by a harsh word or moved to tears by a tender thought and remembering her he was utterly bewildered by the daughter who was so like and yet so unlike that lost darling whether the sentiments which florence openly professed were the expression of her real feelings or only the fashionable cant of her sex mr crawford was at a loss to imagine but the tone of her conversation gave him unspeakable pain this daughter who spoke of him as a dear old party and who pronounced his best picture to be awfully jolly was so unlike the daughter he had dreamed of welcoming to the home of his prosperity he knew that she was charming the slang from her lips took a new accent and assumed a pretty quaintness in place of its native vulgarity he had seen that her heart needed only to be awakened by some pious appeal some sorrowful spectacle to reveal itself rich in all womanly tenderness and compassion but she was not the daughter of his dreams i am punished for my cowardice he thought i was afraid to face the struggles of poverty with my child in my arms i gave her into the hands of strangers and i am fool enough to wonder now that she is strange to me miss crawford tripped into the painting room immediately after her arrival at the fountains and elevated herself on tiptoe in order to embrace her father you dear old darling how you do smell of varnish she cried after bestowing a kiss upon each of his cheeks are you using copal for your new picture dreadfully stiff stuff to work with isn't it and what is the new picture you didn't tell me that in any of your letters and i've been dying to know i suppose i may look before the painter could reply his daughter had planted herself before the easel and was contemplating his unfinished work as long as it's nothing about marie antoinette mary queen of scots don quixote jill blass or the vicar of wakefield i'm satisfied she said she stood looking at the picture for some minutes and then shrugged her shoulders impatiently as she turned to the painter i must give it up papa she exclaimed it's rather nice but you must have half a page of description in the catalogue if you want people to know what it all means it was the picture of a page holding a horse in a woody landscape the page wore the costume of charles the second's court but the loose tumbled hair falling about the fair neck the small jeweled hand that grasped the bridle the delicate curves of the figure the disorder of a dress that seemed to have been arranged by unaccustomed hands and the shrinking terror of the pose betrayed the sex of the pretended page the attitude of the horse expressed as intense a terror as that which agitated the woman the bright chestnut of his sides was darkened with sweat the distended nostrils were flecked with foam the eyes were dilated the woman's face was exquisitely beautiful but its loveliness was of the diabolical rather than the angelic order the eyes of the disguised beauty were turned with a look of unspeakable horror towards a woodland glade which stretched away in the background and her disengaged hand 
was pressed convulsively upon her breast as if to control the beating of her heart on the grass near the horse's feet there lay an embroidered glove and a cavalier's cloak whose rich purple velvet and gold embroidery made a mass of color in the foreground who is she papa asked flo her dress is unutterably jolly and her hair looks as if you had painted it with a patent tube of liquid sunshine what a wonderful old thing you are but allow me to inquire for the second time what it all means a pretty woman doesn't dress herself in a ruby velvet doublet and hold a horse in a wood without a motive the woman is the countess of shrewsbury who disguised herself as a page and held the duke of buckingham's horse while he fought a duel with her husband it's not a very moral story and i doubt if i shall exhibit it but you needn't tell people what it means papa and i'm sure they'll never find out call it lady rachel russell you can invent a story about an attempted escape of her husband or something of that kind you know but if you've any difficulty about the picture mr lobier shall buy it of you papa added florence with a tone that sounded rather like patronage she was quite capable of patronizing her father thank you my dear the picture is sold already to a person who understands pictures answered mr crawford gravely he was standing with his back to his daughter washing his hands in a basin that formed part of the paraphernalia of a stand on which he kept the implements of his art the winter twilight was thickening and the light of the low fire was hidden by a crimson screen flo stood in the bay window looking out into the garden with a meditative air you speak of mr lobier as if he were quite your own property florence said the painter as he walked to the fireplace and pushed away the screen the firelight showed him his daughter's profile her head bent her eyes downcast the small gloved hands trifling with her bonnet strings she did not make any reply to her father's remark and yet he could scarcely doubt that she had heard him do you really mean to marry this mr lobier william crawford asked presently i wish you wouldn't call him this mr lobier papa cried flo impatiently what has he done that he should have a reflexive pronoun tacked on to his name as if he were some new kind of wild animal he has asked me to marry him ever so many times and and i suppose i do mean to marry him papa if you have no objection added florence dutifully if i have no objection exclaimed the painter what influence have the fathers of the present day over their children that their opinion should be asked or their wishes consulted don't look at me so imploringly i am not angry with you my dear i am only an old-fashioned fellow and there are many things i see nowadays that mystify me if you like mr lobler and mr lobler is as he seems to be very much in love with you i cannot make any objection to your marrying him though i will tell you frankly oh pray don't papa cried florence pray don't tell me anything frankly when people talk about being frank they are always going to say something disagreeable it's very odd that the truth always should be so unpleasant i know what you were going to say papa almost as well as if you had said it you were going to tell me that i may marry mr lobier if i please but that you don't like 
him and that you never have liked him and so on the moment a girl is engaged to be married to a man people seem to think that they are privileged to abuse him i don't wish to abuse mr lobier my dear if you are really attached to him flo shrugged her shoulders impatiently and if you really think you can be happy as his wife i have nothing to say against the marriage i suppose if i were a very prudent man i ought to rejoice at the idea that my little girl can never know what worldly misfortune is but but what papa cried flo she had untied her bonnet strings and had thrown the fragile structure of velvet and feathers aside in her impatience the fact is miss crawford had not returned from brighton in the best possible humour and her father's grave manner annoyed her the hinchcliffe girls were never tired of congratulating me papa she said and miss hinchcliffe declared i was the luckiest creature in christendom and aunt jane called she has taken a house in marine square for the children and the hinchcliffs asked her to dinner and of course they would tell her all about mr lobier and she was delighted and went away in such spirits declaring that if i have a town house she will make my uncle move from russell square to tyburnia but now i come home you snub me and throw cold water upon me and make me feel as if i were a kind of criminal it's very cruel of you papa my dear child i have no wish to be cruel and so the hinchcliffs are delighted and aunt jane is delighted because you are going to marry mr lobier it is not because he is handsome i suppose for i have seen much handsomer men and it cannot be because he is clever for i must confess that to me he seems rather stupid why is it such a grand thing to marry mr lobier flo and why are the hinchcliffs envious and aunt jane in spirits is it because he is rich ah to be sure that's what it is of course he is rich and we are a wealthy nation and to marry the wealthiest bachelor of the season is the supremest felicity to which a young lady can attain i begin to understand it all now but i am such a old-fashioned man flo that i like the old idea of love in a cottage best papa said florence after a pause mamma's marriage was a love match and she loved you very dearly as you deserve to be loved you dear disagreeable old darling and i know that she never repented having married you but when you were very very poor did you never feel sorry for having taken her from the comfortable home in russell square and the carriage and the servants and the friends and all that she lost when she became your wife yes flo answered the painter sadly god knows i had my hours of remorse and bitterness but you had no need to be remorseful papa cried flo who perceived that she touched too sad a memory for mamma loved you dearly and she was happier with you than she would have been in a palace even if people were generally happy in palaces which as far as i can ascertain they are not but i'm not like mamma i have been brought up among rich people and the thought of poverty frightens me i look at houses sometimes in which people exist 
and are tolerably happy, I suppose, in their own miserable way. And I think that I couldn't live in such a house or in such a neighborhood. Do you remember taking me up to some place near Islington to see one of Mr. Foley's pictures? Islington seemed like a new world to me, and I felt that I should commit suicide if I lived there a week, to be out of reach of the parks, to have no horse to ride, no pretty dresses to wear, no nice fashionable friends to visit, to ride in omnibuses and wear old-fashioned bonnets and go through life shabby and dowdy and neglected. Oh, what utter misery it all seems. I know all this sounds selfish and horrible, Papa, but I have been brought up to be selfish and horrible. I dare say your feelings are perfectly natural, my dear, replied Mr. Crawford, but I don't understand them. I don't understand you. I understand nothing about the age in which I live. All I can say to you is to implore you to think seriously before you take so serious a step as that you talk of so lightly. It seems a fashion to talk lightly of solemn things nowadays, and no one would imagine from the manner in which people discuss a marriage that it was to be the affair of a lifetime. You are very young, Flory, and you can afford to wait. If you feel that you can be happy with Mr. Lobier, marry him. But if you have the slightest doubt up on that point, let no inducement upon earth tempt you to become his wife. The unhappy marriages of the present day and in the divorce court but as I said before, you can afford to wait. Oh, yes, Papa, cried Miss Crawford, and while I am waiting and deliberating, some designing minx will pounce upon Mr. Lobier and marry him before I know where I am. What a dear, unsophisticated thing you are, and what a dreadful worldly wretch I am, Papa. But you see, I am not so much worse than other people. There is your model, Gretchen, your favorite Cecil Chundelay, who was always lecturing me about my mercenary sentiments. Yet, you see, after all, she has married a great lumbering Irish barrister, only because he has two or three thousand a year. But Lady Cecil may be very much attached to Mr. O'Bonneville. Yes, Papa, answered Flo, pertly. She may, but then, on the other hand, she mayn't. Attached to him, indeed. A man whose coats and collars were made in the year one, and must have been old-fashioned then, I should think, if Adam had decent tastes in dress but he can change his coats and collars, and really, O'Bonneville is a very good fellow, and a very clever one. Yes, Papa, but what women ever cared about such cleverness as that? A man whose greatest achievement is to cross-examine some stupid witness and set a stupid jury laughing at his stupid jokes. No, you dear innocent parent, Cecil did not care two straws about the uncultivated Queen's Council, but she married him because he is well off and can give her what people call a good home. A good home in Brunswick Square. Poor Cecil, I am dying to call upon her and hear how she endures her existence in Bloomsbury. After this, Miss Crawford contrived to turn the conversation. She talked of her father's pictures, the Countess of Shrewsbury, the larger classical subject 
which he was going to finish before the first of may anything and everything except mr lobler and after dining tete-a-tete -tete with mr crawford florence retired to array herself in blue gauze and returned to the drawing-room to await a friendly dowager who was to call for her at ten o'clock and beneath whose sheltering wing she was to appear at a party to which mr lobier had also been bidden the master of pevenshaw place and the lobier mills called on the painter the next day and made a formal demand for the hand of his daughter you won't find me illiberal in the matter of settlements mr crawford said the rich man as the painter deliberated with a cloud brow and a thoughtful aspect let your lawyer name his own terms and fight the business out with my fellow when i fall in love with a beautiful woman i'm not the sort of man to spoil my chance by a niggardly policy said mr lobier whose tone was rather calculated to convey the idea that florence crawford was not the first beautiful woman with whom he had fallen in love but the painter was too much struck by the first part of the young man's speech to pay much attention to the latter portion my dear sir he exclaimed i dare say what you have just been saying is very generously intended but you must remember that we are not making a bargain my daughter is not one of my pictures to be disposed of to the highest bidder and i assure you i have my fancies even about the disposal of them and don't always care to sell them to the person who offers me most money if i consider your proposal at all i must consider it as it affects my daughter's future happiness not her purse i suppose a settlement is a usual thing with a man of your wealth and in that case i am willing that you should do what is fair and just if you marry my daughter but i cannot for a moment allow you to put forward your money as an inducement to me when you propose to become the husband of my only child mr lobier for once in his life was thoroughly astounded here was a painter fellow who would sell you a picture by jed sir and thank you humbly for your patronage riding the high horse and giving himself the airs of a duck this was what the great lobier said afterwards to his chief toady and confident but he was completely subdued at the time and was fain to sue most humbly for permission to make florence crawford his wife i do not see very well how i can withdraw my consent returned the painter with a sigh when he responded to mr lobier's very meekly worded appeal you have already proposed to my daughter and she has accepted your proposal subject to my approval she tells me very dutifully i think it is rather too late for me to interfere mr lobler especially as there seems no particular reason why i should interfere if my daughter loves you and if you love her as truly and purely as a man ought to love the woman he marries i cannot say no all i ask is that you will not be in a hurry that you will wait a year at the least i want to know you better before i trust my daughter's happiness to your keeping but mr lobier protested that a year under such circumstances would be an eternity or something to that effect and after considerable supplication on the part of miss crawford's lover who talked of himself in a dejected way as the 
most devoted fellow that ever was, you know, and as a fellow who wanted to settle down in his own home and all that sort of thing, you know, the painter consented that the year of probation should be reduced by one half and that the end of six months Mr. Lobier might claim his bride, always, provided that his future father-in-law had reason to think well of him in the meantime. After this the young man departed triumphant, but with a certain air of sulky discomfiture about him in the midst of his triumph. If a fellow were a pauper, there couldn't be more row about the business, he muttered, as he stepped into the unapproachable phantom, which had been such a success on the west cliff. I never knew before today that fellows with half a million of money were so plentiful that people whose daughters they want to marry need turn up their noses at them. Mr. Crawford went back to his painting room after the interview with his future son-in-law, very grave of aspect. He went to his painting room for comfort as a devotee might go into a church. His large easel occupied the center of the room with a great blank canvas upon it, while the Countess of Shrewsbury was turned ignominiously to the wall. He took some dingy brown ish tint from his palette and sketched the outline of a woman's form upon the fair white canvas no map of confused and wavy lines preceded the perfect outline but every stroke was sharp precise and permanent where other men indulged in a chalky network of vague curves and undulations William Crawford drew a firm and lasting outline with his brush. The long labors of years had made him the first of modern draftsmen, as well as the greatest of modern colorists. But today Mr. Crawford's work did not afford him that serene pleasure which it was his wont to feel when he stood before his easel. His brush was less rapid than usual, and after standing for some moments staring at his canvas without seeing it, he turned with an impatient sigh and began to walk up and down the room. I do not like thee, he muttered, with his hands plunged deep in the pockets of his velvet morning coat. I'm not at all clear about the reason, but I do not like thee, and I wish, I wish my pretty little impertinent Florence were going to marry any one else in this world rather than you, my worthy fell. But the girls of the present day are past my comprehension, and the women too, for the matter of that. Yes, Miss Champer are known the women too. The painter sighed more heavily than before as he said this. He took a little note from his waistcoat pocket presently and from the half-listless, half-unwilling manner in which he unfolded the miniature sheet and glanced at the half-dozen lines inscribed thereon, it was evident that he had read the note before, and yet it was no very important document. It was only a woman's epistle, half of remonstrance, half of invitation. But the tiny sheet of paper was a marvel of delicate emblazonry in the way of crest and arms, a monogram and address, and the paper exhaled a rare and subtle perfume as of myosotis or orange blossom. "'What are you doing, Mr. Crawford?' began the painter's correspondent, in a hand which was firm, without being masculine, bold, and yet neat, a hand which had an originality and character of its own, 
and which once seen was rarely forgotten or confounded with any other calligraphy what are you doing and why have i seen neither you nor florence since my return to town i am anxious to hear all about your pictures for this season or to see them but i shall not come to your painting room uninvited and in the meantime you and your daughter know where to find me always truly yours georgina champernown shall i go to her thought the painter i made up my mind to keep clear of her for this year at least and already i am tempted to waver she won't leave me alone she won't let me work in peace and forget her if i can what is it to her that i have worked and waited for twenty years to win the place i hold what is it to her she likes to see me in her drawing-room and to exhibit me to the people amongst whom she lives i suppose i am a kind of lion in my way and that she likes to show me in my cage what does it matter to her if she distracts me from my work it pleases her to keep me in an intermittent fever of perplexity and despair what am i to her amongst a hundred admirers i am only something different from the rest of them she has her museum of lovers as she has her cabinet of china her collection of antique silver her orchids her angora cats and i am a curious specimen of the genus painter very hopeless shall i go to her to be fooled as i have been fooled year after year ever since i have been worth a place in her exhibition no no mrs champernown noni as the citizens of ghent said to philip van artveld one night do something with van artveld by the by and the quaint old costumes and the pure peaked roofs of the houses and the infuriated burghers clamorous for their leader's blood nini mrs champernone i will not go near you i have my great picture to paint between this and the twenty-eighth of april and i have to hold my own against the critics so i will send you my daughter with a pretty message and i will invite you to my painting room on the last day in april with the connoisseurs and the amateurs and the art critics on the newspapers and the unknown strangers who come to stare at the painter under pretense of looking at his pictures but when mr crawford had spent about three hours at his easel he laid down his palette and brushes and looked at the clock upon the mantelpiece the infallible clock upon which weary models cast furtive glances as the day wore on to see when another hour had expired and another shilling had been earned i can't go on any longer without a young person as flo calls my professional model said mr crawford and i think i should like to show her my sketch before i go seriously to work at this picture her taste is perfect and she might suggest something besides which it's getting too dark for work added the painter rather irreverently the she of whom he spoke so vaguely was mrs champernone and he wanted to find an excuse for going to her he took a small canvas from amongst others leaning against the wall 
and slipped it into a green baize cover he rang the bell told the servant to fetch a cab and then retired into a dressing room that adjoined the larger chamber where he exchanged his velvet painting coat for the broadcloth of everyday life end of chapter 14 recorded by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc